Okay. Nope. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have to just convene and open this. I don't start the webinar okay. and then I'll just give you the Good morning. Welcome to everybody who is here and to everybody who is joining us remotely. I'd like to uh, open up our uh, 2021 Law Review Symposium and note a couple of things before I turn it over to the uh, phenomenal group of students who planned this. So this year marks the 25th anniversary of the passage of two significant federal statutes. The Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act sought to recalibrate the relationship between state and federal courts by limiting the scope. Sorry, while we fix the technical piece. Okay, we're good. Thank you. All right. Great. Well, for those of you who haven't heard me yet, I am simply welcoming you to uh, opening up our Law Review Symposium and noting that the symposium is focused on recognizing the 25th anniversary of the passage of two significant federal statutes. The first, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act sought to recalibrate the relationship between state and federal courts by limiting the scope of federal habeas corpus review of state criminal convictions and by restricting the availability of federal habeas relief. The second one is the Prison Litigation Reform Act, which limited the availability of federal relief for prisoners by codifying exhaustion remedy requirements, mandating full payment for filing fees, requiring, requiring a physical injury as the basis for recovery for mental or emotional injury, and adding a three strikes rule that bars prisoner access to federal court in certain circumstances. Among the issues this program will explore are the statute's impact on persons and communities of color, the ability of prisoners to obtain meaningful judicial relief, the health consequences for prisoners during the COVID-19 pandemic, the ability of the federal courts to address prisoner claims, 
and the relationship between state and federal courts. The symposium is co-sponsored by the Federal Litigation Section of the Federal Bar Association and the Northern District of Ohio Chapter of the FBA. The Attorney Admissions Fund of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio has also provided financial support. This promises to be an incredible program, a number of really um, impressive speakers, and I'd like to actually briefly turn it over to Andrew Rumschlag, the editor-in-chief of our volume 72 of our Case Western Reserve Law Review, who will go over the day's schedule. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Berg. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I also want to thank all of our symposium moderators and speakers uh, for making time for this program today. Really excited about it. Um, I'd also like to thank a few people who are absolutely instrumental in making this program happen today. Um, Mr. Eric Seiler, who handled all of our logistics for the in-person program. Uh, Martin Raska and his team for dealing with the technology aspects of this so that we can offer this hybrid uh, format. I also want to thank all of our associate editor volunteers who are helping out today as well. Uh, professors Adler, Benza, Hardaway, and Hill all helped us in our early planning and reaching out to uh, speakers uh, early on. And of course, uh, Professor Enton, our Law Review faculty advisor, has been a constant source of guidance uh, and, and help with finding funding, finding speakers. Um, so thank you, Professor Enton. And uh, ultimately, this is the brainchild of Reagan Joy, who is uh, back there. Uh, Reagan, thank you very much for all the hard work that you have put into this and, and making this happen. So today's schedule uh, includes four panels. Uh, the first will begin uh, here after I finish speaking, and Professor Hardaway will lead a panel discussing the pandemic's impact on prison litigation. Then we'll have a brief break followed by a panel at 10.30, where Professor Benza will discuss uh, litigators' perspectives on these statutes with practitioners. Then from 1.15 to 2.45, after we have a break for lunch, um, we will have a panel on uh, how we will reform these statutes. Uh, we could reform these statutes led by Dean Adamson. And then we'll have another brief break followed by Professor Enton leading a panel uh, in which we will get federal judges' perspectives on these statutes. Um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Hardaway for the first panel. Morning. This is going to test my eyesight. I have to look at the back of the room to see you guys appearing virtually. Um, my name is Aisha Bell Hardaway, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our first set of panelists. Um, we have first um, Hadar Abiyam, professor at the University of California Hastings College of Law, specializes in criminal justice, civil rights, and politics and social movements. Her books include Cheap on Crime, Recession Era Politics, and The Transformation of American Punishment, and Yesterday's Monsters, The Manson Family Cases, uh, and The Illusion of Parole. Professor Abram has published articles in leading journals on domestic violence, prosecutorial and defense behavior, public trust in the police, correctional policy and budgeting, violence reduction, theoretical trends in crime and punishment, and the history of female crime and punishment. She served as the president of the Western Society of Criminology and is currently the book review editor of the Law and Society Review. Her blog, California Correctional Crisis, covers criminal justice policy in California. Welcome, Professor Edra. Our next speaker um, or presenter will be um, Nancy J. King, the Lee S. and Charles A. Spear Professor of Law at Vanderbilt University. Professor King is an expert in criminal procedure. Her work focuses on post-investigative features of the criminal process, 
included plea bargaining, trials, juries, sentencing, appeals, double jeopardy, and post-conviction review. She is co-author of two leading multi-volume treatises on criminal procedure and uh, of the leading criminal procedure casebook and several books, including Habeas for the 21st Century, Uses, Abuses, and the Future of the Great Writ. Professor King has also published dozens of articles and leading law reviews and is associate reporter for the advisory committee of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. <coughs> Professor King clerked for Judge Douglas W. Hillman of the United States District Court of the Western District of Michigan and Justice Michael F. Kavanaugh of the Supreme Court of Michigan. And then last but not least, we have Margot Schlanger, the Wade H. and Doris M. McCree Collegiate Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. Professor Schlanger is a leading authority on civil rights issues and civil and criminal detention. She previously taught at Washington University in St. Louis and Harvard Law School. And she served as the Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties and as counsel for to the Secretary of Homeland Security. In addition, she was the reporter for the American Bar Association's revision of its standards on the treatment of prisoners. She is the author of dozens of articles in leading law reviews and is the lead author of a leading casebook, Incarceration and the Law. Professor Schlanger also does substantial work in civil rights litigation and prison and immigrant reform. She has been appointed as the cl as class counsel in a class action that seeks to ensure due process for Iraqi nationals who are facing deportation and as monitor for statewide settlement dealing with deaf prisoners in Kentucky. And she has testified as an expert in numerous cases addressing detention condition, conditions. Excuse me. She was a law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the Supreme Court of the United States. Welcome to our panelists. Uh, it's my understanding that um, your preference for, for uh, presenting to this morning will be um, in the order of Professor King, Professor Schlanger, and then um, and last but not least, Professor Abram. Is that right? I saw a thumbs up. Very great. Uh, thank you. Professor King, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yep, I hear you fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I discovered that uh, this morning when I arrived, they started construction outside my window. So if uh, you have any trouble hearing me, just put your hand up to your ear or interrupt me, and I'm happy to try to do something else. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to the symposium. This is pretty exciting. Um, 20, 20 years of EDPA and PLRA. Um, I thought I'd just offer two modest observations about COVID and habeas uh, for us to think about today. Both points uh, concern not so much what EDPA did, but more what it didn't do. In particular, the restrictions that Congress imposed on the habeas remedy in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which people refer to as EDPA, some people call it ADIPA, but um, I, think, I think it's probably EDPA and more, uh, uh, or more. Um, it, it greatly limited severe procedural restrictions that hadn't been already there on the habeas remedy. But what it didn't do is it did not eliminate the equitable powers of federal courts in applying the statutory remedy. And it didn't touch 2241. And those two things played a role in habeas litigation during the pandemic, and still are. And I wanted to focus on them and put those in perspective. So let's start with the first point here about <clears throat> the equitable powers of federal courts in applying the statute. Uh, one of the most restrictive and impactful limits of EDPA was the statute of limitations 
replacing the doctrine of latches as the method of determining when a petition filed by either a state or federal tribunal was too late. And a study from petitions filed in 2004 and 2005 by state prisoners found that the statute of limitations was the reason for dismissal in an estimated 22% of state non-capital prison filings. It really had made a big difference. But despite this restriction, the court, since EDPA was passed, has repeatedly enforced the equitable leeway or flexibility of courts in applying the statute of limitations. So, for example, in 2010, they recognized equitable tolling so that if a petitioner's late filing would be excused if the petitioner could show an extraordinary circumstance beyond his or her control and diligently pursue filing rights as well. So, not surprisingly, starting in March of 2020, when we were all locked in, the court started being asked and granting tolling for conditions that restricted the ability to file on time. For example, courts allowed tolling for conditions that prevented in-person competency evaluations, prevented an inmate from accessing a law library or documents needed to create the petition, prevented an attorney from meeting with the petitioner, or resulted in closing the courthouse. So, these equitable considerations made a difference in the application of EDPA. Now, the second point I wanted to make was that the EDPA statute left intact 2241. The original habeas remedy left over after Congress modified in the 40s to allow, to regulate attacks on custody resulting from state criminal judgments and federal criminal judgments by creating 2254 and 2255. What was left over was 2241, which simply said, a district court may grant a writ of habeas corpus if a prisoner in custody of a violation of the constitutional laws of the treaties of the United States. So, for a very long time, this 2241 language, the original habeas corpus remedy, has enabled judicial review during times of crisis, periods of turmoil, when judicial review is needed, but it isn't already supplied by another statutory scheme. And so, in other words, it served as sort of a backstop when other remedies don't work, try 2241. So, you can see this pattern playing out over time with the constitutionality of pretrial detention, immigration detention, military detention, civil commitment, all of which eventually developed other statutory schemes more tailored to those concerns and funneling those claims outside of 2241. But everything that's left over that doesn't fit, 2241 is there for petitioners to try. And I was wondering if that might have occurred in COVID as well. And that's what I was looking at cases in my short essay for this important review about, is how 2241 was interpreted by federal courts in the context of pandemic-related claims. Now, among the claims that courts are used to analyzing under 2241 are administration of sentence claims, they often call it, where petitioners and applicants under 2255 as well come to the federal court saying, I should be released earlier, or my good time credit was calculated incorrectly, something to do with the revocation of release was screwed up, not attacking the underlying 
criminal judgment at all, only the administration of the sentence that resulted from it. And this is different than the statutory remedies that I probably, Professor Schreiner, would be talking about, although I don't know that she is the nation's expert on these things, so I'm guessing that she will be talking about conditions of confinement claims, which are civil rights claims filed under yet another statute, 1983 for state prisoners, or business actions for federal prisoners. And these administration of sentence claims that I was talking about before are different than those. They're not claiming that the conditions of confinement are unconstitutional or violate the Eighth Amendment. Instead, they're saying, I need to get out of the loop. I should be released immediately for these following reasons, unrelated to the conditions, not necessarily related. I'm not asking for better conditions. So this turned out to play a role and is playing a role in some courts during the pandemic. In most courts, when petitioners brought pandemic-related claims seeking release, characterized them as conditions of confinement claims. They said, look, what you're complaining about is that it's too dangerous for you to stay there, and something has to be done to make it less dangerous, so you should have brought this under Section 1983 or as a civil rights claim and not as a habeas claim for release. But other courts, including the Sixth Circuit and many district courts, read the Supreme Court's precedent establishing the line between conditions of confinement claims and habeas claims as allowing these to go forward under 2241. So for example, the Supreme Court in a case called Prizer v. Rodriguez held that a challenge to the constitutionality of disciplinary proceedings that led to a deprivation of good time credits, and the petitioner was seeking earlier release, the court concluded that a state prisoner can't use Section 1983 to attack that sort of claim, but instead that falls within the core of habeas corpus. Pointing to this language and some other decisions of the court, which I'm not going to go into given our time constraints here, the Sixth Circuit decided in a case called Wilson v. Williams that petitioners who were seeking immediate release from confinement during the pandemic because of their medically vulnerable status could bring a 2241 claim, that it was cognizable, and several district courts also followed this. Now, the Sixth Circuit case ultimately did not succeed for another reason, but some of these other courts recognizing 2241 jurisdiction over these claims for immediate release did go forward and resulted in release and ultimately settlements that are now playing out in a number of jurisdictions. I can go into those in more detail at the Q&A, but just to bring you back to the debate about this line between Section 1983 cases and habeas cases and which statute applies, most courts, again, found that these claims were conditions of confinement claims, and they were worried that it would be too easy, for example, one court wrote, the risk of turning 2241 into a general civil rights statute by the mere expedient of a petitioner seeking that release remedy is high in every habeas action in which conditions of confinement are at issue. So what differentiates this action in habeas corpus from a garden variety civil rights action was the response of most courts. But nevertheless, there was this flexibility in 2241, this uncertainty that allowed at least some courts to use that statute to address what was a novel claim, just like they had been over many, many decades when confronted with other sorts of novel claims about detention. So just to sum up, again, I'm 
and I had a modest observation about what's going on uh, with KBS and, and COVID plans. These, uh, this, this wiggle room for federal courts, even despite the EDPA's restriction and uh, in equitable tolling and other equitable uh, rulings, continues to be vital for Congress to preserve, for courts to preserve, although it is a two-edged sword. Now, you can use equity both to expand or, uh, or permit relief, but, but the court has used equitable considerations to restrict habeas as well. And so preserving that equitable uh, discretion have, is not a one-way street here. It, it could go either way, but it is important for the court to be able to tailor it to the new and unexpected circumstances that confront courts under um, and, and those who are confined by government. As far as 2241 goes, um, uh, I, I think it's really important for the Supreme Court to, to preserve its complete common law flexibility to address completely unexpected uh, situations that we may confront in the future. Um, this one may not be long lasting. It may, it, it, we don't know. We, um, and, and I don't think I agree with Leo Kowarski and, and others who, his, his excellent um, collection of litigation under the, uh, in, uh, during the pandemic and showing all the deficiencies uh, in the various remedies that have failed prisoners during this time. I, I do recommend that. I'm not trying to canvas all of the other remedies. But that 2241 statute is, is uh, essential. And I think stepping back and looking at how uh, courts dealt with these claims during this particular crisis is, is somewhat consistent with the way that they have dealt with claims in the past uh, when confronted with some new uh, crisis in confinement. Um, and that's all I wanted to present for you. I'm happy to take questions as we go on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to do the questions at the end. Um, is that right? Law review? Awesome. Um, okay, great. Um, next, we'll have then Professor, Professor Slanger. Great, thank you so much. It's really um, nice to be with you all virtually. I'm sorry that I couldn't attend in person um, and, um, and to participate in this somewhat depressing topic of 25 years of the PLRA and EDPA. Um, I didn't realize when I started working on PLRA issues as a lawyer at the Justice Department the year the statute was passed that it would have such a a role in my career for basically ever. Um, so what's been going on for 25 years is that the Prison Litigation Reform Act has undermined the constitutional rights of incarcerated people. That's in fact part of what it's aimed to do. Its aim is to make it harder for people to file and win constitutional cases that involve their confinements, their incarceration. So it's succeeded at that. And we've seen the result in um, the pandemic. The, the wave of litigation that um, has occurred uh, related to COVID-19 by prisoners is kind of only to be expected. Incarcerated people tend to be quite medically vulnerable. The prevalence of chronic disease and disability is very, very high behind bars. And so they are um, at risk. And equally important, they, they lack most of the methods that the non-imprisoned have to minimize their own risk. They, prisoners can't avoid communal spaces um, for eating, living, bathing. They, um, the availability of personal protective equipment is subject to the constraints placed on them and sometimes the whim of the authorities who um, incarcerate them. They can't pick with whom to associate, whether to limit their association with people who are unvaccinated, unmasked, um, uncareful. Um, uh, staff contact in particular is mandatory, but this is true with, with prisoner to prisoner contact too. 
And the result of this, as one would expect, is that there's um, an infection rate among people behind bars of about five times in the general, uh, general population is misleading, in the unimprisoned population. And the mortality rate after controlling for the fact that these are, generally speaking, young men is about three times the rate um, not behind bars. So the result of all of that, which, of, of what is a very high level of risk, I want to be clear, not the same level of risk as in nursing homes, right? That's much higher. That's, that's for, for a variety of reasons. But, but still a very high level of risk. The result is that people brought lawsuits seeking changes to policies and practices. They asked for better sanitation. They asked for social distancing. They asked for an enforceable um, right to have staff use masks. They asked for vaccination. They asked for release, as um, Professor King was just talking about. And the PLRA has stood in the way of every one of those claims. Now, sometimes people have gotten past it, but it has posed a hurdle for every one of those claims. So let me um, let me share a slide. Um, I hope you all don't mind. Um, So the, the PLRA has just, if you want to think about it overall, wait, really? There we go. Um, this is um, a chart that almost every article I've ever written about the PLRA has had in it. So let me just share it with you. This shows prison and jail population, those are the bars over time. So you can see um, you can see the massive run-up in mass incarceration starting in 1970, going to about 2010, at which point it, there's been a modest decline in, um, in incarcerated populations. And, um, and then in the, in the blue bar, you can see filings classified as prisoners' rights filings in the federal court system. So not habeas, conditions of confinement filings. Um, there's some misclassification, this number isn't perfect, but it's, it's the best um, quantitative data we have. Um, that's the blue line. And then the red line shows the rate of filings. Um, so, uh, because as prison population goes up, of course you'd expect prison filings to go up, but in fact it, 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 the rate has sometimes gone down. Okay, so what do these two lines show us? They show that there was this huge run-up, not only in prison population, but in prison litigation um, from the 70s to 1995. Now, the run-up was actually not nearly as much as you might have thought because you can see that red line um, from 1980 to 1990 showing that the rate actually decreased very significantly in that decade. And then crept back up again in the first five years of the 90s. But the result is that prison litigation was, was you know, it was pretty um, uh, pressing um, from the perspective of, of prison and jail authorities in 1995, which is why um, the PLRA got passed. The PLRA had this instant, um, very significant dampening effect driving the numbers back down to what they'd been in, the, in, in 1990 and driving the rate back down to what it had been in the early to mid-70s, um, and eventually really to the early 70s, where it has stayed ever since. All right, so that's the basic story of the PLRA. And the provisions that have done that are the ones that um, were identified to you at the beginning of this, before this panel started, the filing fee, um, the, the limits on the availability of relief for emotional and mental injury, the, um, uh, the limits on um, uh, attorney's fees, and so on. There's a whole variety of provisions. The one I'm going to talk about is exhaustion. Here's the PLRA's exhaustion provision, which I think has been the most pernicious, actually, of the provisions in the PLRA. Um, it says, no action shall be brought with respect to prison conditions under Section 1983 of this title or any other federal law by a prisoner confined in any jail, prisoner, or any correctional facility until such administrative remedies as are available are exhausted. 
forgive me for reading to you what you can also see, but it's important enough that I wanted just to dwell on this for a minute. Okay, so what has that meant? So in, a, in, in what I believe total six Supreme Court cases, which is a, a big number for one provision of the statute, right? Um, six provisions. I, I, I worked some on, a, on a, um, a, an amicus brief that got filed with a couple of weeks ago in an exhaustion case. And the lawyer said, well, we really feel like we have to explain to the justices exactly what exhaustion means. And I was like, no, it's new to you because you're a law firm lawyer. This is their seventh case on, on this topic. In any event, what has it meant? Um, exhaustion is an affirmative defense. Prisoners are not supposed to have to plead it. They're not supposed to have to prove it. It's up to the prison to, um, to demonstrate that there has been no exhaustion. Courts mostly, well, many courts don't understand this first bullet, but that is the rule. That is the clear rule. Um, there are no federally prescribed standards requiring fair and grievance systems. There used to be. Before the PLRA, there actually was such a set of standards that said if you want to have an exhaustion requirement, you uh, prisons and jails, here's what your um, administrative system, your grievance system has to look like. The PLRA undid that. There are no federally prescribed standards. The PLRA requires proper exhaustion enforced by a procedural bar. Um, it's not simply a ripeness rule, it's a procedural bar. In other words, if you, if you mess it up as a prisoner, you're out, not only have you um, undermined your possibility of your grievance succeeding, you've actually done away, what, what has happened is that no longer do you have a right of access to the federal court either. None of the traditional exemptions from ex administrative exhaustion requirements, the primary one um, that matters for us being futility, apply. In other words, it doesn't matter if the system, suppose all you want is damages and the system cannot award damages, the grievance system, doesn't matter. As long as the system is capable of handing you any remedy at all, you must go through it as a prisoner. There is no excuse for good cause, there is no excuse for special circumstances, but, Statute requires, I'll go back to it, only exhaustion of such administrative remedies as are available. That's under Ross versus Blake, um, and that is the crucial, the crucial provision for our purposes. Okay, so, whoops, sorry. So what does this mean? Well, we have a set of both ordinary problems the exhaustion, the requirement of proper exhaustion incentivizes com complications and procedural traps. In other words, the more complex you can make your system as a, as a prison official, the more likely you are for people to mess it up and then your prison is immunized in conditions of confinement cases. I don't mean that prison, prisons always exercise this kind of bad faith, but it's certainly the case that the incentive is for them to add layers, add complications, make it hard to exhaust because if a prisoner neglects to dot I's across T's and some of the cases you wouldn't believe, you know, files of, files with red ink is one that's kind of famous but true, I found it. I, I mean, I'm not the only one who found it, but some people doubted it existed and I went to, and spent some time and ran it to ground. Um, or the, the, the system says you have to file on one page, but you had trouble explaining all the facts on one page, so you file on two pages, you're out. The system says you have to tell all the relevant facts, but you stuck to one page, you're out, and so on. Um, okay, so that's, that's one set of problems. The second set of problems is that grievance systems are slow and cumbersome, and emergency speed-ups often fail. Okay, those are kind of the normal issues. I could come up with others. But emergencies create the four additional system stressors that I have on this slide. They impose risks, they increase the importance of speed, they um, undermine normal institutional uh, coping. You know, because of COVID, for example, lots of staff were gone, right? And that means that the institution is short staffed for all kinds of purposes, which both generates the problems that people want to grieve and also undermines ability to process grief. Right? So these are emergency situations. So what to do? Well, I think, I actually didn't notice when I started, so I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um,
But I think that there are three potential solutions, and when I have written this up, for, so thank you to a lot of you for um, offering a forum to put this stuff into, the three solutions that I propose are, one has to do with unavailability doctrine, one has to do, and that's a judicial one, one has to do with the people who run prisons and jails, how they could actually implement working emergency grievance systems, and one has to do with the Congress, which could amend the prison litigation reform act. So to run through that fairly quickly, under Ross versus Blake, an administrative procedure counts as unavailable if it is a simple dead end. Not if it offers you relief you don't want. That's not unavailable, right? Like uh, uh, it offers you a change going forward and you want damages, or it offers you damages if you want a change going forward. Either way, that's not unavailable. But if there is no relief that it consistently, if it consistently denies all relief, then that counts as unavailable. So um, uh, that had, means, for example, if the prison is locked down and you can't get access to a grievance form, or you have your grievance form, but you, there's nobody to give it to because nobody ever talks to you, or um, the grievance officer, who's the only one who can accept the forms, is out for the entire pendency of the period of time where you can file a grievance, or whatever, right? If, if, if the system is unavailable for those reasons, Actually, the cases have been fairly um, consistent that under Ross versus Blake, you don't have to agree. You can't do the impossible. But what if there's a different kind of claim? What if a prisoner says, look, I have um, asthma and a history of um, uh, 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 pneumonia, and I'm really at risk from COVID, but there's no social distancing here. They haven't let me have a vaccine yet. This is no longer mostly the case, but it used to be, right? Nobody's let me have a vaccine. The staff aren't masking up. There's no social distancing. And I'm gonna get it. Like, like the prevalence rate in this, in, this, in this prison is sky high and getting higher. I'm going to get COVID. I'm gonna get very sick, I could die. And the grievance system requires three layers of review, each one of which takes 60 days to get through. So I'm 180 days out, even if everything goes exactly the way it, can, it should, before they have to answer me. And I need relief next week. Okay? So that's, the question is, is that unavailable? Does that mean that the grievance system is unavailable? And here we have a circuit split with the Seventh Circuit saying, yeah, not in a COVID case, but in a, in a pre-COVID case. The Seventh Circuit says, yeah, that's, that's unavailable. And um, our home circuit, the Sixth Circuit, saying, ah, I'm sorry, are you kidding me? That's not unavailable, that's whining. Um, and so those are, and the, the district court cases are all over the map. Although I, I haven't done anything very systematic to see which, I, I'm sure there are more saying, no excuse for you. But there are quite a few saying, yep, yeah, that's unavailable. So, um, so one solution to this emergency problem is to take seriously what Ross versus Blake says. If officers are unable to provide any relief, and the only relief that matters is relief in the next five days, 10 days, 15 days, and they're unable to work a grievance system in a way that can answer that, that's unavailable. And the prison system then has two options. It can allow those lawsuits to go forward, right? Judges can accept those lawsuits. Or the prison system can build solution two, a functional emergency system, which includes urgent matters, which has really speedy processing when um, the grievance calls for it, and which has simple enough procedures that they can actually be followed during an emergency. So, um, uh, Delaware, for example, has an emergency process that covers an issue that considers matter. Somebody ought to, uh, you know, do some edits, but whatever. An issue that considers matter which, under regular time limits, would subject the inmate to a substantial risk of personal, physical, or psychological harm. So that's a pretty broad inclusion. And there are systems that promise, I don't know that they actually succeed, but they're promised very speedy processing in sufficiently important time-sensitive matters. So I think this is a doable solution.
information and that, and that prisons could do it. If they don't, I think the rule of Ross versus Blake is clear, that exhaustion um, is only required when the grievance system is, is available. And it's not available if it can't possibly give you anything that matters. OK, so I, I want to admit, though, this is um, not it's not a no-brainer interpretation of Ross versus Blake, right? It's, 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 but I think it's the correct one. A third thing is that Congress could amend the PLRA, something along, oh, look, I have an extra, an extra breath, something along the lines of this proposed statutory amendment um, that says, look, during an emergency, which would need to be defined, I could give you a definition, but, but it would need to be defined, prisoners need not exhaust. And that would be very clear. There are um, folks on the Hill considering such an amendment. It's been put into, you know, it's, it's gone through legislative council and so on, but no one has introduced it yet. So there is a, a, a draft bill floating around that um, I, I think the odds of it going any place are pretty low. But you never know. And um, it seems worthwhile to say, well, what would that really look like? So um, I think I'm probably out of time. But so I'm going to stop. But those are um, those are some solutions to what I really do think is a pretty appalling problem. Prisoners have been told that they cannot get into court, which I take as one of the core commitments of uh, uh, the system of um, enforcing the Constitution. Prisoners have been told that they cannot get into court unless they use systems that, in point of fact, are um, unable and unwilling to um, either provide them a, a path to a remedy or even a path to a decision on their requests. And I think that's that's outrageous um, and should be changed. All right, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we'll have some good questions about those solutions. Um, but first, we need to hear from our final panelist, Professor Avram. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to the journal, and many, many thanks for allowing me to do it from home, which has solved uh, serious logistical issues in my family. Uh, it's delightful to be here, and it's great to be here with Marco and Nancy, whose work I admire greatly. And uh, the comments I'm going to make build a lot on the legal scaffolding that they made. Although, admittedly, I'm a social scientist, and I tend to look more at how things play out in the political arena in, 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 in practice. And, and because of that, I'm going to talk about a very concrete situation. Um, so I will share my screen with you. So the comments I'm going to make today are going to eventually be chapter six of my, uh, of my book in progress, um, Fester, which is about the COVID-19 crisis in California prisons. And today I'm going to focus on the limits of litigation, both at the state and at the federal levels. And I want to start with an article that I believe both Nancy and Margo mentioned by our colleagues, uh, Brandon Derrick and Lee Kowarski, called Viral Injustice. Uh, so they've run hundreds of COVID-19 custody cases, and here are the conclusions that they've reached. Our analysis defines the decision-making by reference to three attributes. The substantive right asserted, the form of detention at issue, and the remedy sought. Several patterns emerged. Judges avoided constitutional holdings whenever they could rejected requests for ongoing supervision, and resisted collective discharge, limiting such relief to vulnerable subpopulations. The most successful litigants were detainees in custody pending immigration proceedings, and the least successful were those convicted of crimes. So this in itself is distressing, but the question is, why and how is this happening on the ground? The main argument I'm going to make is that, at least in the context of California's COVID-19 prison litigation, which I'm deeply familiar with following it up, not just for the book, but also as part of the legal team, is that the PLRA is just a scaffold. Of course, it's not a factor in the state cases. And what can explain what's going on here is a lot more deep-seated political animosity toward actually reaching a hand and helping people in these circumstances. And I will take you step by step through this litigation to show you how this happened and how it played out in California. Now, I should say, shockingly, I came across this report from Prison Policy Initiative, 
that shows that California is actually one of the better state prison systems during COVID-19. They have this uh, scorecard that they've given the states. You can see uh, uh, yourselves right here. So more things to be proud of today. Uh, and the, uh, also amazingly, they come to the conclusion that California is one of the states that made the more significant efforts to reduce prison population. I will tell you that the prison population in California is up by several thousand people from the beginning of the pandemic. So I don't know how they came to this, but if California is one of their top states, I don't know what's going on with the other places. So this is the picture as of this morning. I took this shot uh, uh, just 15 minutes before the panel started. This is from the ticker on the CDCR website, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations. You can see that uh, more than half of our prisoners, 51,000 uh, people, got the disease. And we've had 242 deaths that I'm going to uh, argue were completely preventable. Prisons in California, like every prison, and this is something that Margot mentioned earlier, are susceptible to contagion and disease. This is just uh, just in the last couple of decades, we've been battling an infection of valley fever in our prisons, and many people suffer from long-term effects of that. And this is just one of many examples. Uh, uh, the inability of the California medical system in prisons to provide people basic constitutional care led to very lengthy litigation in a case called Brown versus Plata, which eventually came to the Supreme Court. In the aftermath of Plata, after many, many years of making efforts to reform the prison system, after uh, basically taking the medical system out of the hands of the state and giving it to a federal receiver in 2006, eventually the case came to a three-judge panel and overcoming the many hurdles of the PRA, the panel ordered that the population in the prisons, which were at the time crowded to 200% capacity, be reduced to 137.5. Uh, and this is the effect of that. Uh, in the aftermath, the key case came all the way to the Supreme Court. Then Attorney General, later Governor Jerry Brown, fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. But at the same time, they realized it was going to be inevitable, and in 2011, uh, uh, they introduced a, 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 a legislation uh, called the, the uh, Public Safety Realignment, which led to the reclassification of where people actually do their sentences. It basically consisted of a jurisdictional shift of pushing people out of state prisons and into county jails. And that was somewhat of a bump, although it didn't get them to where they needed to be to comply with the litigation. And then uh, a few years uh, later, in, in, in 2014, voters passed Proposition 47, which reclassified some less serious crimes as uh, misdemeanors, leading again to a chunk of people either not being incarcerated at all or being incarcerated in jails instead of prisons. And that finally brought them into compliance with the threshold established in Plata. So the system was finally Plata compliant, but of course it was still overcrowded. It was still at 137.5% which is a lot more people than you can manage in a situation like a pandemic. Moreover, the mandate in Brown versus Plata was a system-wide mandate. So the whole system had to comply with this number, but they, they didn't say that every individual prison had to do it. So coming into March 2020, several prisons, about a third of them, were at 150% capacity, so still grossly overcrowded. And of course, because the jails were to be the release valve for the state prison system, that meant that the jails became overcrowded and sprouted a lot of healthcare problems of their own. So coming into uh, March 2020, several people, including people on this panel, published op-eds and argued very, very uh, vocally that this is going to be a real test for the prisons and that we must decarcerate now to allow us to handle this pandemic. This was crystal clear to people back in January and February. And it was also crystal clear to county officials in the counties neighboring those prisons back in March. And they talked to the prisons and tried to alert them to what was going on. The prison didn't listen, and uh, several disasters ensued. So prisons started seeing a rise in cases in March, but some prisons, like St. Quentin, managed to be fairly COVID-free until late May. And then, uh, because there was an outbreak at a prison in Chino, they took prisoners from Chino, about 200 of them, and moved them around to St. Quentin and Coulter. They packed them on buses like sardines, one next to the other, and before they boarded the bus, several prisoners who had not been tested for COVID for weeks came over to the nurses and said, we're coughing, we have a fever, and the nurses said, shut up and get on the bus. As a consequence, they were being brought into St. Quentin, they were not tested coming in, they were not tested before they left the prison, and they were put in with general population. 
This chart that I'm showing here on the right comes from the Office of the Inspector General's report on what happened there. And you can see that in June 1, there's no cases when these people are coming into the prison. But on July 8, the prison, all the wards are already infected, and there's already thousands of cases in what was then the worst uh, single outbreak in the entire United States. Uh, and of course, it ravages death row, it ravages places where there's elderly, infirm people, and uh, many of them uh, die. This just gives you a picture of what's been going on in all the prisons, just to show you that it's not St. Quentin. And you can see that the uh, number of cases per 1,000 people, this is number of cases per 1,000 people, is, of course, much, much higher in the prison system than it is both in the United States and in California. Just to explain something about mortality rates, as we all know, this is not news to anybody listening to this, uh, mortality rates are, of course, higher in the 65 plus category of people that are older. However, prison populations, even though we do incarcerate a lot of people over 50, uh, uh, shockingly about a quarter of our prison population is people over 50, we don't incarcerate a ton of people 65 years and older, although we do have a 90-year-old man and a 94-year-old man in California custody. Uh, I'm sure they pose a very serious danger to public safety. So when you adjust for age, for the fact that prisoners are a little bit younger than people on the outside, you see, and this is the work of our, uh, our friends at the uh, UCLA COVID Behind the uh, Bars Data Project, that uh, the death rate within prisons, the mortality rate of COVID, is at least three times what it is in the general population. So how did we try to find this legally? So this is the legal landscape. Again, uh, probably not new to a lot of people. I'll go over it quickly. Federally, of course, there's the Eighth Amendment prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment. And the standard in the context of prison conditions is deliberate indifference to a prisoner's serious medical needs, which happens when a defendant realizes that a substantial risk of serious harm to a prisoner exists, but then disregards that risk. So it's more than negligence, it's awareness. And of course, we know uh, from what we've just heard that the PLRA limits its releases to scenarios where no lesser remedy would do. On the state level, we have our own version of the Eighth Amendment in California. It's in Article 1 of the California Constitution. It prohibits curiously cruel or unusual punishment, as opposed to and. Uh, this little nuance has, is, is not unimportant, and I can talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, again, the deliberate indifference standard that is being used on the federal level is good law in California as well. And the context in California is not the kind of class action that we've seen in PANA, but more habeas petitions that people submit in state court asking to be released from, released from custody because of the violation of their Article 1, Section 17 rights. So here's what actually happened. So the same people who are so kind of from the people who brought you uh, Brown versus Plata, the same people, the same law firms uh, who brought you uh, that case pursued basically a continuation of a Plata versus Newsom at the Northern District of California before Judge John Tiger. Judge Tiger was visibly emotional. I attended all the hearings via Zoom, uh, you know, making emotional pleas to the defendants, please care about, uh, uh, about the incarcerated people, actually crying with tears on screen, and at some point showing a slideshow of images of the people who died, which included both prisoners and staff. He said during the litigation, my pleas to Governor Newsom to release people have fallen on deaf ears. And nonetheless, he repeated again and again at every status meeting of the case, which is not over yet, still ongoing, I'm not there yet on not finding deliberate indifference. He consistently said that he wanted to have a, a conciliatory approach. He said, I don't want to give orders. <laughs> Ironically, orders is exactly what you go to the federal district for, but said, no, I want us all to agree on what to do. And because of this conciliatory approach and the idea of bringing everybody peacefully to the table, he tolerated with uh, fairly uh, good humor uh, a lot of foreign evasive maneuvers that were being pursued by the defendants. So the state was making the argument, and this is following uh, 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 the exhaustion argument that Martin just presented, that federal courts are not the appropriate forum. The appropriate forum is to leave this to the prisons because they know what they're doing. Of course, at the same time, and I'm going already foreshadowing what I'm going to say later, the same defendants show up in state court and say, this is not the right forum. The right forum is the federal court. And when they go to the state court of appeals, they say, this is not the right forum. You know, the basic, uh, uh, the basic superior court is the forum. So they're playing these forum wars, and everywhere they're getting polite consideration and listen from the judges. Judge Tiger also has this multi-party approach where everybody has a seat at the table. At some point, several months into the pandemic, attorneys representing the CCPOA, which is the union of prison guards in California, show up. 
to represent the rights of the guards who do not want to get vaccinated and do not want to get scolded for being unmasked and spreading rumors about COVID not existing and about the vaccines killing people. And he consistently flatters them and says, I'm so grateful that they're at the table with us. This is so wonderful. And then the whole conversation turns around, how can we gently and politely persuade the guards to put on their masks and vaccinate? And what did they not do before ruling about the mandate? They said, you know, we're consulting persuasion experts. They went to the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley, reaching out to people who are experts on persuasion, trying to uh, uh, basically crack the riddle of why it is that the guards don't want to get vaccinated. The vaccines themselves were very good news to the court because it allowed them to pivot away from something that they would not consider under the PLRA, which was actually letting people out do something a lot more modest, which is to ask for vaccines. They would not order the governor to vaccinate, but uh, instead, Tiger actually contacted Governor Newsom and said, can you please spare some, he actually said, couch money to make this happen in the prisons. Finally, after a lot of public pressure from advocates, uh, prisons where were uh, uh, prioritized for vaccines and incarcerated people much more in the life, took the vaccine at acceptance, rate, acceptance rates that exceeded the general population. But the guards still would not vaccinate, and to this day will not vaccinate. And so the final ruling in this case that was given just a couple of weeks ago was far more modest than the original scope of the litigation. It was just a vaccine mandate for correctional officers. But that was not okay. And the ruling is now under appeal by the CCPOA and by Governor Newsom, despite the fact that Judge Tiger only ordered the vaccination after the receiver from CDCR himself asked for this ruling. At the same time that this is going on, several people are filing habeas corpus petitions at the Superior Court of Marin. This is, I'm limiting my story here just to what's going on in San Quentin. One of those petitions is summarily rejected, and immediately the First District Appellate Project takes on the case. It's a case of a man called Von Steich, who is 64 years old and has a lung condition, has a bullet in his lung from a, from a bank robbery from the early 80s. Uh, the case shows up at the appellate court after it's been dismissed by the Marine Superior Court, and we have the good luck of showing up before Justice Anthony Klein. Again, uh, uh, CDCR shows up at the, at the hearing and says this is not the forum, there's litigation going on in federal court, and Klein says, no, federal court should be the last line of recourse. What is more natural for somebody than to go to the state court? On the merits, uh, there's a denial of petitioner's claims. That's what the uh, CDCR does, is they say without any factual evidence to the contrary, we're just disagreeing with everything that you say about COVID. And they also say to the judge, there is no need to act hastily. Uh, uh, Justice Klein becomes furious and says, yes, there is. Yes, there is. There is a need to act hastily. And in order, October 2020, which arguably is not that hasty, uh, uh, he finds that there's been a constitutional violation of the California Constitution. The remedy is phrased in a very vague way, as it often is in these prison cases, for reasons we can talk about in the Q&A, to reduce the St. Quentin population to 50% of its design capacity. Basically, to just allow the prison physically to put six feet between every two people. That's what they needed to do, and that is what doctors recommended in the summer when they visited the prison. Of course, CDCR responds by immediately appealing this decision to the California Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, despite the fact that you didn't present any evidence that you've dealt well with COVID, we're going to give you another shot, take it to the Marine Superior Court, and show them what you've done at an evidentiary hearing. At the same time, CDCR also says, oh, we can either release people or transfer them. Let's transfer them. Let's transfer them to other prisons. There are lots of problems with this, starting with the fact that California has virtually no rehabilitation programs in any other prison. And Quentin is uh, unusually rich in rehabilitation programs because it's close to the Bay Area and people like me volunteer there so they don't have to spend a cent on these programs. And because of that, for people trying to make parole that have to take these programs, it's basically telling people you're not going to make parole if you're transferred. And of course, they targeted petitioners later arguing, well, what do you want? You want it out of Quentin, we're taking you out of Quentin, so why are you complaining? The case comes all the way to the Marin Superior Court, where they hold an extensive evidentiary hearing spanning several weeks, including testimony from incarcerated witnesses who are telling us what happened inside St. Quentin. And what we learn from these accounts is that the factual landscape is even worse than was exposed in the Inspector General report. First of all, 
we learned that both UC Berkeley infectious diseases and various tech companies offer the prison free help. We're going to test people for you. We're going to fast track the results. We're going to give you masks. We're going to give you everything you need. And the prison said, no, 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 we are fine. There was no serious expert testimony presented by the prison to deny the fact that the conditions were the way that they were. And it, it, it transpired that the custodial side didn't even know what the medical side was doing and vice versa. After many months of this, Judge Howard, a few months ago, issues a tentative ruling where he says, yes, there's been the equivalent, the California equivalent of an eighth amendment violation. There has been deliberate indifference. But now we have vaccines, which change the game. So no relief to petitioners. Uh, the, the, the cases are moot. So what's happening now is that they're now hearing objections to the tentative ruling. This raises the question, is the case really moot? So here's what's going on right now. There's a COVID outbreak at the California Institute of Women involving hundreds of people. The jails, which are bursting at the seams because they're not transferring enough people to the prisons, are seeing numerous serious outbreaks, including in Santa Clara County. And we have 310 active cases in custody. More people died in the last wave. So here's what I'm thinking. Uh, the, here, here's why I think the PLRA is just a scalp, at least in the case of California. First of all, it's pretty obvious that there is this massive dread or distaste for releases. There's this constant search for low-hanging fruit. We've seen conciliatory and deferent approach toward the state. We've seen an absurd preferences by the justices for by the, the judges for consensus in the face of overwhelming evidence of its impossibility. And we've seen a lot of patience for flagrant bad faith litigation, including self-contradictory forum arguments. We've seen a preference for jurisdiction over geography, so a lack of understanding that prisons are actually right near the counties. And if there's an infection in the prison a few days later, numbers in the county spike. We've seen a lack of understanding that what's going on in prisons also affects what's going on in jails. And we've seen a lot of justice delays literally denying justice to people because their claims become moot. And there's also an angle of California politics here. This is something that's important for me to explain, and I'll end with that to people from out of state. A lot of these folks that are sort of at the helm of this preventable disaster are widely hailed, hailed by everybody as the heroes of the resistance at the national level, right? The people who are fighting Trump, you know, we're in a state that's all science forward and vaccine forward and mandating vaccinations in schools. And at the local level, they're behaving at utterly villainous ways. So what are these releases for which we got the C minus from the prison policy initiative? Uh, this is an op-ed that I wrote the day after Governor Newsom released the, uh, the prison release plan, uh, which was going to prioritize people who were getting out anyway and were doing short sentences. In November, we got the numbers of who actually got out. The grand total of people that we released out of this 100,000 uh, system was less than 8,000 prisoners, 0.8% of whom were people who were COVID high-risk medical folks. So people, why is this? This is because there's a high percentage of people who are old and have done long sentences. These are the folks that are the least risk to public safety. Rather, they themselves face the most risk because they're old, because they've been in prison for decades, so their health is completely shattered. And, and, and they're not a risk on the outside because they've aged out of crime. Nonetheless, because they were sentenced for, to, for, for, for a violent crime that they did 40 years ago, those are people whose optics of release are the worst. And there's a lot of resistance letting those people out. I can talk more about uh, other aspects of this resistance uh, in the QA. And of course, all of these releases are now gone. This is the, the, uh, the graph of CDCR population. The trends have now completely reversed. These are the releases of July. And we've now completely eclipsed those. And we have more people than we had at the very beginning of the whole thing. Here's Gavin Newsom, our governor, right? The champion of COVID vaccines, the science forward state, fighting the plans and actually pushing the appeal of the prison guards against the vaccine mandate. Why insist that people vaccinate in schools and protect guards from getting vaccinated? Well, our governor recently faced a recall election and the guards union cut in a 1.75 million check. So that might invite some speculation about why he's so eager to take on their case against the vaccines. Moreover, all of these legal maneuvers that I've shown you are being orchestrated by our Attorney General, Rob Bonta, who was appointed after Javier Becerra, his predecessor, who basically orchestrated this whole disaster, was promoted, of all ironies, to lead the health case in the Biden administration. So here is an image from a protest we did at the San Quentin Gates. You can tell this is me uh, at the very beginning. But you can also tell that to my right 
Here's Rob Bonta, then an assembly member, who was quoted in The Guardian saying, we're in the middle, middle of a humanitarian crisis that was created and wholly avoidable. We need to act with urgency fueled by compassion. And of course, when he becomes attorney general, the compassion fades, and we're all going to do whatever we can to not let anybody out. Thank you for listening, and uh, look forward to uh, talking more in the Q&A. This is some of the information for you. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, I am not Professor Hardaway. Something has come up, and so I'm going to step in for purposes of the Q and A. Uh, I'm Jonathan Anton, as uh, uh, as Andy mentioned before. Uh, and I think before we turn to questions, let me ask our panelists if any of you want to respond in any way to uh, the comments of your colleagues. I, I have a question I'd love to ask Nancy. Uh, uh, and that is this. Uh, I, I'd actually love to ask Lee this too, but you know, we'll see if I get a chance later. So, um, litigants have been using the habeas, a habeas avenue into court, a habeas vehicle, to attack um, conditions that they claim make their confinement illegal, in part because, you know, habeas is habeas, it's the Great Writ and so on, but in large part because they want out from under the prison release order provisions of the, um, of the prison litigation form. And I wonder, do you have any worries about, and in the Second Circuit, for example, like Hades is available for that kind of thing, right? Like that's not, it's not clear that the prison release order part of the PLRA does apply to it, but it's absolutely clear that Hades is available. So I guess what I wonder is, um, uh, do you have any concerns about whether using 2241 for that kind of path of litigation would be problematic in some way? Or do you just say, you know, like any port in a storm? Sure, go, go for it. Well, I think that eventually, if, if the prediction of the district court that I quoted, uh, that that judge was worried, this claim is going to find its way into every uh, conditions of confinement. Right. And and they're going to be filed under both 2241 and whatever else, uh, you know, the 1983 or forgiveness. Um, and it's just going to be a tidal wave of 2241 cases. I think if that happens, we're going to see some pushback. Right. But these cases where it's been successful, that is, it's, it's convinced the judge that there's a claim under 2241 and has gotten past exhaustion in habeas and has reached the merits of the Eighth Amendment claim. Those few cases, a handful of them that I could find at you know, publicly available sources, were cases that were quite narrow where the class, and some of these are class actions, the class is only the most medically vulnerable people. Uh, so it it's not, it's not, it doesn't look like the kind of thing that is going to be a slippery slope that would bother most federal courts in terms of remedy. Um, but, so, so, so no, I'm not, I'm right. not, I'm, I'm not so concerned. What, what prompted the question, and, and then I'll subside, but what prompted the question was that I've been, I've been doing some work on um, remedies for federal violations of the anti-disability discrimination laws uh, under mm -hmm. the Rehabilitation Act. And I found this really interesting case in New York where somebody said, no, there's some case law that's mixed. There's some case law that says the, the remedy is an APA suit. Lawsuit, rather than a direct action under the Rehab Act. Okay, whatever, that seems stupid, but but okay. But I found this one case 
um, in New York, which said, yeah, that may be right for everybody else, but in prison, not so much. Bring your disability discrimination claim as a conditions of confinement habeas action. And since you can do that, you can't have an APA case because the APA says only in the absence of another cause of action. Um, and so that began me thinking, I mean, you know, obviously this has a bait and switch quality that's problematic, right? But apart from the bait and switch quality, it's gotten me to thinking about like, how would you actually do this if you're not playing bait and switch? What's the right answer? So that was what was prompted my question. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think uh, we, we heard about the bait and switch in California as well. We were talking about how uh, the defendants kept arguing, no, we should be over there. No, we should be over there. And on both sides of that analysis. And that, that happens a lot with this litigation. All prisoner litigation ends up with that at some point. That's the first reaction that you get from defendants in these cases is, wait a minute, you're using the wrong tool. Let's delay. Let's delay. Thanks. Other comments on the from panelists? Um, We've got a question in the room to facilitate things. Wait for the mic. I want to let the students go before, I guess. Well, OK. Uh, I don't know if the camera's on me at all, uh, Nancy and Margo, but it's Lee. Um, and, <laughs> um, hi, idea. We haven't met in person bef before, um, just on Twitter, I think. Uh, so. I guess my response to, I have both a question and a, a response. So I guess I have a question first, which is to Margo. And I have a, a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and people will ask me, oh, did you hear this thing that happened in this case last week that's in my area of expertise? And I like freak out because I like actually have been like doing whatever soccer dad stuff nonstop, and I actually don't know about that thing. So uh, like while I'm commenting on the question that you asked to Nancy, uh, I, I also would ask, did you listen to oral argument in uh, Ramirez v. Collins? And because if you're on our sort of side on this, listening to the justices grill the state about like why it took so long to respond to the grievance form was like balm for the soul. Um, uh, uh, so I guess, uh, uh, Nancy, I wanted to, in light of your answer to, to Margo, I wanted to ask you, like you're, I'm, I'm always ultimately, the, the lower courts have gotten very frisky on uh, issues where they think they might be able to secure a five justice majority to overturn some precedent, right? Um, yeah, and, I like that. Yeah. and so, um, so if you're on my side of, of this, if you're you know very concerned that there aren't procedural vehicles to challenge conditions, um, uh, I think you're right for most of the jurisdictions uh, in the sense that I think there's not a, um, a slippery slope problem. But, I, and I hate this phrase at this point in my career, but like the circuits are, are they, not an it. Um, and like the Fifth Circuit certainly would love to get a crack at uh, a ruling in which they could say, no, 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 you can't actually bring this as a habeas claim. And isn't yeah. one enough? Because then you have a circuit split, then you go up to a very hostile court, and then aren't you looking at sort of this retrenchment of these really dramatic exclusivity and exhaustion rules that take away the remedies? I just wonder what your thought is about that. that Time, that well, if, if you were worried about district courts giving relief that the Supreme Court doesn't really prefer as a reason for them not to give that relief and take that action, you'd be in a whole other world, right? I mean, there, there are all sorts of things that district courts are doing that a conservative court would prefer them not to do. But you're asking, I guess, is, is that enough reason for them not to do it? or to be worried about them doing it in the first place. And I, especially in the context of emergency responses to life or death issues, I would say no. I mean, that's the, that's the history of Hague throughout, uh, is that district judges just go out on a limb and, and do what they think is right to give relief where other courts or precedent might suggest that it's not available or it certainly isn't 
present yet and and deal with an emergency, a time sensitive situation, whether it's the boat lift or military detention, whatever it is. And then maybe we'll get a reaction that says you shouldn't have done that. This is developed into a problem. Something like we saw with 2254, right? I mean, and EDPA, where Congress and the court both said all these things that you're doing in expanding habeas have created this massive harm and explosion of litigation that we don't need, so we're going to shut it down. That might happen with something like this too, but that doesn't mean that it's not functioning the way it ought to. I mean, my view is that habeas is there for that dialogue. It's for that immediate response and some ultimate resolution over time of what judicial remedies are appropriate for which situations. So I'm not concerned that it might get to the Supreme Court. I hope that eventually all of these 2241 experiments result in some careful thinking on the part of the court and Congress. And I hope that they preserve that freedom for district courts to use their powers and equitable powers under 2241 to experiment. So no, I'm not concerned. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up for a touch, you don't even need to respond. I mean, I wasn't sort of pressing as much on whether it was normatively desirable and whether we think it's inevitable as a predictive matter. And it sounds like we both think it's inevitable that it ends up at the court, and you're a touch more optimistic than I am that maybe the quote-unquote dialogue between the lower federal courts and the Supreme Court will result in something a little more textured than prisoner loses. Yeah, that's something. Other questions? Do we have any questions from the folks who are zoomed in? Yeah, we do. We have one question from an anonymous attendee, which was posed towards the end of Professor King's segment, which is, what is the Sixth Circuit decision Professor King is referring to? Williams. Nancy, you're muted. I'm sorry. It's called Wilson v. Williams, and I'll put the site in the chat. How's that? Again, it wasn't ultimately successful for the petitioners, but it was, it's now somewhat of a leading case, recognizing that there is jurisdiction under 2241 for these no confinement, let me out now claims. So I'll put it in the chat for you. Other questions? Maybe, Professor Aviron, let me ask you one. You focus on the limits of litigation for dealing with conditions of confinement during the pandemic. Sometimes when social scientists talk about the limits of litigation, they talk about either alternatives to litigation or complements to litigation. And I wonder to what extent you might see either alternatives or complements to litigation in this setting. So I think it's not a big shocker. Thank you for the question. It's an excellent question. I think that it's not a shocker to accuse me by a research assistant here. That I think, I don't think it's a shocker that we have not been utterly successful in saving people from this disease, obviously, and that's really an understatement. But what successes we've had came not from the governor's mansion or from the courts, but rather from a lot of things that we did in the public sphere that made things happen. The biggest success, I think, that the Stop San Quentin Outbreak Coalition can boast, and this is, I have to say, I've been in the activist space for about 20 years now, and this is the most functional, effective, productive group of individuals I've ever worked with. It's a group of people who were recently released, so they still have a lot of friends inside, lots of family members of people and other interested parties, lots of healthcare folks, some lawyers, 
uh, people who bring in a lot of skills to the table and work together in a really admirable and, and very pragmatic way. Um, so, so here's what we did that I think was, was useful. The most pressing thing was to try to figure out which struggle was what we were going to prioritize. And this is where we were having real trouble because people were worried with the advent of the vaccine that everything was going to pivot to the vaccine and the whole release thing was going to go down the wayside, which as I showed is exactly what happened in mitigation. And I kept saying we can't do this because uh, we've got to save people and we have to have enough love in our hearts for two wars. We have to fight the war for the vaccines and the war for the releases at the same time knowing that we're probably not going to win the war for the releases. We did win the war for the incarcerated people getting vaccinated. And, and basically, the way that we did it was by pushing our own information into the prisons. So at that point, after everything that people have been through, and I can talk some about the, the evidence that we have from outside, because in the book, we feature hundreds of stories from people about all the aspects of, of going through this hell uh, behind bars. They would not believe anything that CDCR doctors tell them. So, you know, while being told by the guards every day that COVID doesn't exist and that the vaccine's going to kill you, you know, CDCR pushing the opposite message at the same time was ineffective. We had to figure, we had to push in a message that people could 100% trust from a source that had, that they were clear had their welfare in mind. And that source was a group of physicians at UCSF in a Berkeley called AMEN. Those were the folks that visited Quentin in June and made the recommendation to reduce the population. So people knew that they really wanted what was best for them. And they brought in a, 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 a frequently asked questions uh, piece that we managed to get into the prisons. We also managed to record videos of people who had been just recently incarcerated and still had a lot of folks that knew them on the outside. And they very generously recorded themselves making videos that were about a minute and a half saying, listen, here I am getting vaccinated, you should do the same, like please save yourselves. Just somebody who was your buddy, who was your cellmate, who has your best interest in mind. And we deliberately kept those short so that they could be watched on a smuggled cell phone in my bar so that people could see them. Uh, later on, both the prisons and the jails actually compiled those. And in some cases, we collaborated with people in, in the prison and jail administration to put together a video to show uh, to show folks behind bars. But of course, most of the credit goes to the incarcerated people themselves. Right, managing to inform themselves properly of what was needed uh, for them to save themselves. Um, so I think that of all the things, the most notable success that we had was with the vaccination campaign. At the same time, many of us, uh, including me, but others as well, wrote op-eds trying to get the prioritization of prisons. Now, of course, Governor Newsom boasts that he did this. This was only after very significant public pressure from us. And, and we could only wish that the same public pressure were applied to the guards and not just to the incarcerated people, because right now, all of the infections that we're seeing popping up again are basically generated by guards bringing it from, uh, from, uh, from the inside, uh, from the outside. So this is, so, so, so I think these are the, the, the complementary things that we did. We couldn't, of course, abandon the litigation. We're still, the litigation, as you can see, is still ongoing. But I think that just pushing things in public channels, I think that the in the aftermath of the no on the recall, our argument that there is just immense hypocrisy in pushing vaccination in schools and protecting guards from not getting vaccinated has found some purchase in the public. And, and people were upset about that. So, so, so we are seeing some success in that area. But the problem, of course, is when you live in a state that's perceived as a blue state, but studying prisons feels anything but a blue state, is that at, you're a captive audience. I mean, who are you going to vote for? You know, if not Newsom and Bonta, then, then who? But this is who you're left with. So the only thing you have left is to educate and empower people to take care of themselves to the limited extent that they can, and to try to push their case in the court of public opinion. Hey, Professor Kowalski, you wanted, did you want to uh, make another comment? So just to switch gears, I guess, a, a tiny bit, and I, I had two questions, and just because of the ordering of the queue, I guess it seems like I'm trying to monopolize it. I'm not. <laughs> um, this is primarily for Hadir, but uh, also have um, Michigan and Tennessee represented here. Uh, so you made the comment that, you know, this person featured to the right of you in the picture was going to go on uh, to be AG and forget all about uh, his uh, sympathy and empathy for prisoners. Um, I was really ex excited when I saw your um, your book project. I actually didn't know about it until just now. Um, I, I wondered, uh, that was an AG candidate. I wondered if you could talk a little bit in California and Margot and, and Nancy, if you know any 
thing about it in your states, about what the behavior of the AGs, the attorney general, I mean, sorry, the, the district attorneys and the localities has been like, um, has it been a similarly uniform drift or has it been more, it even has like Boudin been, you know, much more helpful than some of the other people as, as one might expect. Just, I mean, tell me a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the political economy of it locally. So Lee, I am so glad that you asked because it has not been uniform. Because at the municipal level and at the county level, the DAs have actually been very responsive to this. And in fact, I got phone calls from DAs while this was going on to my personal cell phone saying, what can I do to help? I know that I don't have anything to do with Newsom or any of that much, like I don't have any purchase at the governor's mansion, but what is it that I can do to help in my county? And what I said was basically, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> Which is to say, for example, uh, uh, in California, and I'm sure in other places as well, prosecutors show up for parole hearings. I said, can you just not show up? Can you just not be there? Can you just not show up when people have parole hearings? They say, of course, you know, it's not a problem. So, so, so in some counties, the DA stopped sending representative to parole hearings. Uh, in some places, DA started trying to look for non carceral solutions to try and save people. Whenever there were cases of elderly people or people that were sick, they tried to look for all kinds of other solutions. Uh, we also tried to mobilize the local DAs in the context of what was going on in the local jails. I have a paper out called Bottleneck about how all of this impacted what was going on in the jails, which was its own horror show because uh, there, as Margot pointed out in a very prescient article about this, we sprouted a hydro problem, right? We're not dealing with one villain, we're dealing with 58 different villains in different degrees of villain. And there what you have is sheriffs that are not even reporting the rates of infection or testing. So you don't even have the data to know what's going on. Even as you get phone calls from the inside saying there's hundreds of people coughing here. So, so the DAs were, were instrumental in quietly trying to find solutions for the jail problem, but of course not enough and not uniformly in all counties. And this is where California, which is very polarized, is an interesting case because our blue counties are very, very blue and the DAs were very motivated to help. And in the red counties, there was no help for coming and no phone calls came in. So, so, so your fate, basically, the extent to which anybody cares about their health and safety really depends on which county you have the, the good or bad luck to, to live in. So, so that's at, at that level. At the state level, it's just been a horrific disappointment all around. When Balta was being asked, and this is actually an interesting question to all of you, uh, when Balta was being asked recently at a press conference, and I keep prodding them to ask this, like, how can you support vaccination and at the same time leave this case and shamelessly protect the guards from getting vaccinated? He said, oh, that's a completely different thing. When I'm litigating, I have a client. And I just don't think that this accurately capture, captures what the Attorney General's job is. He's not supposed to be the Tom Hagen of the Guards Union. Like, he does have some duties to the state, and he can't be speaking from two sides of his mouth, which is exactly what he's doing. But I'm going to shut up now, because I actually, I'm actually curious to hear how this is playing out in, in other places. You know, I, I think that the evidence, jail populations have been down a great deal in the course of the pandemic. But I think the evidence is that that's not mostly been um, the folks who run those populations, which is a combination of prosecutors and jail authorities. It, it's not mostly been because they've been releasing people. It's mostly been that the, you know, you've got kind of stock and flow. The flow in um, was very significantly um, slowed um, for a variety of reasons. Um, now, I, I have to say also the flow out was was slow too, right? Because trials got postponed. And there hasn't yet been the right kind of analysis to understand, well, how did jail populations go down 20%, 25% in some places by, by quite a bit more than that? Was it was it the flow in, the flow out, or, or was there some kind of increased um, compassionate release, et cetera? Um, so I, I think that by making it a question of the political inclinations of the DAs, you're assuming an answer to that, which is probably not the right answer. I think that the, the bulk of it has probably been about police processing and what that's done to population. So um, I slightly resist the question. I don't have a lot to add. Uh, Tennessee also has the polarization of blue counties and red counties. You see differences in DA behavior based on that as well. 
but but I, I do know that law enforcement um, in, in state and, and at the federal level too has been conscious about like, switching to summonses or non-arrest approaches during the pandemic uh, in ways that they didn't before. So I agree with Margo, it could be DA behavior, but it also could be all sorts of other decision makers that are playing a role in the changing jail populations. Um, I have a question for for Margo. Is, is there a chance to ask? Sure, ask that? sure, go ahead. Uh, so your proposed congressional response is sort of just the sort of tailored remedy I would expect come from pressure from, from habeas cases, um, it, it, and hopefully it would be better than the kind that Leah is, is worried about. Um, but I was wondering if there is a, a precedent or some experience with the kinds of statutes that or emergency grievance procedures that states have used in sexual assault cases. So I know, you know, there, there, there are separate streamlined reporting um, administrative procedures for, for imminent sexual assault uh, risks in some places, and I was wondering if that might have a play yeah. in what you're doing. Very interesting. So the, the, um, the statutory proposal deals just with access to federal court. It doesn't actually say what should happen administratively. It's just a, um, you know, that's sort of my second proposal, right? The third proposal just says, look, like, like, just let people into court. Um, the, the, what, what goes on with respect to sexual assault on that topic has been very, very um, muddy um, in the years since the Prisoner Rape Elimination Act, PREA. Um, PREA's regulation, which came out in 2012, says that in order to be PREA compliant, um, prison systems have to have no time limit on access to a grievance process that's related to sexual assault or sexual abuse. Um, and I think the intent of that regulation was actually to take out exhaustion as an excuse for non-access to federal courts, because the theory was if you file a case in federal court and the, the judge says, well, you, you haven't exhausted, well, at that point, you could just go back and exhaust it and stay in your case and then proceed, right? And so the idea was, let's not tell, there's some other Priya ideas about what that process needs to look like, not so much the grievance process, but the investigatory process. But there's nothing in PREA that governs what the grievance process about sexual abuse, sexual assault needs to look like. What there is is just this, this thing that says no time limits, that's it. And the theory that that would give people freer access to the courts over sexual abuse and sexual assault has turned out largely to be a kind of a fail. Because the courts have not understood it to mean that. And there's basically been no take up of what was supposed to be this open path into federal court. The one other thing, though, is that the Prison Litigation Reform Act also says that you can't recover from mental or emotional injury in the absence of physical injury. And for a while, courts were saying that coerced sex or rape that didn't include um, physical trauma. So, um, Rape where, where the physical contact was limited to sex and there were no punches, there was just, you know, rape, right? They were saying, well, that's just mental or emotional, and so you can't recover in federal court for that. And the Congress passed a fix that said, well, if there's penetration, that mental or emotional injury thing doesn't count. Now, like, just don't even get me started, you know, on, right? Really? Like, you're going to bother doing statutory fix, and what you're going to require is, I, I just, it, it kind of boggles the mind. Um, but that said, those are the two things that have been done statutorily to deal with um, sexual assault and sexual abuse. And I wouldn't say that either of them is very satisfactory. So the, so the lessons from that are useful as what not to do. Yes, that, that you, are, you are clearly the optimist among the three of us. But yes, correct. <laughs> okay, thanks. Other questions? Either... Uh, Online or in the in the room, 
Um, let me take the moderator's prerogative one more time. Professor Schlanger, um, to what extent do people thinking about exhaustion in the PLRA and habeas context um, generally um, think about exhaustion in, by analogy to administrative law? Uh, you noted that there are provisions uh, suggesting that the sort of traditional administrative law type exceptions uh, like futility don't apply. Um, at the same time, the Supreme Court has been saying that the common law, administrative law doctrines of, of exhaustion of administrative remedies don't really apply unless Congress has specifically legislated. And I'm wondering to what extent that might inform the way we think about exhaustion in the prison context. Right, really interesting question. So, um, so what I, I, there's no provision in the PLRA that says, hey, by the way, this is not administrative exhaustion the way that it is under the APA. That's actually entirely interpretive law coming from the Supreme Court. And I, I recall a brief that I wrote working very hard to say, you know, futility, and by the way, isn't this kind of exhaustion simply a ripeness rule, not procedural bar? Because when we talk about exhaustion in the habeas context, sometimes we mean ripeness, not procedural bar. So is this a ripeness, not a procedural bar? All right, Nancy, it was a little bit of a stretch, possibly. But I thought it was uh, not crazy. And the court, um, I, I did have this one very proud moment where Justice Breyer asked the question, weaving around my brief, saying, isn't it like this? But I didn't get almost any, any traction. And the court has been really clear. Like, this is not, this is not administrative law. This is Congress intended this, they say. I don't actually think you can really tell much about what Congress intended in the PLRA. It has a very minimal. Um, it's got very, very few words, and it's got a very minimal um, uh, legislative history, and most of the legislative history is actually about um, the injunctive parts of the statute, not about the parts that govern damage actions. So, so I don't know how you know what Congress intended, except that they intended to put the kibosh on prisoner cases. And so if you think, well, that's what they meant to do, well, yeah, then it's got to be a procedural bar. And so that's pretty much what they've said. Um, so I think that, they, that the Supreme Court has fairly definitively rejected the idea of the sort of um, cross-fertilization that you're talking about. That said, you know, it's a very textualist court right now. Um, and that has led to what is, you know, been a fairly positive change in jurisprudence along the PLRA. Um, the courts of appeals were split about this idea of availability as a limit to the exhaustion requirement. And the Supreme Court, you know, read it and said, well, but it says it has to be available. And so, no, we're not going to do futility and we're not going to do brightness and we're not going to do um, latches and we're not going to do, I don't know, you name it, like whatever you want is either equitable or administrative law principles. We're not doing any of those, but it says availability right here. That's the one we're going to do. So I would say that the ad law, case law that you're talking about um, is of a piece with Ross versus Blake, which has been the only kind of positive um, change in the jurisprudence of exhaustion since the statute was written in 1996. OK. Um... In order to keep us on time, uh, even though that was a really dry technical point, I apologize for closing <laughs> on, on that, but I think to keep us on time, uh, we should thank our panelists for a really terrific discussion. <laughs> we will reconvene uh, at 10.30 in 15 minutes from now and, and uh, look forward to the next session. Uh, folks who are logged in online. Oh.
Hey. Folks who are logged in online uh, who wish to stay on for additional panels, please do go ahead and stay logged in during this break and then just come rejoin us uh, once we start again. Thanks.
Uh, sorry. Welcome back, uh, everyone, to the. One, one second. I'm sorry. sorry. That was us. <laughs> Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this Recording in progress. We're looking forward to this panel. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Benza, and he will lead a panel on a practitioner's perspective on these two statutes. Professor Benza, thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Benza. I'm on the faculty here at the law school. Uh, my role here at the school is to teach anything dealing with death, murder, and mayhem. So crim law, criminal procedure, federal courts, uh, death penalty, I run our death penalty lab, uh, and whatever else the deans tell me that I'm supposed to be teaching and doing here. Uh, I'm really excited for this panel to uh, come and talk as a collective um, with experience from both the prosecutorial side and the defense side about the real world applications of litigating, um, client, litigating cases and dealing with clients under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act as well as under the Prison Litigation Reform Act. And I'm really happy to have uh, two really um, great experienced litigators. Uh, here with me is Dennis Therese. Uh, Dennis is on our adjunct faculty here at the law school. He teaches uh, in the areas of criminal ta uh, trial tactics and trial procedure issues. Uh, but he is most famous, or infamous, depending on your point of view, uh, is serving as the federal public defender for the Northern District of Ohio and uh, then at one point actually becoming the federal public defender for the Southern District. So he wore two hats at the same time. I had no idea how he managed to accomplish that. Uh, prior to coming to the federal defender's office, Dennis worked at Squire Sanders and Dempsey, now Squire Patton Boggs. The change in name was not his fault. Um, and now currently he's serving as law clerk to Magistrate Judge William Bachman Jr. here in Cleveland. So Dennis, welcome. And then also on our panel is Duncan Brown, who is an assistant United States attorney here in the uh, Northern District of Ohio. He's currently assigned to the National Security and Cyber Unit and is the International Affairs Coordinator. Um, he will help you understand how that relates to Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act and the PLRA as we go along. Um, he also serves on the National Working Group for the Department of Justice's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section. Uh, as, in, as the Assistant United States Attorney, he has successfully prosecuted the Romanian cyber criminals um, who <laughs> built the world of over $40 million. Uh, he was also the lead prosecutor, I believe, in the Route 82 Macedonia Bridge attempted bombing case um, and litigated that um, when a group of men plotted to blow up the bridge down in the National Forest or the National Park. From 2002 to 2006, Duncan was an assistant district attorney in the Richmond County District Attorney's Office in New York City. He practiced in the Appeals Bureau as well as the Sex Crime and Special Victims Bureau. So if you've ever seen SVU, this is the prosecutor of the of this season. All right. He's also part of the trial team that successfully prosecuted a 20-year-old kidnapping and murder case um, involving a notorious serial killer. If you want to know about that, see him at the break. Right. Um, also, Duncan is a graduate of this university, but I don't believe you took my class. I did not. You did not. We'll we have to rectify that. So he also <laughs> holds his uh, bachelor's degree in history from the University of Chicago, um, awarded the highest college and departmental honors in 1997. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over. What we are going to do this morning is each of our panelists is going to make a brief presentation and discussion about the issues of the anti-terrorism bill and the PLRA. And then we are going to have much more of an interactive discussion between the audience um, virtually and live uh, and the panel. All right? Okay, so Dennis, I'll turn it over to you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, both those who are in the room and also those who are on the screen, 
Um, let me add to that introduction in saying you have both sides of the V right in front of you, <laughs> the prosecution side and the defense side. However, I need you to start thinking in a different paradigm as this conversation continues, because in PLR litigation and EDPA litigation, I'm the plaintiff. The defense side, remember, the defendant becomes the plaintiff in the civil case. It becomes now a civil litigation. And the government, whether it's the state or the federal government, is the defendant. That has significance as we talk about this, because now burden just shifted to my side of the table. And that's pretty big if you were into persuasion, burdens of persuasion, burdens of proof. But more importantly, practically, that means the world. So I'm going to start out with our slides here. And if they could share, we have a couple concepts that we want to share with you all as we go along this morning, and then we're gonna get into some discussion about them as examples, real life examples. So we're gonna take this little bit out of the theory and move to the more practical. Our audience is very eclectic. We have federal judges on both levels, district and appellate court. We have students starting in third years, ready to go. We have people who've worked in law firms already, and people who've worked in government, and we have faculty member who work with this stuff every day. A real big mix, and I want to play on that a little bit because each of the players here has a different role, and I might even add a different perspective. But because we're at a law school, my position particularly, and because I'm also an adjunct here, is to push the students into this area. For every law student in the country who ignores this area, it's to your peril, I believe. I didn't have to get into this area, and I did voluntarily, and I can tell you right off the bat, it's been a pleasure to do it. It's a very challenging area. Um, Professor Benza says death, murder, and mayhem is a specialty. Um, yeah, in a way, that's true um, for death penalty lawyers, but in EDPA, it's relief, reform, and perhaps even regeneration of the system. So for those who want to talk about criminal justice reform, including prison free reform, here you're in the eye of the storm. So let's start out, EDPA. True story, when I was a defender, we interviewed someone for our capital habeas unit, I created the unit. So government, how you create a unit. The government needs you need money from the federal government, your taxpayers, and thanks to the support of the Sixth Circuit, we were able to get the unit forward. They uh, uh, allocate money to pay for space, for offices, for employees, for lawyers, for investigators, so you have to get budget. When you get a budget, that's it. You set up the place, and then you start interviewing for lawyers and paralegals and investigators. True story. Do not let this happen to you if you're in this area. First question on the box, what do you think of EDPA? And I'm not making this up. Candidate said, what's that? Do not let that happen to you, everyone. But let me add to the government's alphabet soup, EDPA. Right there, it says something really weird. What we just heard from Professor Benza, the anti-death penalty, what's that about? And terrorism, how does that get mixed in? Wait, that doesn't make quite good sense to me. And as that goes along, it's, there's a word of like reform in there, right? So we wonder like, wait, does that mean every terrorism case is a death penalty case? And wait, does that mean every death penalty case is an EDPA case? Beg to differ on that. And I think the more interesting ones are not death penalty at all. So again, for those in the audience listening attentively, I want to shift the paradigm. This is not about death penalty only, everyone. And death penalty is very unique, but not this time. It's also every person who's in prison gets the basic benefits of the anti-death penalty, and anti-terrorism and effective death penalty act. Everyone, pretty cool especially if you're into prison reform. I say that cool, kind of, kind of light loosely. Hey, that's for the guy who's in the gal who's in there for one year and thinks there's something wrong with the prison system or their sentence. They get the relief of this long acronym, Anti-Death Penalty, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. They're not a death penalty case and they're not a terrorist. Who are they accused of that? So bear in mind, beneath this is a huge area. So, bottom line, first bullet, way too complicated. Why? Because everyone who litigates in EDPA as plaintiff starts out, unless you're in the death penalty area, without a lawyer. So we're going to have a few examples of EDPA's language. I dare you to understand that at the first read. I dare you. 
read them out loud. I have done that many a time, literally out loud. What the heck was Congress trying to get at? So imagine today if EDPA went through Congress. Imagine the, the mishmash that you'd get if you had congressional members on the House and the side, both parties in middle in the road, discussing death penalty, terrorism, and prison reform. You get a mishmash, and that's what we got. Way too complicated. So the second bullet, keep this in mind. It's an umbrella for a vast number of remedies. Everything from, and I could speak from experience because I've seen it come through now as a law clerk to a magistrate, judge in, in Northern District of Ohio here, everything from you served me contaminated food to the judge who was sentenced me was completely wrong on a constitutional basis and the Supreme Court said so. Change. Everything from that, I didn't get enough toilet paper. There's not enough toilet paper in our cells to the Supreme Court's wrong. Pretty big, pretty big. So it's a big umbrella, everyone. Third, complexity has resulted in way too much of a drain on resources. For the judges in the room, this is not a slight at all on the judiciary, please understand. And for every law clerk, this is not a slight on you. And what I say, by the way, is a disclaimer. I don't speak on behalf of the Northern District of Ohio at all or my judge. This is personal. And from experience, every law clerk gets zapped with habeas cases. Everyone. Court of Appeals, District Court. I haven't got head nods in the room, everyone, for those on the screen. The head nods address a reality. Habeas cases, we have an example, are huge. I have an example in these slides of a record of a state case they want the judge to read, and guess who gets to read it first off? The law clerk. It's 2,200 pages long. Now, guess what? Clerkships are usually about a year, maybe two. Judges don't have time to read 2,200 pages for one case when they got five new cases that week alone. Guess what happens? Gets pushed aside, law clerk gets it. But the year passes, right? They go on to other things that here, you take it. Now into year two, and year three, and year four. So the complexity has resulted in a drain of resources because we're not handling these things very particularly well. Long delays. Oh, if I could have a magic wand and say, boom, all of a sudden all the habeas cases are addressed, even those with minor clear cut issues. I'd be a magician and I'd have a job for life in the law, in the court. But it doesn't happen because the statute is so complicated and there's so many hurdles to get to. We want to talk about that. <coughs> Second to last point, this is a specialty like no other. And I'm now talking from experience. When I created the death penalty, the number of people I represented on death row was zero. The times I was on death row, zero. The times I ever did a habeas case or a capital case, zero. And here I had the, the guts or the stupidity to say, hey, I want a whole unit on that. There was a reason for that. We as the Defender Office needed, and in this district, needed the resources of the federal government to represent, help represent these people. Because this is a specialty like the one I always referred to. If we were all med school down the road in the campus, and this was a class in cardiology, you'd be nuts if you were set to say you're a neurosurgeon. You'd be nuts. And we all know that. That's how different capital and non-capital post-conviction work is. It is that unique of a specialty. So bear that in mind. And yet we expect judges to know both know cardiology and neurology. It's crazy. We also, by the way, expect lawyers who get appointed in these cases to know that along long lines of dermatology, if you will. It would never happen in med school. It happens in law all the time, every day across the country. The last bullet point is the one I want to focus on is students. Pay attention, everyone. <laughs> you want prison reform, and I realize 21st century and the pandemic has refocused us on criminal justice reform. <coughs> Take point, the last bullet to heart. There are people right now sitting in state and federal prisons who need your help. Immediately, not tomorrow, not yesterday, now. There are people who have legitimate beefs. If you don't think so, we have an example of this, ask yourself, 
why just this week a federal district judge appointed for life in the District of Columbia who has in front of him a number of capital rioter cases from January 6th tells the U.S. Marshals in the District of Columbia, hey, this person who I just detained, who in public view of the world violated the pristine nature of our Capitol building, is getting a raw deal in jail, and I'm thinking of releasing him because the conditions are so poor. Think of what that judge must have been thinking, but flip it around. Think of what prompted that judge to say to one of the Patriot Boys, you know, you got a point. As much as I might dislike this case, and your case particularly, and you and your philosophy, I'm thinking of letting you go because the prison reform is needed that badly. So bear in mind point number, uh, the last bullet point there, especially the students. Everybody needs your help. I'm not going to go into this slide very much. These are some of the solutions, but you're going to hear, of course, this discussion. I need lawyers, man. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. I have huge faith in this profession. I have been in it since 1985 when I graduated from law school. This is an amazingly, let me repeat this for students who are already getting disgruntled, who might be two L's, one L's, or three L's, thinking, God, I don't know if I got into the right profession. This is an amazingly large umbrella. It covers everything from a slip and fall to a murder mayhem <laughs> case. If you don't like the part of the umbrella you're in, change, but don't leave the umbrella. We need your help, we need your smarts, we need your talent. EDPA doesn't give lawyers for free, usually. Most of the people in front of my, who appear in front of my judge go unrepresented throughout the case. Unless you're a capital case where you're guaranteed two lawyers, how is that I could get life and not have what a guy who got death gets? Bender? No. Have to ask for it. I'll show you the restrictions. How often have we granted appellate, or excuse me, how often have we granted appointed counsel to a habeas case that's not capital? Count them. I've been in this job since September 19, 2019. One time. One time have we appointed counsel for someone who is not on a death case. I was law clerk from 1985 to 86 to the chief judge. Guess how many times we appointed then? Zero. Now that's all prior to all this stuff, but still, none of these people have lawyers. So remember that for the lawsuits, you want a, a rich area where you need it. Reform how lawyers get appointed for capital cases and non-capital cases in post-conviction world. PLRA, and then I'm going to turn to let, let Duncan take over. Problems with the Prison Litigation Reform Act. Um, I'm going to sound a bit of like a broken record. PLRA is a lot shorter, but... I ask you, and we have an example, we have the slide up here, you're going to be able to read the statute that allows for attorney reimbursement. Um, I, I might sound like a penny pincher, like, I don't want to pay. No, because I'm going to flip it. If someone said to you, hey, um, we're going to give you this really cool case, and it's going to knock the socks off you. It is Sony. It has a couple of cool issues of discovery, and the trial judge was drunk on the bench, and I got all these cool hellacious facts, right? Salacious facts. I got all this really neat stuff. It's going to take you a long time, maybe like nine, ten months. It might go into over a year, but you're cool with that. Oh, yeah, I have no problem with that. Oh, and by the way, you don't get an expert uh, help to investigate or paralegal. Oh, no, I can handle it on my own. I got a big ego. I'm cool. Oh, forgot to mention one thing. We're not going to pay you. I've tried to twist arms of lawyers to take on cases pro bono because the federal district court has a pro bono case. You don't get paid, you get some expenses, that's it. It is like telling someone, I'm gonna give you a root canal without anesthesia. They have big hearts, these people. One person put it perfectly well, I got one case, that's all I have time for. I approached a legal clinic and said, if we took on that case, it would take us over two years and we can't because we've read cycle students through it and it would absorb every resource we have. How is that fair? And yet Congress decided to use paragraphs to how explain lawyers get reimbursed. In PLA, if you just get an injunctive relief or some policy change, guess what? You get a buck and a half. A lawyer's going to take a case on for like unless they really need the, PA, the, the pro bono credit. And go, guess what? The Ohio Supreme Court has about a limit of five hours, I think it is. Got a real mismatch, everyone. And I have huge faith in this profession to correct that mismatch. I really mean that. It's up to the younger lawyers who really want cause. 
here's your cause. Make this law school and every law student who came out of it, and every other law school in the country, valuable in the eyes of Congress because you see a lot of need for reform. So there's the problem. And I'll, let me focus on the last book. <coughs> Defender Program is a great program. I'm very proud of what we achieved. I'm very proud of my colleagues and all the colleagues who came before me in post. It's about a billion dollars. Taxpayers spent about a billion dollars on two things, the Federal Defender Program across the country and all the appointed lawyers who get other civil cases or other criminal cases, excuse me, not post-conviction cases because they still need lawyers for those because they're conflicted out. So a billion dollars, it's really well worth it. The cost, the return versus the cost, pittance. I worked the numbers once. It's incredibly good investment for the government to do this program. Yet, defender offices do not get prison reform cases. They get individual, indefen individual defendant cases. That's what they're required to get. That's what the statute says. So they can't do prison reform cases. That is great wealth of knowledge and expertise. And you think, God, go, just give it to the defender office. Mm -mm. No, it doesn't work that way. We tried. I tried to reach out for a few things that were kind of out of the strictures of the statute, not permitted. So bear that in mind if you should be working for a defender office. They're great opportunities, but this is not where you get to go. And here's some solving the problems. And you'll see, I don't know if I can read the slides, and I'll turn over to Duncan here. Two things I want to highlight. We got to reform how we reimburse lawyers on this statute. You reform that one little aspect, and I promise you, lawyers' creativity will reform the system. I say promise boldly, because I've seen it play out. You may be interested to see some of the creativity of lawyers whose backs are totally against the wall when he or she appears in front of that screen in that courtroom. Man, they do get the job done. It doesn't mean everyone does. Don't get me wrong. But 90%, 95% really put their heart in the work. And they're, they're getting paid sometimes very little on appointed cases. Right now, the going rate is $155 an hour, but it's subject to getting caught. You submit vouchers at the end of the case. You get paid at the end. You put the work in, some of the judges say, yeah, we'll put too much work in there. We'll cut it. The bottom line is it's a great opportunity because you get paid. Nothing's like that in the PLRA. You can a little bit. We're going to talk about that. But I just want to highlight, for, again, for the young lawyers and law students, ah, you, want to, you want criminal justice reform? You're going home for the holidays and get cocktail discussion. Hey, what do you think about this case? Everybody's asking about it. What do you think about this case going on in Washington? Tell them, I'm interested. I've been intrigued. I found out that there's an entire world that needs reform, and I could do it as a lawyer with the JD after my name. It should be an enticement to everyone. I really do mean that. So those are my thoughts. We've got some examples. I'm going to turn it over to the other side. But remember, when Duncan talks, like I, two hats, everyone. Normally, his day job, he's the prosecutor in front of, who appears in front of the judge I work with. But part of the work of his office is to be the defense as well in these prison litigation reform cases in EDPA. So he takes on a different cap as well. So what was true for me Defendant, now plaintiff, is true for Duncan. Plaintiff, now defendant. Duncan? Thank you very much. And I have to say, Dennis, in your analogy, <clears throat> you're the neurosurgeons. I'm like a chiropractor, maybe in a van. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, filling up on gas. Um, so what's very interesting, and Dennis and I have worked together for a very long time, um, and I think Maui was, was one of our first cases, which was a terrorism case. Of What's really very interesting in terms of the hats um, and what, how, how I approach this, because my, my background was I, when I was a case, I was a summer intern for Judge Nugent. And then I, when I went to Staten Island, uh, they put me in appeals because of that. And, and the, mo the most important takeaway, too, I, I think, at least from my point of view, is when, when you're starting out, you never say no because you don't know where it's going to lead. Um, I Judge Nugent, we were in the old courthouse. The summer interns were in a closet, literally in a closet. We had one desk. We had to sit on other sides. And he, he did. I have Dennis describe the 2,200 pages of I, And Judge Nugent, if you know him, he took great joy in just wheeling dollies of, of transcripts in. And not, not like Judge Oliver, who... Yeah, you've got windows in your closet, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, but but you, you don't say no, and because of that, I was able to you know skip criminal court in New York City, you know, which is midnight writing up complaints, and go right into appeals. And because of what I did with Judge Nugent, they gave me 2241s, which are the the state uh, habeas appeals that go into the federal court that we had to argue, and then also occasionally um, we worked with uh, with the Eastern District on 2255s. It's a field that either in defense or certainly in prosecution, nobody's going to volunteer for, but um, you get amazing access uh, and you get amazing experience immediately by just not saying no. Uh, and you also, I think, starting the fields, working for a judge, uh, those sorts of things, you learn the law uh, better than if you just go in and start, start working. Um, it gives you a different perspective. It gives you a different respect for what you have to do and what's expected of you as an attorney. And because of that, um, I do like the idea of us talking about sort of the two hats. But what, what my perspective is, maybe it's because of the background, but when I'm defending a 2255, uh, when I approach that, it's not I'm, I'm making sure I keep my conviction because the nature of the 2255, you know, that's, that's much more of a direct appeal attitude, frankly. Um, but with the 2255, it is about the process. Because one of the confusions and one of the hurdles and one of the reasons why we need defense attorneys working on these matters is because the 2255, or the, it goes triple for the 2241, is about the procedure first and foremost. I mean, before you even get to the merits, there are exhaustion and just how you plead your, your complaint. It is... A, a real term of art. I mean, and, and it does come from the death penalty world. The phrase is always death is different. And uh, because of that, uh, AEDPA is very, very different. And I will pronounce it AEDPA because as a Fed, I do love the acronyms. I have to <laughs> give each letter its due. Um, but it's different. And the idea of protecting the process and protecting the record um, is what my duty is. Um, it's not to change the record. It's not to justify the record is to make sure that process and that record is correct. Um, and and you know, Dennis and I were talking before, and Dennis and I talk a lot, but we were talking before and about this. This is, I, mean, it, I, I think this is the, the razor's edge of where constitutional law really is practically applied. Uh, it, it's where I think when we're talking about criminal justice reform, this is the starting point. Uh, ADPA is the starting point because it is allowing you to look at the process holistically and how did the Constitution get applied correctly or incorrectly, and if incorrectly, how do we remedy that? Because that is another problem. ADPA takes a million and a half years to get through the system, even with exhaustion, even with sort of procedural defaults. So, and again, triple it if you're doing a state, now you're looking at a transcript that is 10 years old. 15 years old. And then when you get to the merits, because of the, the, the length of time that's passed, there are not only legal nuances, but there are very severe factual nuances that you, you can't just dismiss because you didn't count 360 days from the, the denial of the cert uh, in the Supreme Court. Um, so, so this really is the place where you can look at the system and look at the process and really see how it works. I mean, I, in, in defending, you know, the 2255, when they come to me, I'm defending the, the warden, right? I mean, it's Eric, whoever, I, I forget, there was one guy who was always getting them. Um, you know, I don't have that relationship. What I normally do is, or not normally, but on occasion, I will talk to the defense attorneys. Sometimes they have to file affidavits. I mean, it, so it, it is very much, looking at the process, um, which is exciting, um, because that is where, like Dennis said, the, the real reform can happen uh, when, you're, when you're looking at backwards, how did we get here? So I, with that, I, I don't want to ramble on, I could ramble on, um, but I don't, uh, because this is a terrifying class, by the way. I mean, if I was a professor, I... <laughs> terrifying students. Circuit court judges, district court judges, con law professors. Um, so. I'll stop, um, but I do, uh, as we proceed, I would welcome questions in the middle. Uh, you can always interrupt me, um, and, and I'd, I'd rather get a question while it's fresh in your head um, than wait till the end. And it allows us to keep our masks off a little bit. Right.
It did it for the people on the screen. It seems weird. Raise your hand. Feel free to please, because the questions are more important than what we have to add. In. So we will open up for the, the floor and the virtual world for a discussion point. Just a sort of point of information, you'll hear certain terms, 2254, 2255. Um, the impact of the anti-terrorism bill is a little different between those 2254 petitions are state inmates challenging in federal court the constitutionality of their state court conviction or sentence, whereas 2255 is federal prisoners challenging through a post-conviction mechanism the same issues, but there is a different impact of the anti-terrorism bill depending on which jurisdiction uh, issued the conviction and, and the sentence, depending on how the defendant is challenging. Um, so I'll, I'll kick things off. Um, one of the questions in terms of the anti-terrorism bill is what has been the biggest impact in your litigation of these cases since the passage of the anti-terrorism bill? And that good or bad impact, how has that changed how you approach the litigation? Um, really, um, I mean, first of all, I've gotten very good at counting days because no matter what you do, and, and I think Dennis, you have a slide on this. I mean, in Staten Island, the federal system, it's all you know, the exhaustion is geared towards calendar days, so you got to be really good about that. Um, but seriously, what what it does is it really makes you think about the record. It makes you think about what you're doing leading up to trial, how you're interacting with defense attorneys, how you're handling discovery, how you're handling and presenting the case both pre-trial and at trial. Because, and my father is a judge and he's drilled it into me, the most important thing in, in a trial is preserving the record and presenting a good record. So it's, I mean, from the little things, writing, writing briefs and um, trying to get those as right as possible and as fulsome as possible so there's a record pre-trial to making sure that, you know, my discovery obligations with Dennis's office were not only in writing, but done timely. And I knew what has also happened is, especially in the cyber world and the terrorism world, um, I have a completely different approach than I used to at the state court, which was, here's your stuff, go to it, you know, here are your reports. But now it's a much more collaborative, walking you through the, the, uh, the evidence and the discovery. I mean, I, I tell most attorneys that they have access to my agents up to the line of deposing them you know, during discovery, you know, I, they, but they can, they can talk, we can meet, they can ask questions about what they're looking at. And again, a lot of it is so voluminous or so technical. If I didn't do that, it would be, even with all the resources, it, it would be patently unfair. And if that's unfair, then the entire proceeding is unfair. Um, so it, it really has changed me in terms of knowing that the specter of a 2255 review, five years down the road, six years down the road, by, by a pro se person who is not going to have the technical abilities or by a pro se person who is now hearing about, you know, when I started, DNA was relatively new, mRNA was brand new. I mean, it was, no, nobody knew the difference between the two. You know, so are you, go, are you gonna ask an inmate, you know, not, not a lawyer, probably not very well educated either, to you know, maybe hear through the grapevine or hear in the prison libraries about some changes and say, oh, I understand the nuances of what was happening technically or what was happening legally. Absolutely not. Um, so I need that record to sort of anticipate um, being able to go back and see what we did, why we did, when we did it, and how we did it. Unless, of course, you know, what we're talking about with the reform they do get more help to start working through those nuances. And I think, well, I'll say this later, but, but, but that, that's the biggest change. It is a holistic sort of uh, universal look at the case. We could share the slides. There's a slide of, I'll illustrate what Duncan said here. Um, with a slide, so you all wanna see, and let them, yeah, if you could set up that, there you go. So, uh, um, Ah, uh, it's not doing it for me. Help, help, help. Up there, I need it's slide like 10. It's not moved up here. There it goes. I got it. There's the statute of limitations, everyone, for EDPA. 
Uh, part two is the killer, but let's just read part one. I won't read it to y'all. Um, wow. Everyone thought just like one year, right? Dang. Imagine some guy or gal in prison who doesn't have anything in terms of a college education or law school education like you all do. And imagine someone trying to read that who can barely read. Guess who they rely on? The prison guards and fellow inmates. There's always a jailhouse lawyer. Always. So those are their sources. So true case, I'm going to now get to a real actual case here and talks with what Duncan's saying. Part two is the killer. D2. I won't read it again. You can read it up on the screen slide. Wow. That's a mess. I would love to be able to show a hand so many people really understand what that means. Um, case law says this. Start your clock. Stop your clock. Stop your clock. Stop your clock. Here's an actual exhibit, an addendum to a judicial opinion that's now out there. You get the case number from the blue line up top. It's an actual Excel spreadsheet with formulas and all just to make sure that the calculation of 365 days wasn't wrong. Because guess what? 366 days and you're out of luck. Some give and take, but not much, everyone. <laughs> so you can see this fellow from the slide is out by seven months or so. At the very end, it says that. Um, it's, it's a problem. But the fact that a lawyer and a judge needed to go to Excel to ensure themselves that they were right. The plaintiff was unrepresented and never got a lawyer in this case, by the way. Their reliance was it. Kite. So for those who are not familiar, kites, prison requests from the prisoner. It usually goes to some administrator in the prison. Kite response, you got one year. That was the response. It's a quote. You got one year. The guy writes back to the prison guard, is it starting running? He goes, yeah, it's been running. Well, that's real helpful. <laughs> that's really, really helpful. Uh, he writes to the clerk too late for his form. There's a nice form for habeas cases that you can get from the federal court and you get online. But if you don't know when the clock is running, it's kind of out of luck. Well, I just got to do it now. Well, that might be good for most, but mm, not so good for someone who might not be that diligent. We want to encourage diligence. Obviously, there's a good reason for statute of limitations. You want the case to go crazy long. But imagine this is guys. This guy was diligent. <laughs> he talked to the guard a couple times. And the guard gave him some books, and he thought the one year began to run at the very last time he filed something and got a response from the state, and guess what? He was years off. It started, Martin, as you can see. The yellow lines are the times when it was told. The statute, statute stopped. So in this guy's case, start, stop, start, stop. He had no clue that that happened. I, I really don't think so. He might have, but I, I, it didn't sound... Here's a petition, by the way, everyone. Here's a good illustration. Here's what we're talking about. They're handwritten. Here's the form. It's too small to read, probably. Um, this fellow's case is a live case, kind of interesting. Um, I won't comment on it other than to say what its basics is. It's a food tray contamination case. And it's a kind of interesting case at the very end. He kind of asks here, I want to get out immediately. Let me see the last word. I want to get sprung right now. Because I can't stand this place. It's bad. It's killing me. And my fellow inmates, we're all getting sick. Oh, and by the way, he says, the slide won't move again. Darn. There we go. Sorry, everyone. He says, um, uh, I, I want to get sprung right away. Um, oh, by the way, the... Ohio Department of Rehabilitation Corrections fined the supplier, the third party, because the food contamination was so bad in the past at other Ohio prisons. This guy's got a real beef. He really does. And the fines proved it. You'd never know that from saying in the last period, man, I want to get out immediately. By the way, here's a record. If you think Duncan and I are not... Tell them the truth. There it is, 2,200 pages on that one. Guess what? That was not a exceptional case at all. That's a run-of-the-mill one. That's a run-of-the-mill. 
Imagine you're a federal district judge or a court of appeals judge, and you only got one law clerk to rely on. You can't split it to between two people for crying out loud. You got they got other cases to work on. Imagine reading a twenty-two page, twenty-two hundred page book. That'd be even tough. But this is not a book. This handwritten notes. This is court notes. You got to follow the history. Sometimes the history's wrong. Got to put it together. It's tough. So I wanted to put that as an illustration. And and so. I would add one thing to Duncan. Professor Benz's questions right on point. How does it affect you? Wow, you start reading statutes really carefully. And you realize the words don't mean what they say. So here's our statute of limitations. If it would go back, let me go back one more. There it is. On um, that part D2, volumes of case law on what it means to have a quote properly filed brief. I mean, we could all debate that number, and guess what? Congress never did, so the courts are left with that one. So read the statutory carefully. There's two other aspects of what how it's affected me specifically. Um, how do you explain this to a client? <laughs> Remember, this is your client if you're the defense lawyer. I'm not this guy's client, by the, our lawyer, by the way. But how, if you were his lawyer, would you possibly explain? that he was seven months off. And he's gonna say, wait a minute, the prison guard told me I had a whole year. And he told me that in January, true, and I filed in October, November, true, 12 months, December, not true. How do you explain to him that that's how the statute really functions? Clients also are death row inmates. I did this test for students Perhaps unfairly, when I would give a criminal pretrial practice course, um, you know, I'm going to use a tough analogy and take to heart. No one knows the right answer. Oh, it's one thing you go to law school and you say goodbye to your family, friends. Yeah, I'll be seeing you on the holidays, you know, split in August, September. You come back, you've done third years. You're going to graduate in a couple months. You're going to say, yeah, I'll see you around. I hope to see you around. Yeah, we're going to get reunions for Facebook, whatever. What do you say to a client? who's lost all their appeals. You go visit them on Monday and Thursday, you know they will be executed unless the Supreme Court intervenes. What do you say as your final word? It seems almost trite to say, have a good day. <laughs> say goodbye. What do you say to that client? So the second thing I, I pose as a the answer to Professor Benz's question, Man, everyone, it really challenges your lawyer-client relationship, amazingly so. Um, the third thing, um, it makes you realize that some prison guards have a big heart. I know that sounds really strange when we're talking about prison reform, and I just illustrated it by way of a federal judge being outraged at how bad the D.C. prisons were in jails. There were guards who recognized that they were working under very difficult conditions. There's a guy right now in Youngstown, he deserves every bit of praise. He works the monitor for the Zoom. He bends over backwards to make sure someone gets to see their lawyer. It's amazing, everyone knows him. It's, the guy deserves a halo. There were a couple guys on death row who let us sneak in cameras. I shouldn't say this too long. Let us sneak in cameras because why the inmate who was going to be executed wanted a picture of his daughter with him holding, hugging, and they can because they get print person contacts of death row right before they get executed. Um, guard didn't care. He took the picture. <laughs> he took the picture. Um, so don't mix up. Don't toss the baby out with the bathwater. I guess the easiest way to say it. There are some. Prison guards and staff wardens who really realize they have a tough, tough, tough job, and they try to do it better every day. So if your prosecutor and say Duncan mentioned calls the prosecutor warden sometimes, that means wardens really want to do the right thing. Don't forget that everyone; they really do. So those Other are the things. We, I've absolutely had cases with Dennis's of office where we've had trouble getting discovery into CCA, and we've called. Because it's not about hiding the ball and keeping the ball from the bad guy. It's big cases. They're complicated cases. The attorney needs to talk to the client. The client needs to be prepared to talk to the defense attorney. 
if we don't do that, we're 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 not winning uh, because a that's going to be coming back on appeal immediately um, because they'll they'll have it done. But also, it's it's just not fair. And I mean, it, it might sound silly or it might sound trout or trite or simple uh, of me, but I mean, I represent the United States of America, right? And that's not. FBI, that's not, you know, whatever other agency I might work with, I represent the United States of America. I mean, when I was in New York, I stood up and I said, I represent the people of the state of New York. And that is a duty that I have on my shoulders to do it right every day, every time I do something on behalf of the United States. It's the people of the United States, it's the Constitution of the United States, and if I'm going to prosecute somebody, if I'm going to send somebody away for all those years, even six months to, to life, I've got to get that right because you know that's not a monetary claim. That's not a you know, you know, something like that. I mean, that's somebody's liberty. And if I'm going to do that, and I'm going to advocate for that in front of a judge, I have to say I'm advocating for that because it's the right thing and it was done the right way. And if I can't say that because I want to, you know, play around with can a, you know can a laptop get into to CC? I think we were loading files on an iPod because it was easier to to view. I mean. It's, it's the duty that we have. So it's it's not, and the courtroom is adversarial and it's a great system. I know the courtroom has to be an adversarial proceeding, no doubt about that, but the professional work we do is not adversarial because we're working towards the same thing. It's from a different perspective, but it's protecting the process, protecting the access to the process that everybody has to make sure that the next person has the same access and the same protections under that system. Uh, each and every time. Any questions? Ben? Stop the share, by the way, on the screen. So this is an online question from Vicky Wernick. Um, the question is, what about equitable tolling and how that impacts the SOL, especially for pro se litigants? So the issue of uh, the statute of limitations, the SOL, is a one-year statute of limitations. As Dennis pointed out, it has multiple ways in which it starts, um, multiple ways in which you can stop it. Um, actually, I teach a prisoner's rights class uh, on occasion, and one of the first exercises is I give the students the form from the Northern District of Ohio um, with the Ohio case. And they have to actually fill out the form. And if I have a class of 25, I usually end up with about 32 different statute of limitation calculations. So how does equitable tolling play into that issue? In, in both from the government side, do you join in issues of equitable tolling? How do you decide whether to join or oppose a request for equitable tolling? And then from the defense side, um, what are your arguments for tolling? Okay, um, so I, I had an equitable tolling issue once, and I, I can't remember if it was Staten Island or, or here, where the guy had kept you know, all 2,200 pages of his transcript in a, in a duffel bag, and he started getting moved around from prison to prison. And the movement from prison to prison usually is equitably tolled. So you had to go and recreate um, prison transfer records, which are spotty fast, but they kept losing his bag. So on one hand, you know, all, all of the, the case law says, you know, baggage is baggage, whatever, but that had all of his documents. So he couldn't, in that period of time, actually make a claim. So, so, so how I approach it is twofold. One, it's an issue where if you sort of let everything just go, you respond to everything, and you, you hew as close to the case law as possible. Because it's not going to be my decision. It's going to be the judge's decision. So I see it as I set forth what the law is. I set forth what my calculations are and where, where I see where it falls. I also, though, don't rely on, and this is something I learned very young in New York, you don't rely on equitable tolling. You don't rely on the statute of limitations as your response. And if you're doing so, that's, you're, not, you're not really responding properly. So you, you set forth the argument. You set forth the, 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 sort of the case law interpretation. But you always address everything on the merits. So you know. So you always say, and assuming the, the statute of limitations hasn't run, and there is equitable tolling, 
because the equitable tolling, from our point of view, is going to be something that's very fact specific. Um, so, you know, there, there are no go by. So I've never seen a good go by in a 2255 because you have to recreate everything each and every time, and that's that's part of the reason. Um, my perspective is you just do the sort of the dispassionate calculation, and then you go on to the merits. Um, so the judge can decide the procedural equitable uh, role or equitable merits, and then he's still left with the ability, or she's still left with the ability to review the merits of the case. Attorney Wernicke's question is a very tough one to answer, um, in part because of what Professor Benz just said and also what Duncan Brown just said. Um, at the end of the day, let's assume one year's run. The plaintiff can say, you know, there's this equitable tolling. Um, it's kind of a last ditch, by the way. Um, so how do we respond when we were representing folks in this regard? The lawyers in the room and the law students in the room have one thing hugely in common. I would bet dollars to donuts that you all put at some point in your law school applications, I'm a creative thinker, I create a writer, I'm creative. If there were ever a point where creativity were needed, here it is. Equitable tolling is what it sounds like. And courts have decided, well, we don't, shh, we're not, not in the statute, by the way. We don't know what it sounds like, but we know that there must be such egregious cases out there that it would be really unfair for that SOL with the statute of limitations to run on this poor person. How about the pandemic, everyone, when they shut down Ohio's prison libraries and couldn't move? What do you think? Equitable tolling? Oh, sure. Some of this is their time between March 2020 and now. Learn that the prison system had built in an arrangement where in your lockdown cell you can ask for a book, and the book that the guy asks for, of course, guess what? habeas law, and the law book gets to him. Oh, and by the way, the guard says, you know, you're not getting the second book that you wanted for because we accused you of stealing it. We found it in another inmate cell and you weren't supposed to share it. How about that one? I don't know, equitable tolling. So think creatively. For those lawyers who put that on their application, law students who think, yeah, I'm a creative writer, find creative ways to work this. Judges do. It's not in the statute. You won't find equitable tolling in EDPA. So figure it out. What, put those creative juices to work and find ways that make sense. Duncan said fact specific. Darn right. Pandemic. Wow. Huge set of facts. Mostly unsuccessful in my idea, but still valuable. How about I'm schizophrenic? True story. I'm schizophrenic. I missed my meds and I was in lockup when the statute ran. Equitable? I don't know. What about the nine months before the lockup? I don't know the answer to those questions, but I could assure you that the creative lawyer took advantage of those facts. But remember, most plaintiffs at that point especially are uncounseled. That means they're relying on the jailhouse lawyers, the prison guards. So that's, that's where I come on. This is a question from an anonymous attendee, and the question is, do you see a difference in application of the EDPA for capital and non-capital cases? Hi, I'll start out with that one real quickly. If we could share screens, I want to share one thing with you. Um, and I'm going to quickly flip to us, if you could set up the slides show and I'll. So, slide nine. Here's the statute for appointment of counsel for capital cases. So right there, that's the first zinger. Not only does EDPA give the lawyer, excuse me, not only does EDPA give the defendant who's on death row one lawyer, but usually two. You get learned counsel, someone to advise. So you get two lawyers, and they stick with the person so that the first thing is they're counseled. Oh, that's huge, everyone. Ask or check into, Ohio is a huge lethal injection litigation. Go to the Southern District's website. You can get access to ECF, the, the electronic court filing system. Just, or go Google. Southern District lethal injection litigation. And pull up a brief. There's a magistrate judge down there who's handling most of these cases. A lot of them have gone, gone through the district court and the Sixth Circuit. Check those out. 
and ask yourself, dang, I mean, could the clinic here times 10 produce all that work? It's a huge amount of work. They got experts around the country. They got lawyers advising because the lawyer got appointed on the case. Happened to be one of the death penalty unit lawyers in the Southern District of Ohio's defender office. Remember, death penalty, capital habeas units, habeas, that's the one exception, not prison reform, ZEDPA. Huge. Check those pleadings out versus a pro se litigant. I mean, I wanted to show you. Check it out. The difference is massive. Second, and I, I'll end, answer, end the question, answer with this. A rapport with the judge. Let's go to judges who don't get a steady diet of neurology. They might be cardiologists by day. They might be general practitioners by day. But at night, they're forced to suck in all the knowledge of lethal injection litigation. Well, guess what? You know, we're as judge here. Let me focus you on this one point of dispute. And by the way, the Supreme Court came out with this little nuance, and Judge Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's opinion has a little term of phrase, and that's what we're relying on. And you can't do that without a lawyer. I don't care how sophisticated the defendant is. So that's the other thing. The, the challenge, most cases are not death penalty cases. Let me just show you another slide just to illustrate the point. There's our executions and prosecutions of death penalty cases in the country dropping really, really, really fast. That means most of these cases that have tough issues are not non capital, which are non capital, which means they don't have lawyers. Yeah, I think um, the major difference between in, in habeas litigation between represented between capital cases and non capital is the front end before it ever gets to federal court. Um, in most states, there's some Alabama uh, notoriously does not, uh, Texas now recently started doing it, providing lawyers for state death row inmates in state post conviction process. Ohio was one of the states that from the very beginning, Every person on death row had lawyers from trial through all aspects of state court litigation. So you had issues preserved, you had objections made, you had lawyers working those cases, sometimes not so effectively, but at least they had lawyers. In the non-capital arena, defendants get a lawyer, one lawyer at trial, no matter how serious the case is. Uh, you get convicted, you get one lawyer to do your first direct appeal to the state court of appeals and then you will never see another lawyer. So when it gets to federal court, there is usually already fatal flaws in the entire process that will bar the inmate, no matter how meritorious the claims may be, from ever getting to a merits decision. Uh, inmates have lost their statute of limitations because for some unknown reason, some lawyers will not send their client the opinion from the state court of appeals saying you lose. So the inmate does not know to file because the court does not pay the counsel to file a discretionary appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court. So the lawyer's not going to do that. They haven't sent the client the opinion. So the client misses the appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court, misses their circuitude. They may not know at all until way past statute of limitations have, have expired. Um, I occasionally will get a call from the appointment clerk asking if I would take a non-capital case and because I like to keep the clerks happy, I occasionally say yes. Um, you know, and he'll tell me, this case has got these problems. It's like, well, I, there's nothing I can do. It, it's a straight statute of limitations problem. There's, there's no defense to the statute of limitations because he's clearly filed, he's clearly blown it. So I call the clerk back and say, you know, I, I can't take, I can't in good faith take this appeal. Uh, I think that's the, the major difference. Um, between non-capital and capital is the access to pre-habeas counsel to make sure habeas counsel has even a hope of doing anything. Um, that's, that's huge. I would agree. My, my experience has been in New York State. They will uh, farm out uh, parts of habeas and death appeals uh, to the various, so I had a death penalty appeal uh, from Buffalo, I think, and it was I only had two or three very uh, narrow issues about jury selection. You know, there were other prosecutors working on other parts, and they were focused, 
they were very logical and they were very easy to respond to. And, and that was you know, a raft of attorneys somewhere, maybe Buffalo or Syracuse, writing for that defendant. So it, it's just the ability to have issues presented um, that are much easier to respond to, much easier to, to review using the record um, versus a defendant who is trying to figure all that out in jail while getting moved around, while getting locked down. Um, while getting probably really shoddy advice too from the jailhouse attorney because good attorneys usually don't end up in jail. So, um, so it, it really is night and day, which is why involving counsel more is important. So you can really start identifying what the real issues are and how to address them in an appropriate manner. Let me give some, before we move on to that, there's some examples there. Let me give you another example here. Okay, so here I misspoke. The one handwritten petition was from the guy who lost the time limitations uh, it's not working there it goes all right so here's um this is an actual habeas page from a live case um this is the food case this is where the tray um appears to be contaminated and the food service that's contracted with the Ohio department of rehabilitation and correction has been fined not in this case but previously so the first thing I mentioned, difficulty to sort out relevant facts. There's a fax. It's written by some jailhouse lawyer, probably it's on a typewriter. It's not handwritten. Uh, you can see different fonts at some point. So they probably pulled out of the typewriter or the computer, whatever it was. They let them use. Um, there's cross outs, there's handwritten stuff in this one, not this page, but the other pages. Um, and you can read it. There it is. And you could read it. You can't make out really kind of what he's saying. You kind of get the feel. But in that, morass of facts is something really legitimate that people were getting sick from contaminated trays and some of them didn't do their job. Um, this is the guy's set of cause of action. By the way, there's this administrative relief. We're going to talk about you know, exhaustion. They talked about it in the prior panel. Did he exhaust? <laughs> That's what he says about it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> That's it. This is a conclusory statement. I don't know. Is that legitimate enough if you're a federal judge? Does that do it? I mean, if you're the prosecutor, does that do it? But there's his causes of action. I mean, you know, you've, you've in law school, and judges see it every day, cause of action one, underlying. I have even went to Jones Day right now, or Scarlet Patton Boggs, picking my former haunt. I mean, lawyers would never send out a complaint that doesn't have cause of action one, or count one, underlying. Maybe even the, the concept, tortious interference of contract. Or the foregoing, you know, I didn't incorporate the foregoing facts. This is, guys, this is it, everyone. It doesn't get any better sometimes, I'm telling you. In this, two federal judges have said, you know, you got one cause. It looks pretty good. Whether he wins or not, who knows, but it looks like it did already pass the motion to dismiss stage, and it got passed the report recommendation. I mean, out of this, so to Duncan's point, and to Professor Benz's point, this is the pre-habeas stuff that Professor Benz just talked about. Can you imagine a lawyer writing this instead? I saw I full faith in the law students here. Go out and reform this area. It needs desperately your help. It really does. So there's an example. Otherwise, you get that. And I pity the judges in this room and elsewhere who are forced to decipher this stuff. They shouldn't be doing that. And you'll see the last point, or the second bullet on that, it's dangerously crossing the line for a federal judge or a federal law clerk <laughs> to say, you know, I think the plaintiff's trying to say this. Wait, let me get that right. There's someone in this audience probably who's going to work at a big firm this summer. So you're going to creatively say, you know, how, how many causes of action? Oh, we've got seven good causes of action in this case. What if the federal judge said, you know, I think there's eight or nine. I think there's two more. I'm going to add them in. Jones Day, Schmoes Day. Pan Boggs, Pan Schmoggs. We don't care. I think the facts support these other two claims and say, no, oh, that's not right. But in Hades, you really come close to doing it. Wow, I can't make this out heads or tails. But, you know, I think, and remember the law says pro se litigants, pleadings get filed or read liberally. Wow, liberal reading of this sounds like tortious interference of something. 
don't know. That's bullet point too. That's a dangerous and uncomfortable bullet. Let me tell you. Um, so I throw that out just so that there's a weird balance how far you can take this mission. I should make something of it too. And not all judges are going to take that time or law clerks will take that time. Um, in a different circuit, I have a, a capital client who is incompetent and keeps filing pro se pleadings, um, which is just wonderful. Um, and we recently got an order from the Seventh Circuit that said we have absolutely no idea what this says. Um, and we direct the lawyers to do something with this. We're like, yeah, well, we don't understand it either, um, which is why a client is incompetent. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, sometimes it, it, even when you're looking to try to find out either under PLR or under EDPO, the, the, the uh, pro se litigants of what it is they're trying to say, you have to recognize who that population is. Uh, they have significant mental health problems. They have intellectual disability issues. They have just a lack of educational experiences on things. And we expect, the law expects them to be able to navigate this Byzantine creation of procedural rules um, on their own. Uh, and then we ding them when they screw it up because they couldn't figure it out. Um, you know, I'm sure the, the judges and the law clerks have seen you know, the complaints that are literally written in the purple crayon because that's all the guy gets because he can't be trusted with a pencil. Uh, so they give them a crayon to, to write because they can't hurt themselves with that. Um, and you have to decipher what it is that they say. And just because they are psychotic does not mean they don't have legitimate complaints. Um, but because of these rules, may never and usually never get hurt. So, other questions? Exactly, sure. So I have first a comment and then a question both posed by Brenda Lakella. The comment would be, so there is no misunderstanding. Ohio's lethal injection litigation is under section 1983, not the EDPA. And uh, the question uh, is, was the bad food case an EDPA case? That doesn't go to the validity of the conviction. Wouldn't that actually be a condition of confinement case? But it's a PLRA case. It's a PLRA case. Yeah. And they actually had issues. Um, there were, his was not the only case with that. Um, the international conglomerate that does the food service is also the international conglomerate that does food service for a lot of other places. Um, they were notoriously bad in poisoning, actively poisoning people. The food trays were coming with live maggots. They were not cleaning them. There was, I understand one of the pro se litigants actually filed, when he sent his things, actually sent uh, an envelope full of the maggots that he collected from his food tray uh, to the court. I imagine the clerk was not very happy to receive that. Um, but those were all PLRA cases, and a huge number of them were dismissed at the gatekeeping part of PLRA because they had not exhausted. Um, and there was not, in many of those cases, the inmates did not know of how to file for the emergency exception under PLRA to skip over the, um, the, um, the gatekeeping exhaustion requirements. So they weren't even getting to a response from the government. They were being dismissed at the initial review screening process. Um, of these cases. Um, and then it got better because this one, Mr. Young's case, uh, his was after DRC had gotten involved because DRC finally came to the awareness that this was actually happening. It was not just crazy inmates complaining. Um, and they started the process of terminating um, Aramark's um, contract because things were so bad. And yet the guys were still being dinged in federal court even when you had DRC outside of the litigation acknowledging um, that there were significant problems in the food systems. Now, could I just, in defense of gatekeeping, okay. um, yeah. because it does serve a purpose. I mean, because it does separate the, I'm not going to call them crazy inmates, but, <laughs> um, not clients, I can't. but, you know, <laughs> but, but the inmates who are just raising claims, serious claims. And I've had the 88 claims, you know, actions for, for release or causes of action and all of them are baseless. Um, but they go through the system and they have to go through the system and they have to go through the review and we have to respond to all 80 of them because that's the process and the process is right and the procedure in the system demands that. But that takes away from the 
tray which is inartfully pled or inadequately pled and you know maybe is worthy of some equitable tolling because of things. So again, the, the idea of the reform is not to throw out the, the gatekeeping functions or the statute of limitation requirements. It's how do you keep some of those efficiencies because you just absolutely have to have them or the court system will be drowned in everything, but make sure that they're not being used dismissively or just presumptively without a real analysis. And I think that's where, and I mean, brought up the, the COVID itself. I, that took <laughs> six or eight months of figuring out just all the pleadings and all the nuances in pleadings before you know, people were really comfortable. I know in my office, having you know set arguments where where we can understand things because not only did you have med underlying medical conditions that some were valid, some were you know they just didn't like jail. Um, there were then also just a, it was an evolution of understanding what COVID was and how the responses to COVID. Uh, can can be provided in a custodial setting. So um, yeah, there 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 does have to be some gatekeeping because otherwise, any reform or any resources are just going to get lost in that that sort of avalanche of of violence that are always going to occur. And, and that's historically been the dilemma for both inmate litigation, 1983 inmate litigation, and habeas litigation is separating out the sort of the wheat from the chaff. Right. Um, you know, there are a lot of really smart jailhouse lawyers uh, who know how to work this, and then there's a lot of them that, that aren't. And, you know, you have to be able to parse through those things and figure out this is a case that's got a legitimate issue. But the one thing inmates have is an incredible amount of time uh, to sit around and think about these things, and they can do that in a well-spent way to come up with creative and, and thorough analysis and pleadings, but they also can use it as a way of, I don't have anything else to do, so you know, let me file this 1983 suit. Um, and so there's this tension in both the anti-terrorism bill and in PLRA of trying to navigate that balance between those types of cases. How do we get legitimate review for those cases that need to get legitimate review and keep out those cases that, that don't. Um, and that's a really complicated thing. And then you add to the fact that there are people without lawyers, you've got um, law clerks who are overextended with all the other things that are going on, the prosecutor's offices are overextended with the other things they're going on, um, trying to go through that stuff. So, yeah. If we could share the screen one more. I want to show a slide here that talks to the points both gentlemen and my left and right said. Um, Um, so here's, here's the statute for the PLRA that has the attorney fee issue. The point that was just made by the questioner that the lethal injection is 1983 litigation. Um, I might suggest to Congress, if I had their ear, scrap this statute. This is the PLRA's uh, attorney, the first part of it is the attorney fee one. And just put it 1983. So Duncan's point, you don't want the guy or gal who says the toast wasn't warm in the morning complaining to federal court. And yes, you do get folks say, you know, my two-thirds. Well, you're two-thirds before you came to prison. Um, yeah, it's a problem, but not that grave that should justify the use of judicial resources on the district or court of appeals level. However, I think if I'm right, that no one here would remember my first example, which take on the case that takes a year for free. The one lawyer said, I got one, that's it, I'm done. I think that incentive is sufficient enough to say to the lawyers, we'll sift out the stuff. The professor Benz would just fessed up. He tells the clerk, one time I'll give, give you one. I mean, I'll give you one, I'll make good with the clerk. Even if it's a dog, I'll take it. But not two. That's fair. In other words, I think the lawyers, if this were 1983 litigation, you had a right to counsel, if you, or counsel or attorney fees if you win, just straight up. I think that's pretty strong incentive to at least rectify a fair percentage of the problems, maybe 50% right off the bat. Why do we need this Byzantine problem? And you'll see that 150% right there in um, 
in a part D3. That means that the judgment's zero. And remember, a lot of inmates will get zero. But there won't be dirty trays anymore for their food. There won't be maggots in their food. They kicked out the third party, so the policy changed. A lot of people want injunctive, effectively, injunctive relief. Sure, they want money in their books. They're in for five more years, they want a little cash in their pocket. Parties might settle, probably won't. The policy, though, will change. DRC, Ohio Department of Rehabilitation Corrections, yeah, we got a problem, we got maggots in the food. Come on, we have a contract that says you're going to serve healthy food to, in a hygienic manner to inmates. You're not. You violated a contract. We'll change you. That's what the inmates want, ultimately. The lawyer gets zero for litigating a large case because the judgment's zero in courts that interpret this, meaning you get a buck and a half. A buck and a half for an hour or of hour work might be kind of acceptable. How about for a year of work? Eee. By the way, the second provision that the limitation recovery is the point that the blast panel made. Emotional distress doesn't count. Have to have in the PLRA some physical problem. That's what that says. And that's a problem too. I, I don't know the ins and outs sufficient as to how to tackle this in Congress. But I do know that I can imagine if I were eating in a mess hall right now, sat down, grabbed my napkin, and up came crawling something out of my food, and I didn't touch it. That'd be pretty disturbing in and of itself. Wow, no recovery in the PLRA. Wow, that's weird. That's not right. That's not right. So reformers out there, think creatively. Well, the, the other issue with this is, is this statute has been interpreted that you only get this um, attorney's fees if you win. And the Supreme Court has defined winning as getting a judgment on the merits in your favor. And a voluntary cessation of the practice by the government is not a judgment on the merits. Uh, so I have litigated some of these big 1983 um, Supermax litigation and these others, and the government will fight you for years. In the Supermax case, we were at the Supreme Court three times. Um, and then at the end of it, you come back and the government says, okay, well, you're right. These are, these are problems. We'll, we fixed them. Dismiss the case. And the attorney's fees at that point get zeroed out because you didn't win. You did not get a final judgment um, in your favor because they agreed to fix it without the court ordering them to do it. Uh, and that's a major problem, a major disincentive for lawyers to take this, even if you have the idea that you can get fees. Um, and survive all these other things, the government will litigate, um, not the federal government, I'm sure, um, but other governments, the state governments, will fight these things through litigation and then, you know, say, you're right, we fixed it, case should be dismissed as moot. Um, so, and then you get zero, even though you won. Could I follow up on a couple of comments that have just been made? Uh, one is the one that Professor Benza made about the voluntary cessation. Um, if I understand the Supreme Court's position on attorney's fees in catalyst cases, the court has said something to the effect that, that if the court has signed off on the arrangement, then perhaps a fee might be appropriate. To what extent does that opening help you? Uh, it, it actually hurts um, because the government can see the writing on the wall. And so when you start having a, a district court judge talking about consent decree, the government then says, we don't need a consent decree. We've done it. And that also doesn't, then it's just a dismissal order, um, which again is not the... That even doesn't work as a catalyst um, because you still don't get the final sign off by the district court judge. Okay. Yeah. And let me follow up with Mr. Torres on the physical injury point under the PLRA. Um, I am not a tax person, but there is a provision in the Internal Revenue Code that deals with whether certain kinds of damage awards count as income. It's section 104A2 of the Internal Revenue Code. Don't ask me why I know this. Um, but Congress has tinkered 
with 104A2 on several occasions uh, in response to various sorts of judicial rulings. And I wonder to what extent there might be some connection between the way Congress has thought about damage awards in the tax setting and the way it has thought about what might be recoverable under the PLRA. And I don't mean that we say that individual members of Congress know this, but, but sort of, is there some sort of institutional analogy lurking here? So that's, an, I never thought we'd be talking to the IRS, today, but that's a good point. Uh, I, I, so let me make this observation on that point. Um, prisons, jails don't like recoveries for inmates of any monetary sort. You could write a book and they don't want the royalties necessary to go to that person. I know from direct contact, we tried to allow prisoners to sell their art and they couldn't. They did, there too many rules prohibiting inmates from running a business while in prison. And that's the equivalent, they say, even if you have your own art. Something for the reformers, by the way, in the room and on the screen. Um, in a world of Facebook and social media, I'm wondering if that should be changed. Um, so my suggestion to Congress would be this. If you're that concerned, don't be. <laughs> First of all, because the income is so small. <laughs> I mean, we're talking fractions of a fraction of a fractional percentage of Jeff Bezos' salary. So if you want to worry about Elon Musk's salary selling the stock this week, and getting some tax revenue. I mean, we're talking probably all the time the, president, the country's been in, in existence, it's still just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction that the inmates' income is concerned. So it's not an issue. If that's an issue, though, I might further suggest disconnect the attorney fee from the judgment award, then. Why are they together, then? If you don't want the income to go to the inmate, then Congress, you lied to us. You didn't really intend to have the lawyers get any money at all anyway. Because if you were against them getting income, and you tie the lawyer's feet to the income, lawyers are going to end up getting nothing. It's just unfair to the lawyers. I mean, we were really hard in these cases. I, there are faces in this room. I know they're going to go into this area. There are judges in front of me. I know you and your staffs work very hard on these cases. Ditto for the lawyers' presentations and arguments. Duncan Sennon goes to argue these cases. Professor Benzler, ditto. They don't go on there fly by night. She's getting compensated for that. So, um, Professor Enton, to the extent Congress thinks inmates earn too much money and the tax implications would be you know, unquestionably bad, we don't want to talk even about it, then disconnect, disjoin, disconnect entirely the attorney fee from that judgment in my recommendation. Although the, the issue on, on physical injury, that word is used repeatedly throughout the federal code. And one of the things I teach my students on statutory interpretations is that the word used in multiple statutes means the same thing, yet not here. Um, the court has interpreted physical injury to be something beyond the normal uh, bumps and bruises that you are expected to get when you are in prison. Um, there is a certain amount of physical harm uh, that is just acceptable <laughs> by the fear, the mere fact that you are incarcerated. And so that, even, even though there's clearly physical injury in, in a tort sense, that would not qualify as physical injury under PLRA to get you past to get to the emotional distress. Um, and that's why Congress had to add the sexual assault component. That was not there in the original part of the um, harm requirement and the government's argument was that sexual penetration without a beating was <coughs> not physical injury and the courts accepted it. Um, that that was not um, a physical injury merely because you had been sexually penetrated. Um, I know from my criminal law students brings them those flashbacks for when we do sexual assault of how do you define the assault. Um, Congress or had to add that um, because that was not a, that was not what Congress intended to to exclude sexual penetration from physical injury if there was no <coughs> demonstrated other trauma. The problem still also exists in 1983 actions when you try to bring um, Eighth Amendment violations for cruel and unusual punishment because of prison reform or prison conditions. Excuse me, bumps and bruises don't count. And it can be pretty significant bumps and bruises. Knocked down the ground, punched. 
So I, I had a question for each of you. Um, uh, 88 Brown, I was curious whether uh, you feel as though there are any specific reforms that could be made to sort of preserve that gatekeeping mechanism, uh, but maybe make it a little bit more uh, specific or more navigable for those uh, valid claims, um, either based on changing a provision of the statute or uh, maybe if there's potentially a role for prosecutorial discretion um, in some of those cases. And then, uh, Mr. Therese, I was curious um, what you think some of the most effective strategies for moving the needle uh, generally in these cases uh, are from, from the defendant's point of view. I'll be very quick. We got to five minutes, and I think my answer is going to lead very much into Dennis's answer, which is I think the, the gatekeeping functions work well. They're flawed. Um, but what I, what I think really needs to be the focus is giving the resources or giving the ability for those inmates to navigate them more efficiently or more, which is the idea of expanding the role. I do like the idea of the federal defender of work. They're in the court every day. They have the relationships with trial courts, which is really what, what's going to make the difference um, to, to help navigate that. So it's working within a framework that recognizes the need for judicial efficiency and, and sort of streamlining that process, but then giving um, the inmates tools that will help uh, understand that access and, and navigate that. So I'm going to be very quick, Pastor. Also so if I could share the screen, I'm going to go to slide five. Um, so the first, Duncan hit all, of, all the points. So I'm going to highlight this for benefit of those in school here. Oh, he's doing that. That's not the. I'm not speaking for the Northern District of Ohio. I'm speaking, but I am speaking as a prosecutor, federal prosecutor, who's both worked with the Defender's Office and works within the system. Um, both, both making these disclaimers, you surely are. That's um, very expensive. <laughs> we're going to disclaim, disclaim, disclaim. All right, so last bullet point, everyone. If you are a 1L or a 2L or a 3L, take Professor Benz's class. I'm telling you, I, I, I can compliment and thank our sponsor, Case Western Reserve. Every law school should have a class on post-conviction law. Why? It combines the best elements and the most challenging elements of civil, criminal, and constitutional law. You might not like the area. I realize that you might like IP work better. I, that's fair, patent work too. But to be a great litigator or to be a great advocate for your cause, don't you want to test your skills with your back against the wall the hardest? Then the IP case that you get is not that difficult. Talking to an Apple executive, Trust me, it is very different than talking to an inmate. That's because of differences, not because of in their intellect. It's not because of their or their education. It's not because one is not one is less human or more human. Nothing at all. It's your client. When ABA says represent your client uh, zealously with your firm conviction, I don't care whether it's Tim. What's Tim's last name from Apple? Shoot, sure. huh? Tim Cook or <laughs> Elon Musk, maybe the fun guy, get Elon in the brain this morning. Yeah, Tim Cook or Mr. Young, the guy who brought the, 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 the trade case. It just says client. So, um, take his class. Every law school should be putting this in the curriculum. I want to test my skills with my back against the wall, then go to Jones Deere, square pan and bomb. It's a, not a cakewalk, but it's very different. Second, if you get one of these cases and you're a young lawyer, old lawyer, or medium age lawyer, I don't care. Don't let this happen to you. This is a true story too. Defender sometimes gets weird roles. One of the roles was, can you help this guy out? He just accepted an appointment. I'm not representing the client, but they said, you know, I've never done one of these cases. It was, a, it was an EPA case. And oh, by, yeah, 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 it's EPA. Oh, and by the way, you know, could you, Make arrangements to get to prison, to visit clients, state prison. Moments before we walked in, the young lawyer said, you know, I, I talked to my significant other just while we were coming here. I, 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 I'm going to be okay. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I know prisons are dangerous and I might not come out okay. Now, 
I'm not going to criticize that person. Most lawyers coming out of this law school have never been inside a jail or a prison. I realize that. There was a reason I added that as a component when I taught here. One evening we go to the jail. And part of it was you've got to feel for the jail environment. Why? Because it's part of our justice system. It's not because we hope you stay out, uh, you know, scared straight stuff. No, it's not because we want you to go to criminal law. No, it's because this is part of this. What we're talking about here today is part of our justice system. Skip the criminal part. It is part of our justice system. And as lawyers, you have to understand, some of you will be judges someday. Some of you will be great litigators someday. Some of you will be great legislators someday. If you do not understand and experience firsthand you're a primary component of our justice system, how do you see it in the justice system? But there's another reason. They're your client. If you represented Joe Biden as president or Donald Trump as former president, wouldn't you want to go to Trump Tower to talk with the guy about why his subpoena shouldn't be enforced? Of course you would. What would you say? I got to talk to him personally. I got to get his real story. All well, these clients are the same way. They want you to tell you their story. Go listen to them. Don't worry about the prison. The guards will keep you safe. <laughs> they put you in a special room. And everyone's watching. There's cameras. You'll be fine. Because if you can't meet your client on his or her own turf, at their home or the office, then you do have to meet them on their own turf, which happens to be a prison in these cases. Don't understand EDPA or PLRA as some form of stuff that's attaching only to the criminal justice system. It attaches to our justice system. For that reason, you should get to know it and again, take this guy's course. All right. Thank you very much. We will now take our break for um, lunch. I want to thank our panelists for a <laughs> What time is lunch? One fifteen. One. We will be back at one fifteen. Do you want the online people to stay logged on? Yes. So if you're online, please just stay logged on. Uh, and then we will be back for the next session at 1.15.
Good afternoon, everyone. We'll begin in about two minutes. Two minutes. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch uh, break. Um, this next panel we're really excited for. Dean Adamson is going to lead this discussion about potential reforms of EDPA and the PLRA. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce this panel um, who are going to be talking about the reform possibilities for EPTA and the PLRA after 25 years. Um, I would like to introduce first Professor William Carter. He is a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh, and he has written extensively on civil rights issues. Uh, his articles have appeared in leading law reviews, including the Columbia Law Review, Emory Law Journal, the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, and the UCLA Law Review. Previously, he's been dean, he was dean of Pittsburgh, um, and Professor Carter has also taught at Temple University and right here uh, uh, at Case Western Reserve University, and has won numerous teaching awards, and is also an alumnus of this wonderful institution. So we're proud to have you back, and welcome back, uh, Professor Carter. Um, Lee Kovarsi is the Bryant Smith Chair in Law and the co-director of the Capital Punishment Center at the University of Texas. And he is a leading scholar of, of the death penalty and of death penalty in habeas corpus. Um, his teaching and writing also focuses on civil and criminal procedure, criminal justice, federal justice, and conflicts of law, federal jurisdiction, I'm sorry, and conflicts of law. He has published in leading art journals such as the California Law Review, the Cornell Law Review, the Duke Law Journal, the New York University Law Review, the Notre Dame Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, the Texas Law Review, and the Vanderbilt Law Review, oh, and the Virginia Law Review. <laughs> um, wonderful. He has co-authored two books, including a leading case book on federal habeas, habeas corpus, Professor Kravarsky actively litigates habeas and capital cases, including at the Supreme Court. Uh, previously, he taught at New York University and also at the University of Maryland. Professor Kovarsi clerked for Judge Jerry E. Smith of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Paul J. Larkin, Jr., who is with us via Zoom and virtually, is the John, Barbara, and Victoria <laughs> Rumpel Single Legal Research Senior Legal Research Fellow in the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies uh, at the Heritage Foundation. And he works on criminal justice policy, drug policy, and regulatory policy. He previously had extensive experience in the federal government, and he argued 27 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court as an assistant to the Solicitor General and was also an attorney in the organized crime and racketeering section of the Department of Justice. In addition, he was counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee and a special agent for criminal enforcement at the Environmental Protection Agency. Mr. Larkin began his career as a law clerk to, the Judge, Robert H, to Judge Robert H. Bork of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And last but not least, um, Judge Philip J. I'm sorry, Judge J. Philip Calabresi, and he's with the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio here, and he also serves here as an adjunct professor of law. Before his appointment to the federal bench, Judge Calabresi served on the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas and was an active lit litigator with several leading Cleveland-based firms. 
He is a former president of the Ohio, um, Northern District of Ohio chapter of the Federal Bar Association. After graduating from Harvard Law School, he served as law clerk to Judge Alice M. Bouchelder in the U United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. We will begin with remarks and reflections um, from Professor Carter. Thank you, Brian. Can everyone hear me okay? If you saw a slightly startled look on my face, I thought it was because I was gonna go last rather than first, <laughs> but that's okay. Nope, that, that's completely fine. So you, you owe me a cup of coffee. <laughs> so it's good to be with you all. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't just mention a couple of things in passing before getting to the substance of my remarks. Um, first, I want to thank the Law Review and all the students who did all the work to pull this together. Um, I know that there's a lot of behind the scenes effort um, that often is not seen by those of us who just show up and talk. So I want to thank you all for everything you've done. Um, secondly, I want to thank the school for inviting me back to my alma mater. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's a little weird to be here in this room because this is where I had 1L constitutional law with Professor Eaton. <laughs> so, no, you cannot call on me. I will not be answering Socratic questions today. Um, but it's really, it's always a pleasure to be back home. So, I want to spend a little bit of time talking you through this piece that I'm working on. And I should note at the outset also that unlike my co-panelists, I really don't have deep expertise in the PLRA and EDPA. It's something I've followed over the years, um, but I've never litigated these kinds of cases. And this is my first foray in writing in this space. So I'd really appreciate any feedback or questions that you all have. What, what I do have a bit of expertise in thinking about though, are issues of constitutional law, race in the law, and uh, equality that I believe are implicated by these statutes and the way that they deprive a group that is generally considered to be socially alienated outsiders of the normal litigation and adjudicative rights that other members of society enjoy. So I'm not going to be diving deeply into specific sections of uh, these statutes, but rather looking at them holistically and considering the effects that they have, in particular, <clears throat> through the lens of what is my expertise, the law and history of slavery. A few notes at the outset. As I'm discussing these things, I want to be clear that I'm not uh, suggesting that prisoners are slaves, nor am I comparing the conditions of incarceration to slavery. Rather, I'm bringing to bear some of the lessons that I've learned in studying the history of slavery to suggest um, at minimum that we should always be very thoughtful and cautious when we see legislation that singles out one alienated group or class for different procedural and substantive protections in our court system. As you all probably know, the PLRA and EDPA impose a variety of uh, constraints on what I will call adjudicative speech by incarcerated persons throughout my talk today. Those limitations may not at first blush be unusual, um, and indeed, limitations on litigation, whether out of concerns for frivolousness or otherwise, are, are not unusual. And the entire body of uh, federal practice and procedure regulates the kinds of speech that can occur in litigation. So my point here is not that um, regulating litigation in and of itself is necessarily troublesome. As I mentioned, though, the way that the PLRA and EDPA operate is troublesome, especially when viewed through the lens of history. So as relevant to my talk, uh, a few provisions that are pertinent in these statutes are ones that limit access to the courts by requiring the payment of filing fees, even by indigent incarcerated persons, that impose a strict limitations period of one year for habeas claims under EDPA, that strictly limit the filing of multiple habeas petitions that impose various limitations on federal court habeas review of state court decisions. And as to the PLRA, provisions that cap attorney's fees in a manner that many scholars have suggested diminish the willingness of counsel to represent incarcerated persons or affect the quality of the representation by those attorneys who do so. In some, these statutes achieved their goal, which was to deter 
and to limit federal court litigation by incarcerated persons. I and other scholars would suggest, though, that in addition to that instrumental goal, there seems to have been at least another effect and perhaps an intent. That is, that statutes of this nature <clears throat> that single out a particular class for wholesale and sui generis limitations upon their adjudicative rights serve as an additional form of punishment above and beyond uh, the punishment that was issued at sentence by demeaning and degrading the individual's worth via subjecting them to a different set of rules that convey their status as lesser members of society. In order for any of that to uh, be persuasive, the uh, foundation is understanding that the uh, Supreme Court's cases, as well as our uh, constitutional tradition, often treat litigation as a form of expression. And in terms of litigation as expression, such litigation is thought to serve several purposes, two of which are particularly pertinent to uh, the subject of my talk today. The first relates to the democratic process. Adjudicative speech can relate to the democratic process in a variety of ways. Such litigation can serve as a form of dissent against the government, especially when the government is your jailer. It can serve as a means to galvanize political change. It can serve as a way to focus public attention on the claims of the plaintiff's class. And in the case of collective litigation, it can also serve to amplify person's voices through association in a manner that the Supreme Court has said in NAACP versus Button is akin to the functioning of a political party. And indeed, the Supreme Court in its jurisprudence prior to the PLRA expressly recognized that incarcerated persons' adjudicative speech can be a form of political participation. When the court in McCarthy versus Madigan stated that because a prisoner is ordinarily divested of the privilege to vote, the right to file a court action might be said to be his remaining most fundamental political right, which is preservative of all his other rights. Freedom of expression also serves as an aspect of individual dignity and autonomy. And this view was noted in a concurrence by Justice Marshall in Procunier versus Martinez, where rather than focusing upon the First Amendment rights of correspondence with incarcerated persons, which is where the majority focus, he suggested that excuse me, censorship of prisoner mail works a direct uh, First Amendment violation upon the rights of the incarcerated person. Reasoning that the First Amendment serves not only the instrumental needs of the polity, but also those of the human spirit, a spirit that demands self-expression. When the prison gates slam behind an inmate, he does not lose his human quality. His mind does not become closed to ideas. His intellect does not cease to feed upon a free and open interchange of opinions, nor is his quest for self-realization concluded. If anything, Justice Marshall continued, <clears throat> the needs for identity and self-respect are more compelling in the dehumanizing prison environment than for the rest of us. So if one were to accept that the democratic self-governance and dignity rationales for protecting freedom of expression apply with equal force to incarcerated persons' expressive activities, the next question would become whether the PLRA and EDPA's limitations on adjudicative speech do in fact implicate First Amendment values. I contend that they do. And for the sake of time, I will not review all of the court's cases discussing litigation as expression, I've mentioned NAACP versus Button previously, which noted that particularly for subordinated and uh, disenfranchised groups, litigation may indeed be their only effective form of expression. And other scholars have delved more deeply into the court's cases and uh, theory as to why adjudication does indeed further expressive First Amendment values. <clears throat> the PLRA, by limiting such adjudicative expression by a distinct and despised group infringes upon those putative rights. Now, the area where I mostly have engaged in study deals with the history of the law of slavery. And again, I'll be fairly brief for the sake of time, but I would note that my 20 years or so of writing in that area have led me to be very suspicious 
whenever I see legal rules that categorically limit outcast groups access to and use of the judicial system. I want to hasten to reiterate, I am not suggesting that incarcerated persons are slaves, nor that incarceration is slavery. Rather, I'm speaking more systemically about the rule of law. When we tend to see wholesale disenfranchisement from the normal procedural and substantive rules that apply to all others, there is usually something else going on. That something else in the case of slavery was the civil death of enslaved persons, whereby a single trait, that is blackness, was used to define one's status before the law for all time with no possibility of redemption as a member of civil society. Here I'm quoting uh, Dr. Orlando Patterson's masterwork, Slavery and Social Death, which I can highly recommend to your attention if you're interested in these issues. So during the American slave regime, the slave codes uh, imposed a great variety of limitations directly upon enslaved persons and free blacks' speech, but also directly targeted the adjudicative speech <clears throat> that enslaved persons and again free blacks could engage with them. In Pennsylvania, for example, there was a separate system of slave courts, uh, which free blacks were also subject to, outside of and beyond the regular state court system. In addition, provisions of the state slave codes limited adjudicative expression by disallowing the testimony of slaves and free blacks in cases involving whites, as nearly every southern state and many northern states did as well. In addition, the Federal Fugitive Slave Acts, uh, both the earlier one and this uh, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, also tilted the scales of litigation against the person seeking to make a claim to freedom. Frederick Douglass, famous, famously in his what, is the, what to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech, described how the Fugitive Slave Act, in his view, expressly silenced the adjudicative speech of the person claimed as a slave while privileging the adjudicative speech of the putative slave owner. So Douglas noted that under the Fugitive Slave Act, quote, the oath of any two villains is sufficient to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witnesses for himself, and the minister of American justice is bound by law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Douglas made these observations because the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 expressly provided that the putative slave's testimony was inadmissible in evidence, whereas the putative owner could establish a claim of ownership upon the presentation of any satisfactory proof of any kind. The history that I recount here, at least in my view, rings hauntingly close in some ways, particularly to EDPA's restrictions on habeas claims by incarcerated persons who are seeking to establish their entitlement to freedom from incarceration. There are, of course, many, many substantive differences between the Fugitive Slave Act and EDPA, not the least of which is that there would, under EDPA, have been some predicate adjudication through the regular court process of the person's status. Nonetheless, these statutes, like the slave statutes that I mentioned briefly, operated to create a cycle of othering civil alienation and lesser procedural and substantive rights, which further contributed to the relevant group's invisibility to our legal system, which then rendered them yet more distant from civil society and presumed to be due only lesser legal protections than others. The last substantive point I'll make, and I'm looking toward my timekeeper, um, because you have a law professor with the microphone, so this could go on for a very long time. Thank you. The last substantive point I'll make is this. One thing that's striking to me as someone who studies not only the law of slavery, but also studies and teaches First Amendment law, is how far the restrictions on adjudicative speech that the PLRA and EDPA impose depart from the normal First Amendment rules. And I will, uh, for the sake of time, not dive deeply into the First Amendment doctrine, but I would note that these statutes, if applied to non-incarcerated persons, would almost surely be analyzed by the Supreme Court as content-based restrictions on expression, 
viewpoint-based restrictions on expression and speaker-based restrictions upon expression, all of which the Supreme Court has said in the ordinary context are highly suspect and subject to strict scrutiny. The degree of departure from the ordinary First Amendment rules also signals to me, given the history that I mentioned earlier that I've been engaged in studying for a while, that we, society, the legal system, courts, etc., have chosen to apply a different set of constitutional standards for the rights of incarcerated persons than any of us would accept if applied to us. And I would also note one thing that is interesting is that the court, at least in some contexts, has more recently become even more speech protective than it had been historically. So a quote that I can share with you, which I have at the beginning of this draft paper, is this. The Supreme Court has stated, quote, that by taking the right to speak from some and giving it to others, the government deprives the disadvantaged person or class of the right to use speech to strive to establish their worth standing and respect for their voice. One might expect that ringing de declaration of the autonomy and dignity interests of free expression to occur in a case involving a historically subordinated class. It was not. That is a quote from Citizens United. And so at bottom, I ask, can we not agree that incarcerated individuals at minimum are entitled to similar respect for their adjudicative expression as, for example, corporations, labor unions, and others have under the court's more speech protective recent jurisprudence. Last, the question by implication then, if you agree with me, is why? Why does our legal system tolerate this differential treatment of incarcerated persons' adjudicative rights? Why was the PLRA passed in the first place? As to the second question, I assume that other panelists will discuss the legislative history of the PLRA. I can tell you there ain't much. It was done as a rider to a bill after previously having failed to pass. And the legislative history is based on anecdata, a couple of stories about some prisoners engaging in frivolous litigation. Now, to be clear, I am quite aware that frivolous litigation exists. I'm also acutely aware from my colleagues who are judges that having to manage such frivolous litigation clogs the dockets from other claims that may indeed be more meritorious. The question, though, is do we have reason to think that the claims by adjudicated persons tend to be frivolous at a greater rate than other members of society? And I will let others who have greater expertise discuss that. The bigger picture question, though, is not only why were these statutes adopted, but why do we tolerate them? And my answer, unsurprisingly, goes back to the beginning. We tolerate them, even though they would be rejected in nearly any other context, because we believe that incarcerated persons are separate. They are different. They are socially and civilly dead. They do not have, nor are they entitled to, similar rights to the rest of us. And I would simply disagree with that premise. It is not to say that all restrictions on litigation, or even indeed all restrictions on incarcerated persons' litigation, are improper or constitutionally suspect. I do believe, <clears throat> in the context at least of our prison system, which entails a large, racialized, near-permanent undercast, unable to overcome its alienation from civil society, that we tolerate these restrictions because of that status. And I believe that um, if we could extend a bit more legal, personal uh, empathy toward incarcerated persons and see ourselves in those person's shoes, we would not tolerate similar restrictions. My time has passed. Thank you uh, for your attention. I look forward to hearing my other panelists' contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Carter. Uh, now we'll hear from Professor Kowarski. my own time up here. Um, so uh, if we're going to panel up uh, EDPA during the October 2021 term of the United States Supreme Court, we ought to at least discuss the terms EDPA blockbuster, which is a case called uh, Shin versus Ramirez. Uh, and 
Uh, Ramirez, moreover, is an EDPA case that will tell us a lot how this particular mix of justices uh, is likely to interpret the habeas statute. After all, the blockbuster habeas case from last term, which is the only term we've had this mix of justices, uh, was actually not an EDPA case. It was about retroactivity, which is a judge-constructed doctrine that is largely unregulated by statute. Um, so one reason I want to talk about Shin versus Ramirez is that it's timely. Uh, another reason I want to talk about it is that it nicely centers uh, some of the court's stranger interpretive practices in habeas statute cases. Um, so uh, a couple more things before I get started in earnest. First, uh, one of the things that you can ordinarily say about EDPA cases is because they are so excessively proceduralist, some people really miss the icebergs. Um, and this is a case where although it is excessively procedural in terms of the way it sounds and in terms of the way the question presented is phrased, it is a case with extraordinary implications for the way that we enforce the Sixth Amendment. This is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, the second thing I'll mention just uh, relates to my own qualifications in that I come to this material not just as a professor who writes casebooks and articles about this, but also as somebody who is uh, deeply, deeply embedded in litigation efforts. I've probably either consulted on or directly represented somewhere between 50 and 60 um, death sentence capital prisoners in their post-conviction uh, proceedings. Um, and so I know about this from an academic angle, but also very, very much from uh, a, a practical angle. And I guess the third thing I'll say is um, this conference was originally scheduled to be after the oral argument in the case, which was supposed to be on November 1st, but then the SB8 stuff happened and it got bumped to December. And so my touch today, my, my talk today is gonna be a touch more prognostic uh, than uh, I originally planned. Uh, so it's gonna be hard to have a discussion of why the case is important without understanding what the case is. So I guess I'll start there. Um, now, the legal issue in the case takes a little while to unpack, um, but it's a, the, the question involves a really, really crucial way of enforcing the Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel. Um, now, the Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel is a difficult right to enforce uh, because so much information relevant to the enforcement of that right is unavailable to the trial judge and also unavailable to the judge on appeal. Um, and so the crucial forums for enforcing that Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel are often collateral. That is state post-conviction and federal habeas proceedings. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. So first, uh, a Sixth Amendment claimant has to show that trial counsel uh, performed deficiency, deficiently and also that that deficiency prejudiced uh, the outcome of the case. And the evidence of those elements often sits far outside the trial record. And so it's a claim that the trial judge and the court directly reviewing the conviction can't really evaluate. Uh, second is because the lawyers who defend uh, the offender at trial and then on appeal are often the same, we don't ordinarily expect lawyers to, excuse, to accuse themselves of ineffective representation. And so there are these very deeply embedded structural reasons why we rely on collateral proceedings in order to enforce this particular Sixth Amendment right. Um, and in fact, there are really two collateral forums for a person convicted in state court, state post-conviction proceedings and federal habeas proceedings. Well, actually the state post-conviction forum for enforcing the Sixth Amendment right isn't that great either. Why? because there's no constitutional right to counsel in a state post-conviction proceeding um, where the representation is notoriously awful. Um, how can you rely on a forum to enforce a first order right to counsel when you can't actually get a good lawyer in the enforcement proceeding? So for a long time, the Supreme Court, notwithstanding the state of affairs, refused to open the federal habeas forum up as an alternative site of Sixth Amendment enforcement. Um, specifically, it insisted that the state prisoner had to bear responsibility for the mistakes of their post-conviction lawyer. Then about 10 years ago, the Supreme Court decides this case called Martinez v. Ryan. 
Um, and there, the court held that a federal uh, that a federal judge could review a forfeited Sixth Amendment claim if the forfeiture was a result of deficient state post-conviction representation. Um, well, Martinez was styled and was understood as a rule that clients aren't at fault when their post-conviction lawyers forfeit Sixth Amendment ineffective assistance of counsel claims. And Martinez was therefore a desperately needed dose of enforcement for the right to counsel. So what does this have to do with Shin versus Ramirez? Well, dating back over 50 years, there have been parallel rules for defaulting claims and for defaulting evidence in support of those claims. Um, and among other things, that meant that both types of defaults had the same standard for attributing lawyer mistakes to clients. EDPA included statutory language that restricted the right to introduce evidence on uh, defaulted evidence, but not on defaulted claims. Um, and so Ramirez turns on the language of that restriction on the introduction of evidence, which is 28 U.S.C. 2254E2, which makes it really hard to introduce new federal evidence if a prisoner, quote, failed to develop, unquote, the factual predicate of a claim in state court. Well, Arizona now argues that although Martinez might allow federal courts to entertain the right to counsel claims on the merits, 2254E2 should bar the prisoners from supporting that claim with any evidence. After all, the argument goes, a statute is a statute, and the statute says what Arizona says it says, and if it's a bad policy, it's for Congress to change. Um, now, on the one hand, no jurisdiction actually uses the rule that Arizona is asking the Supreme Court to adopt in this case. On the other hand, there is a pre-Martinez case saying that the mistakes of post-conviction attorney agents are charged to their client principles. And this is a court that is extremely hostile to federal habeas relief. And so here we are. That's the state's position. So what's the prisoner's position? Well, Ramirez and Jones, it's actually consolidated cases, they say that the rules for attributing attorney mistakes to clients are the same, whether you're talking about claim forfeiture or evidence forfeiture. And the refusal to acknowledge that symmetry produces absurd results, uh, and it is also inconsistent with the statute. Specifically, the phrase in the statute, fail to develop, is ripped directly from a case called Keeney versus Tamayo Reyes, which says both that it is a rule for attributing the fault of lawyers to prisoners, and that that rule of fault attribution is supposed to be the same, whether you're talking about defaulting claims or whether you're talking about defaulting facts. In other words, this is actually a situation where the prisoners have quite a strong textualist argument. So there you are. And to sum up, Shin versus Ramirez is about the meaning of 28 U.S.C. 2254E2, which restricts the use of evidence not presented to state courts. In this litigation, you have both sides arguing that statutory text favors their interpretation. A decision in the state's favor would be a declaration that Martinez was stillborn, insofar as it recognized a court's authority to decide a claim, but not any power to take supportive evidence and support thereof. And in so doing, it would be a dramatic setback for right to counsel enforcement, which is a bedrock right of criminal defense. So why do I think this case is uh, a nice lens to use to look at EDPA? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, so uh, first, uh, I will explain um, that by making the assumption that the state wins, and I think you can expect a state to win if and only if the court sticks to its stranger interpretive practices in the EDPA cases. So first, the state's case is premised on a sort of mindless purposivism. Um, you've heard it before, 
the judges in here will all nod in recognition. Um, and EDPA must be interpreted to promote comedy and finality and federalism. And the reason given for that proposition is always a citation to some earlier case, which cites a case before that, and a case before that, and so on and so forth. It's turtles all the way down. I don't understand this interpretive claim at all. EDPA certainly restricted habeas beyond what prevailed before the legislation, but the fact of such restriction doesn't tell you how much more it restricted the habeas remedy. Um, all the garden variety objections to purpose of interpretation apply. First, statutes reflect animating purposes and they reflect limiting purposes. Um, and which purposes are supposed to control? Second, how exactly do you attribute intent to the result of group decision making? And even assuming that you think that statutory purpose can be an intelligible interpretive guide, what's the theory that such conditions are present here? There's no textual reference to statutory purpose. If you actually look at the legislative history of the statute, the median vote at each crucial point of the legislative process was secured by making the provisions more moderate, not by making them more restrictive. And even if you could extract a purpose from the EDPA amendments, that purpose would coexist with the purpose of incumbent text, which was clearly purposed to facilitate remedies. In short, I think the exhortation to interpret the statute with a purpose to restrict relief in closed cases is simply a made up decisional presumption that has had devastating effects on the enforcement of constitutional rights and you can see that potential here. The principle that EDPA should be construed to promote comedy and finality and federalism is invoked by Arizona no less than nine times in its briefing. In each instance, there's no real discussion of where that presumption comes from other than a citation to some other case that says it's there. And in each instance, it is invoked to suggest that the prisoner should lose close cases. The second reason why I think Ramirez is typical of post-advocate litigation um, is that it involves an absurd and empirically unsupported claim about prisoner behavior. The basic thrust of the, these claims about prisoner behavior involves some variation of the following idea. Unless we adopt this state-friendly rule, it will allow sophisticated prisoner litigants to benefit from some strategic delay by withholding arguments at upstream phases of the criminal process. Um, well, I have three big observations. First, if you actually think about the matrix of incentives that state prisoners face, none withhold evidence in support of a claim hoping to assert it in a later forum. The risk absolutely swamps the reward. Second, there's just never been one iota of empirical support invoked to support this idea. And third, if you are found to deliberately withhold a claim or deliberately withhold evidence in support of a claim, then you fall outside of the excuse doctrine anyways. Nevertheless, this imagined theory of sandbagging has underwritten a great many restrictions on the habeas remedy. And because the court always seems to latch onto this argument, the state makes it repeatedly here. So in conclusion, if you want to understand what EDPA is doing to our regime of constitutional enforcement, watch Shin versus Ramirez. It's a much more important case than people realize. And if the court uses the same odd interpretive practices that it usually uses, then it's going to absolutely wipe Martinez off the map. And if it does that to Martinez, wither the Sixth Amendment. Thank you, Professor Kowarski. Um, next, we'll be hearing from um, Mr. Larkin, who is with us virtually. Carry it away. Thank you very much. I'm honored for the opportunity to be here today. And I want to thank all the people who have not only invited me, but put this conference together. There's an old saying in the military, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. 
and all the administration officials, faculty, and students who helped pull this together deserve kudos for pulling together a great conference, and I want to make sure they get it. So thank you all very much. Let me say, I'm going to talk probably at a more 30,000-foot level that, uh, than some of my predecessors, and mostly as a matter of history. I'm going to talk about EDPA, but explain why it is not such a demonical act of Congress as many people have always said. Let me start with the history. The background is this. At common law and in the early history of the United States, the only issue that could be considered on habeas corpus was essentially one of jurisdiction. Did the court have a total claim of jurisdiction to issue the judgment in this case? Now, why was that the guarantee? It's because essentially the basic guarantee of Article 29 of Magna Carta was that you couldn't be thrown in jail just because the sheriff disliked you. If he did, he had to find, uh, had to wait till you committed a crime and find a way of proving it. Because if you were convicted of a crime by a court that had jurisdiction, you couldn't challenge that on habeas corpus. If you were convicted of a crime in a court that had the sheriff's brother-in-law who was never appointed as a judge, then yes, that's not materially different than the sheriff just throwing you in jail himself. Now, over time, beginning late in the 19th century, the Supreme Court gradually expanded the scope of habeas jurisdiction. The first major expansion was in the Siebold case, where the court said that you can raise on habeas corpus to claim that a statute, that is, the statute under which you were convicted, is unconstitutional. An eminently sensible decision, since if the statute underlying your conviction was unconstitutional, it was the same as if you had just been thrown in jail without being convicted. Then the Supreme Court started looking at what amounted to a trial, at least a trial as we know it in uh, Anglo-American history and particularly American. Frank versus Mangum, the court said that a mob-dominated trial is not a trial. It's really nothing much more than a slow lynching. And the Supreme Court had made clear in the 19th century that the people involved in lynching could be prosecuted under federal law for violating the defendant's civil rights. So it's quite clear that that was also an eminently reasonable case. Then in Mooney versus Houlihan, the court expanded it again. This time to say that if the government relies on perjured testimony to approve your guilt, you have not received the trial that we expect Americans should receive. Why? It's not materially different from saying there's not any evidence. Finally, in Brown versus Mississippi, although not a habeas case, the court held that the use of a coerced confession was unconstitutional. In fact, in that case, the defendants were brought into court still showing the marks on their necks and backs from where they had been hung and whipped until they pled guilty. So that itself was not also remotely the sort of trial that anyone would expect. The third expansion occurred, however, in the 20th century when the Supreme Court started to incorporate the Bill of Rights provisions against the states. That was a rather remarkable transition because previously there had been no such guarantees applicable to the states. And particularly in the case of the Sixth and Eighth Amendments, it had a great effect. The Sixth Amendment because that is the trial rights provision, and the Eighth Amendment because that deals with sentencing. So what you had, in essence, was the ability to raise constitutional claims, not only on direct appeal, but now in habeas, after a decision in 1953 called, excuse me, Brown versus Allen. Brown versus Allen was the first time the Supreme Court went out of its way to say that any federal constitutional claim could clearly be raised on habeas corpus and would be reviewed de novo. It's a very controversial decision for a host of reasons, most of which are laid out nicely by Paul Bator in a Harvard Law Review article. But what it effectively did is allow the federal system essentially to be a forum for the relitigation of every claim that a prisoner had made in a state court, even if it had been reviewed and rejected by a state appellate court. Now, that may not have been a big problem until around 1972, but in 72, the Supreme Court then, for the first time, put restraints on the state's imposition of capital punishment in a case called Furman versus Georgia. The result was a flurry of litigation ever after that, particularly after 1976 when the Supreme Court 
said that capital punishment was a legitimate and lawful penalty. The result was now you have the opportunity to litigate every claim that had ever been raised before in one time or another, not just in state court, but in federal court. Oh, and yes, it, capital cases are a classic example of why a defendant or with or without his counsel might want to send that. If you have a defendant that has a serious mental illness of some type, or at least a serious mental problem, let me put it that way, uh, but is you know somewhere in the neighborhood of being a pure sociopath, you don't want to introduce any evidence of psychiatric and prove psychiatric testimony to prove that at the initial sentencing stage, because the prosecution is then going to be able to introduce its own psychiatric testimony to show that someone is a sociopath. And therefore, the person is going to be in a worse position than if he introduced no such evidence, because the jury is going to probably decide the defendant has to be executed because he is clearly a danger, not just to us if he's relieved, but to anybody who comes into contact with him. And then, of course, if you don't introduce it at trial and raise the issue on direct appeal, you have a claim that you can raise under the Sixth Amendment on the ground your counsel was ineffective and not raised. So there clearly are circumstances where it is to a defendant's advantage not to raise a claim like that at trial or on the direct appeal. But put that aside. The problem that we wound up with after Brown versus Allen was a search for what philosophers would call ultimate truth. There is, in fact, no guarantee that relitigating an issue is going to give you the right result the second time, or that if you relitigate it a third time, that result is not even going to be better. There is no ultimate truth in this regard in life, and law doesn't demand it. Think about the most basic rule of criminal procedure known to the public. The prosecution must prove a defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It is beyond a reasonable doubt, not beyond any doubt. Think about how that rule is enforced in habeas corpus. Courts can look to see whether a reasonable jury could have found the defendant guilty of the charged crime. It's not whether the court on direct appeal, or in habeas corpus actually, believes that the defendant was guilty. It's whether a reasonable jury could have come to that conclusion. Look to the question then also as to how the due process clause relates to the decision by people who are integrally involved in the criminal or peniological process, but are not actually involved in the trial necessarily. In Washington versus Harper, the Supreme Court said that a state can administer potentially dangerous uh, medication to ensure the competency of someone who is in, in prison. The Supreme Court later twice extended that to people who have been charged with a crime and not getting convicted of anything in order to make sure that the person is not a danger to himself or others in order to re restore his competency to be tried. In the Harper case, the Supreme Court expressly rejected the question of whether or not the standard should be purely legal and said no. A physician's judgment as to whether this is medically appropriate for that purpose is far more likely to be the correct judgment than a lawyer's judgment. So there was nothing improper about relying on uh, evidence uh, that was presented to a committee of psychiatrists who then made the decision. Now, we're all familiar with the statement from Robert Jackson that he wrote in his concurring opinion in the Brown versus Allen case, where he said, quote, we are not final because we are infallible. We are infallible only because we are final. What maybe people are not as familiar with is the later statement he wrote in the same opinion. Quote, in considering a remedy for habeas corpus problems, it is prudent to assume that the scope and reach of the 14th Amendment will continue to be unknown and unknowable, that what seems established by one decision is apt to be unsettled by another, and that its interpretation will be more or less swayed by contemporary intellectual fashions and political currents. What the, a, what the EDPA essentially does is recognize the fact that reasonable jurists can disagree over what the proper rule of law is or how it should be applied in particular cases. And what the EDPA does is say, as long as the state has a corrective process, and as long as the judges who have, you know, rule on a claim have reached a reasonable result, federal courts will not be able to second guess that. Keep in mind, 
that in a whole series of cases prior, Brown versus Allen, the Supreme Court had said that the opportunity to raise a claim and have it fairly resolved in the state courts was more than adequate to satisfy any concern that maybe a federal claim was not properly considered. In fact, in Frank versus Mangum, the first case that expanded the reach of habeas corpus to include what is and is not a trial, the court went out of its way to say that Georgia had provided just such a mechanism. So reasonable people can disagree over the facts, the application of the law to the facts, and the law. And what Congress decided was, if that's the case, there is no need in order to have a complete second de novo review. Now, it has been criticized as being unconstitutional on at least two grounds. One is it violates the suspension clause. It amounts to Congress suspending the writ of habeas corpus. Of course, a premise of that entire argument is that the suspension clause essentially is a ratchet. And whatever the Supreme Court has said it means, that the habeas statute means that Congress has no authority to reduce it. It's an odd argument to make, given the fact that there is and has never been a constitutional right to appeal. And that there was no habeas review of state convictions until the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867, or actually, since it was suspended for a while after, until 1885. So the suspension clause argument is not a powerful one. Finally, it's also been argued that it violates the Article III judicial power clause or the due process clause, because it directs a court to enter a judgment that the court deems mistaken. The problem there is, also in the Constitution, is the Article IV full faith and credit clause, which requires federal courts to respect judgments entered in other courts, even if the court thinks it would have decided the matter differently. So it's difficult to interpret the Article III judicial power clause and the due process clause as containing a right to de novo review of claims raised in criminal cases, when, certainly in civil cases, the full faith and credit clause would require a court to accept the judgment that it thinks is wrong. For these reasons, I disagree with the people who say that AEDPA has simply nullified the protection of constitutional rights. I mean, even in capital cases, if you take a look, the Supreme Court has, for some time now, become the final court of review in capital cases. It has taken numerous capital cases that wouldn't normally satisfy the criteria the court uses in deciding whether to allocate time to hear a case, simply because it thinks that someone was improperly convicted. And that's entirely reasonable. If the Supreme Court wants to use its docket that way, it's their call. The Supreme Court has tried to make sure that people are not executed who have received fundamentally unfair trial proceedings. But Congress has decided that's enough. And Congress has that authority. So it seems to me that while people may disagree with the approach Congress took, it is by no means an illegitimate effort in trying to regulate the use of federal judicial power. Thank you, and I'm glad to answer any questions people have. Thank you, Mr. Larkin. And finally, we'll hear from Judge Calabresi. Well, good afternoon, and I'll just start by echoing the comments of my co-panelists, thanking everyone for all the effort to put the conference together, the symposium, and happy to be a part of it. And I think I have far less to offer than all my co-panelists, but here I am all the same. So I'm going to, on the topic of reform, I have one very modest proposal to present this afternoon. It's very modest, and it grows out of a personal experience that I've had a number of years ago and thought about and reflected on for quite some time. But I want to start by putting it in a little bit of perspective. First, my experience with the statutes that bring us together today is completely nonexistent with respect to the PLRA. So I truly have no views on that whatsoever at this point, and will defer to others to the extent there's discussion or questions about that. 
With respect to EDPA, my view uh, is really this. I, I still approach that statute more as a practitioner than a judge at this point. I've been on the federal bench now for just under a year, and uh, I have certainly uh, ruled on a number of habeas petitions, uh, but my experience really still grows much more uh, out of uh, my experience and practice litigating habeas cases. Now, my experience pales uh, in comparison uh, by a long shot, um, but I did manage, I'm quite proud to say, to win uh, some habeas cases, more than one even, um, but I can count those uh, on one hand. And I want to tee up uh, my proposal by providing uh, a little bit of background on one very narrow uh, aspect of the statute uh, of the uh, AEDPA. Uh, so just bear with me for a moment and I'll give you the context. In 1995, the Supreme Court decided a case called Schlup v. Delo. In that case, uh, the petitioner, the habeas petitioner, had been convicted of um, uh, stabbing a black inmate to death in a very racially charged uh, incident in prison. Uh, he was serving a sentence on another offense. He was, based, uh, he was sentenced to death. Uh, the conviction and sentence uh, rested entirely on the testimony of two corrections officers. There was no physical evidence that connected Schlup to the crime. There was no forensic evidence. Um, his defense was that he was actually innocent, that he had nothing to do with uh, the incident that uh, resulted in the death of the inmate. After his uh, conviction, uh, new evidence uh, emerged, and his position was that that new evidence supported his claim that he was actually innocent. Uh, that, innocent uh, that new evidence actually consisted of transcripts of interviews that were conducted in the days uh, immediately following the death of the inmate. Uh, and his view was that uh, they bolstered his claim uh, that he was not in the area of the prison uh, at, at a time when he could have committed the offense. He also provided as part of his claim, uh, his new evidence, that um, he, he provided affidavits from two uh, African-American inmates uh, who witnessed the murder of the other inmate and said that uh, the petitioner, Schlup, uh, did not commit the murder. In the case that resulted in the Supreme Court's review in 1995, it was his second, it was Schlup's second habeas petition. Uh, he was not able to raise um, uh, these case, these arguments uh, based on this new evidence because it did not exist at the time of his first habeas petition. It only came to light later. And consistent with what you've heard about the, the kind of procedural uh, complexities and proceduralization of the statute, that's a pretty important uh, detail in the case. Uh, and based on the new evidence, uh, the transcripts that emerged and the like, uh, in his second petition, the petitioner uh, sought to raise claims about Brady violations and ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, because he had not raised uh, these claims and evidence in his first petition, he was not able uh, to pursue them in a second under the governing law at the time. Uh, there were some exceptions to that. Uh, that did not apply, and the uh, argument in the case ultimately was over whether one of the exceptions, uh, the fundamental miscarriage of justice exception, applied and allowed him to bring uh, the claims. Now, one thing that's important to understand here is that although Schlup's uh, contention was that he did not commit the offense, that he was uh, actually innocent of the crime for which he had been convicted, uh, his claim in this case, again, uh, with consistent with the proceduralization of uh, the writ was not that he was entitled uh, to a writ because he was innocent. It was that because he was innocent, he was entitled to bring his Brady claim and his ineffective assistance of counsel claim. So it's a procedural argument for procedural review to get at uh, the constitutional violation or constitutional rights uh, at issue. 
So on review, the Supreme Court formally held that a petitioner who is sentenced to death and raises a claim of actual innocence to avoid a procedural bar to review on the merits of a constitutional claim must establish that it is more likely than not that no reasonable juror would have convicted in light of the new evidence. This standard uh, the Supreme Court held requires a stronger showing than prejudice, uh, but, less pro but, but a lesser showing than proof beyond a reasonable doubt, or I'm sorry, but, but a lesser showing than uh, clear and convincing evidence uh, that he would have been acquitted. So the issue uh, that I have arises in the, the wake of Schlup. Um, just, I think it's often important uh, when discussing these claims to take a step back for a moment and, and focus on the real people involved. And so I'll, I'll do that and step back into my proposal. Uh, so in 1995, the Supreme Court holds that Schlup can proceed with his claim based on uh, his argument of uh, new evidence that supports his claim of actual innocence. Uh, the following year, he was granted a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, he was um, uh, proceeded to a second trial in 1999, and on the second day of that trial, uh, pled guilty uh, to second degree murder, um, and so avoided the death penalty that way, uh, but did ultimately uh, plead guilty. So, so my proposal actually grows out of um, my representation of a gentleman named Alfred Cleveland. Uh, Alfred Cleveland was convicted of uh, murder, first degree murder in Lorain County. Um, the murder took place uh, in the early 1990s. He was convicted three years later in 1996 uh, at a trial based on the testimony of one witness. Uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you that Mr. Cleveland, uh, after his conviction, was sentenced to life in prison and um, uh, he did not commit that offense. He was factually innocent of the crime. Uh, what's more, um, to jump ahead a little bit, my co-counsel and I in the case were able to prove that on the, at the time of the offense, on the, at the moment it happened, he was in New York City, not in Lorain, Ohio. I got involved in the case after um, the court on which I now serve, uh, denied him a writ of habeas corpus on statute of limitations grounds. Uh, the Sixth Circuit uh, reversed on the basis of uh, a sloop showing that, uh, that he had made a colorable claim that he was actually innocent and was then able to proceed uh, to raise substantive claims of constitutional violations in the case. And that's the point at which I got involved and my co-counsel and I invested the case, uh, investigated the case, um, presented uh, evidence and arguments uh, in a federal habeas corpus evidentiary proceeding uh, in 2013. That's the proceeding at which we were able to uh, prove, in my view, my co-counsel would agree uh, that Mr. Cleveland was in New York City on the night of the murder, just flat out had nothing to do with it. Uh, we lost that case. The district court denied uh, the writ. And uh, uh, much to my surprise, uh, we were not able to appeal. Uh, the AEDPA uh, requires an uh, inmate to secure a um, certificate of appealability. That's uh, in section 2253C of the statute. That I knew. I figured we would get a, a, a certificate of appealability uh, to raise uh, those claims at the Sixth Circuit. Uh, we did not. We litigated that at the district court level, at the Sixth Circuit, at the Sixth Circuit en banc, uh, and in chambers with Justice Kagan, and lost at every step of the process. So although my client had... Um, uh, according to uh, a ruling of the Sixth Circuit, made a colorable showing that he may actually be innocent of the offense for which he was serving a life sentence. There was no right to review uh, that determination denying the writ. Whether you agree or disagree with the evidentiary showing uh, that my co-counsel and I made, uh, in my view, I thought then and I think now, 
that there ought at least to have been a forum to have a second look uh, when a claim of actual innocence uh, is on the line. But it's not just the claim. Again, it's important to understand that a, a court, and in this case, the Sixth Circuit, had uh, so found that there was a colorable showing. So in the wake of that experience, I've thought that a simple uh, proposal would be to uh, waive the um, certificate of appealability requirement once you've passed through uh, the Schlup gateway. That uh, petitioner would then have the right to appeal to the same extent uh, as uh, a respondent uh, who does not uh, prevail in habeas proceedings. That's the concept. I've actually, uh, for some time, played around with some language. I do have a slide uh, with the language. Not sure how to bring that up. So this is this is uh, section twenty two fifty three C in its entirety. Uh, the language, which I'm not wedded to, I've played around with a few different versions, is underlined uh, to add in there. In order, uh, upon the denial of a habeas petition, uh, to proceed to the Court of Appeals, a petitioner has to make a substantial showing of the denial of a constitutional right. And so my intent really would be simply to say um, that if you've gone through the Schlup gateway, if a court has already found that you've made a showing of actual innocence, that that, that requirement uh, is waived. Uh, I think it's a very modest proposal, as I indicated at the outset. Uh, at one point, I, I looked, I haven't in a few years, but there are not that many claims uh, that go through uh, the Schlup gateway. Uh, it's, it's, you know, probably literally, uh, you know, a dozen or so that I was able to find over about a six or eight year period. So it's really not that many. Um, so I don't think it's that much of a burden. I think it's a modest step that would recognize that we value uh, uh, claims of actual innocence in our uh, criminal justice system. I think uh, remarkably there's some question as to whether on the merits, um, if you're actually innocent of the offense for which you're convicted, that violates the Constitution. Uh, so again, the, the, the distinction would be if you're innocent and convicted at a fair trial, with no violation of your constitutional rights, you may not be entitled to a remedy. But you may be if uh, there was a Brady violation or you didn't receive the effective assistance of counsel or the like. At any rate, that's my proposal, and I'm happy to discuss that or any other uh, issues uh, shortly. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Um, before we get to the audience and chat, um, um, Q&A responses. I'd like to spend a few minutes um, with you to see if you have any reactions or responses to your co-panelists' um, presentations. Any reflections? Thanks, Paul. That's... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Mr. Morgan? Paul, you're muted. Uh, I like the judges for both. <laughs> you, you may be the first one. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Can I see if I can generate an a, a area of agreement between Paul and I? Uh, so, I, um, Paul, I, I think you've done a nice job explaining the arguments for why if a claim of constitutional error is reviewed with sufficient process and decided in state court why it may not make sense from a judicial resources or even a human knowledge standpoint to review that claim again in federal court, right? Like just serial relitigation doesn't give you a better answer unless there's some reason to believe the prior litigation wasn't procedurally sound. Um, but in situations where you're talking about applying uh, EDPA, and specifically, I know you're talking about 2254D, um, where you're talking about applying that when there has been no state process or where the state process was procedurally defective. Um, and 
would you do you also see a need to relax the relitigation bar a little bit in those types of situations? Well, I'm not quite sure when you say the state process was procedurally defective. If a process prevented somebody from raising an issue, for example, suppose the judge was brought. Uh, and there was no way you could expect the judge to put that on the record at his trial. And there was no way you could find that uh, fact out because uh, the judge was in cahoots with the prosecuting the attorney or the, the lawyers. Yeah, in that case, what you have is a constitutional claim that is so corruptive of what we had at the trial that, in essence, uh, you didn't get a trial. Well, how about this? Oh, sorry. In Tommy versus Ohio, the Supreme Court said the judge can't draw a salary based on the number of convictions that he makes. So if the judge can't be paid by the number of convictions, he certainly can't be paid uh, at the uh, retail level uh, for a judgment of conviction in one particular case. That's not a trial. Well, let's, I guess, let, let me ask something just a little bit more familiar or typical. Um, again, I, I think you've done a, you've done a, an admirable job, a good job of. Uh, I'm not trying to be damning with fan praise or obnoxious or anything like that. I don't, like I, 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 I see your. And, and I don't take it that way. Okay. Uh, but the, the justification you give for barring relitigation in federal court, in my view, that epistemic critique applies when you've had full and fair adjudication in state court. So take a situation where someone has their defense counsel is an insurance lawyer. Right. And then, you know, they don't they don't do any investigation. Um, and then you get into your state post conviction proceeding and then you get another insurance lawyer who doesn't know how to file a Sixth Amendment claim. Um, and then the prosecution writes the fine proposed findings, gives them to the state court and the state court adopts the prosecution's findings in toto, um, which is what happens in in Texas court quite a lot. Uh, and in, in that situation, do the predicates for the sorts of deference that you're describing in federal court, I mean, do, do you still want the deference in that sort of situation? Or would you concede that in a situation like that, if you were redrawing a new statute, maybe the rules would be a little bit different? Well, you know, the, the first question is this. Did he have a you know, reasonably competent lawyer? Uh, if you had a case like uh, United States versus Chronic, where someone was charged with fraud, the fact that the lawyer had practiced in that subject matter field for a long time, even though he'd never had a criminal case, uh, doesn't show that he was incompetent. I mean, that was the argument that Steve Duke made, that the, the lawyer was essentially incompetent by definition since he'd never had a criminal case before. And it gave rise to a very funny uh, event in the Supreme Court. Uh, he made that argument, and then Associate Justice Rehnquist said, well, you can't mean that. You remember what things were like in Alabama when I was a judge. As soon as you got sworn in as a member of the bar, he gave you an, an entire raft of cases to handle. And then Rehnquist said, I had a whole prison wing named after me. So yeah, uh, the idea that you need a, a quality lawyer is a good one, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need somebody who's long in the tooth in criminal cases. Now, if what you have is sort of a good old boy system, whereby uh, it's almost like the old vaudeville routine where the two comedians come out and one says 33 and the other says 47. They know the jokes so much and the line so well, they don't even need to say them, they just need to get numbers. Then you don't really effectively have a trial. And I think that's what you have to raise on direct appeal in the state system and then up to the Supreme Court. Or if it really is just a sham, then you have the, the argument that that this that it was entirely a sham. But you know, you've got a jury. They have to persuade the jury. And if the the defendant can't show that there was any difference in the evidence because he was caught red-handed, it's not clear to me that uh, what you what district court judges have told me is a slow guilty plea really is uh, unconstitutional. But I guess Paul, what I'm asking is if the Evidence of ineffective account assistance of counsel is outside the record. If they didn't investigate, you can't appeal that because the deficiency and the prejudice associated with that are totally outside the record. You have to have a collateral proceeding for that. 
And I just don't understand how we can talk about, like, oh, you could have presented this to the trial judge and, you know, then, then appeal it if that stuff is all outside the record, if the principles you're invoking would require an attorney to assert deficiency against herself. I mean, there just has to be a different enforcement regime for that type of thing than for the type of claim you're talking about, which is where you have an opportunity to give it to the trial judge and the appellate judge. I'm not, I don't want to... Yeah, no, no, I, I, I think I understand now better what you're getting at. Uh, yeah, I mean, if the government withholds evidence they should have disclosed uh, and you have a Brady violation, or if the lawyer was completely incompetent uh, and didn't do any investigation and the like, then because you have a guarantee that the government won't act that way and the lawyer won't act that way, you should have a vehicle for raising that. Uh, whether it's in the states or federal court, as long as you have some vehicle that that's satisfactory. If the state gives you a state habeas corpus claim and you can raise it there, that seems to me to satisfy whatever the Constitution would require. Okay. Thank you for that exchange. Um, um, Professor Carter, Judge Calabresi, do you have anything to add? Other other issues and other matters that, that you want to respond to or reflect upon? All right, let's turn it to the audience now. Um, anyone here have any questions or comments? Maybe you didn't serve enough coffee at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> here it comes. I think there are a few in the chat as well. So our second panel today discussed um, for a bit uh, the gatekeeping function that EDPA does serve, um, and the ADA commented that he thinks that gate gatekeeping function is necessary to a certain extent. Um, and uh, the other party did kind of agree with that as well, that um, cases can get lost in the shuffle. Um, so I'm curious, and I think uh, Judge Calabrese's uh, proposal does go to this a bit, but how um, when we're looking at reforming EDPA, we can recenter things from um, uh, looking at the procedures that were and weren't followed to get into the actual merits of the cases. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, so I will say one of my preliminary views that I have formed on the bench is that I agree that the gatekeeping function is necessary and appropriate. Um, uh, and I, I know that Judge Moore is in the audience. I uh, think that uh, the certificate of appealability does serve some uh, salutary function that way. You know, one of the concerns that I, I, mean, I share overall the goal of getting to less procedural review and more merits review uh, in this and a few other contexts as well for various reasons. I, I think it becomes a little bit tricky. I guess the one thing I would put on the, the table uh, in response to what Mr. Larkin was suggesting is probably an additional argument on his side as a matter of federal constitutional law. Now, if there's fed, fed courts professors in the room, I'm gonna really open up a can of worms here, but uh, as, as a matter of Article Three, in my view, um, the state courts are presumed to be equally as competent uh, and capable of indicating federal constitutional rights as the federal courts are. So I think that adds um, a, a significant procedural wrinkle. And I'm not sure I have any better answer for you ultimately other than um, as between developing a uh, complicated web of procedural knots and arguments that are most often used to avoid getting to the merits. Um, you know, in, in my view, you just need some, some judgment at the end of the day as to when uh, the, the exchange that we just saw is, is furthering um, those interests of, of uh, comedy, federalism, and finality, and when it's being used uh, to avoid review on the merits. Can I, can I add, add something to that? I, I've never thought the certificate of appealability issue made a whole lot of sense. Uh, in part because uh, the people that wrote it didn't think about how the actors in the system will respond. When Congress passed the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984, uh, it said you needed the personal approval of the Solicitor General in order for the government to take an appeal to a circuit court to challenge a sentence. 
You had 10 days to file a notice of appeal. Okay? You couldn't even get the transcript of the sentencing hearing in 10 days. So the result was every time, and I know this well because I handled all the sentencing appeals from November 1 of 87 when the law went into effect through 93. So what happened was every time the U.S. attorney wanted to appeal, they would tell us and we would just automatically file a notice of appeal and then decide later whether to prosecute it because we only had, we had an impossible deadline to meet. And the problem here is you're forcing judges to decide whether they should entertain an appeal before they know anything about the case. And so a lot of them will just automatically give you a certificate of appealability and I can't blame them for it. And you don't, you shouldn't adopt rules that make sense without thinking about how people are going to respond to the rule. And they're going to respond to the rule that way. And that completely defeats the purpose of the rule. So why do it? I do agree. Maybe two brief comments. One, again, I haven't had that many cases on the federal bench yet, but I've not yet issued a certificate of appealability. That goes to that screening or gatekeeping function. But it does also, very much my experience in practice, was lead to a collateral round of litigation, you know, generally to a motions panel at the Court of Appeals. In the Fifth Circuit, I mean, just to speak to it, I actually agree with, you know, Mr. Larkin 100% on this particular issue. I can say I think the practice and COA practice varies a lot across appellate jurisdictions. For example, the Fifth Circuit almost always denies COA and people on the defense side are furious about it. But at the same time, when they deny COA in capital cases, it doesn't even go to the motions panel. It gets full plenary review by a three-judge panel if it's a capital case. So you're basically getting the same review you would have gotten anyway. So I think you use a nice word, salutary effect to the grant of the COA. There's some symbolic effect, especially when the case goes up on cert for a COA to have been granted and then denied on the merits. But, you know, I'm not sure in the end how different the treatment of the case is, at least in the appeals court, in capital cases. It may be very different in non-capital cases. But the COA requirement seems to not do that much for me. The one thing I would really like to see is you have, I mean, so the reality of AEDPA was, the legislative history was Timothy McVeigh detonates the Oklahoma City, the bomb at the Oklahoma City building in 1995, I think. And this is just after Newt Gingrich and the Compact with America Republicans sweep into power. It's the first time they've held Congress in 40 years. And there's kind of like this, they realize they're going to get to stick everything in this piece of legislation that's going to sail through Congress. And they have a very tough on crime president, Clinton there, who's going to sign it. And so, you know, they hit the drafting room because they want to get it on this particular piece of anti-terrorist legislation. They basically craft all these legislative provisions really quickly. And it's really disjointed. So like whatever you think about the merit of procedural restrictions, it would be nice if those procedural restrictions were like synced up so they didn't create these like weird procedural anomalies, such as the one that's being litigated in Shin versus Ramirez. Like another problem is if you take seriously the idea that you might be able to present a claim to the court but not introduce evidence in support of that claim, even if you satisfy the Schlupp gateway for actual innocence, you might have overwhelming evidence that you're actually innocent, but then you would be foreclosed by the evidentiary hearing provision from presenting that evidence. Like that can't be, like no rational person would intend that. And no court would uphold that if actually confronted with it. So it seems like there at least has to be some tinkering with the procedural provisions to harmonize them a little bit. There was another question up here. Want to go to the, any questions in the chat? Or do we have? This question was submitted when Professor Carter was doing his presentation, but it could be for anyone. Should prisons be required to provide real useful training to inmates or inmate law clerks on the complex issues of EDPA and the PLRA? 
Uh, I, can, I can respond briefly again with the caveat that this is not my area of deep expertise. Should they be required? That That is a bridge I don't know that I'm quite ready to walk across. It implicates uh, a lot of things that require a lot of thought. Um, then the question would be, if they choose to do so, would it be beneficial? Or should it be provided to inmates or counsel? I have an alternate proposal uh, quoting one of my students' papers in my uh, seminar this semester who proposed a core of lawyers that are funded to handle and specialize only in inmate prisoner litigation. Um, so a sort of um, civilian core of lawyers who can build that big, deep uh, bench of expertise to really deal with the degree of complexity that these kinds of cases present. Um, so that's one alternative that might achieve the same goal. other responses or reactions to that question? I mean, it, it implicates how you think about, I mean, one of the things about this conversation, it's actually one of the reasons I'm really glad that you're on the panel is because how we think of the, the resources we give to people to litigate their grievance cases and against their convictions is part of a broader rethinking of our attitude towards prison okay, and I'm, uh, I mean, we're in a pretty sad place right now in terms of how we think about reintegration and re-entry. Um, and I, I want to know, I, I like you don't know, well, I know where I want to go with that, actually. But <laughs> um, I, I do think there's, like, this gets swept in the broader rethinking of, of what we're doing with people when we deposit them in America's prisons. We have 2.3 million people in custody. And like, what obligations do we have to them when we put them there? Um, not just to treat them well and keep them alive while they're there, but to facilitate their re-entry into society, and, and those questions are related. Um, can, I, can I just throw something in? Excuse me. You're talking about money. I think a better use of whatever money you would use to fund the in-prison lawyer you're talking about would be to give it to public defenders so that they can hire an additional lawyer and reduce the caseloads that they have. Or they can hire an investigator who can actually go out and do the investigation. I, at the front end of the process, these people haven't been convicted of anything. And I think you know every dollar you spend on the back end is one less dollar that you, that you, uh, that you can spend on the front end. And that's where the money really needs to go. Why not both? OK. <laughs> um, another question, unless we have any other, from the audience first. Um, so this. I have a question. It's Nancy King. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, it's Nancy. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Mr. Larkin, uh, I, I agree with you uh, about uh, what might be a, uh, a advisable spending policy uh, is to really invest in the front end more than you do today, uh, and and not concentrate so much on the back end, where it's far too late for. Uh, most people and doesn't touch the mass of people who are incarcerated and involved in the criminal justice system who don't stay in prison long enough to seek post conviction relief. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I too like the judge's proposal about uh, certificates of appealability. I think uh, it's important to focus on innocence. And you know, it's not something every federal judge agrees should be the subject of habeas scrutiny, but um, I think that needs to change. It's changing slightly over time, and uh, we'll see if there is more, more developments in that direction. Anyway, I just, I just wanted to indicate my agreement with those points. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you both for your uh, contributions, and for everyone on the panel, it's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have about two minutes remaining. Um, well, I'll, so my, my question is basically um, 2254 has that sort of adjudication on the merits requirement. And I'm curious, um, you know, what precisely does that mean? And do we have a high enough standard for what adjudication on the merits at the state level is um, to actually effectuate EDPA's goal? Can I keep on looking at you again? Uh, <laughs> Well, um, I think the standard for adjudication on the merits is actually exceedingly low. Um, I think that is 
as the Supreme Court is increasingly gravitated towards Mr. Larkin's sort of view about what habeas should be, there's been a sort of retrenchment. And if you believe there's been an adjudication on the merits, that's what triggers all of this philosophy about how additional increments of process aren't going to yield any additional truth. Um, and so I think there's been this push to say, okay, even if it's a little questionable about whether the merits have been decided or like we're going to have to make some inferences about like what was the court actually deciding when it put out this decision we're going to say it was deciding the merits because the second you say you decided the merits then you said okay like a, a jurisdictionally competent court has issued potentially preclusive judgment under the full you know that gets full faith and credit under our you know our federalism um, and so i i think it's as a descriptive matter, the threshold is getting lower. Um, personally, I think it's too low, um, uh, but I don't think I'm surprising anybody. Um, well, we'll let that be the last word, and we want to thank the panelists again for your time and your thoughts. <laughs> thank you. Um, do we do a break now, or? All right, we'll take a short break. And we'll be reconvening for the final panel, I believe, at 3 o'clock? At 3 o'clock. Are you excited for this weekend? Recording stops. Right after this, we're going to do our first run through and actually use the easel and stuff to actually physically see it. <laughs> <laughs>
it's in Michigan, so especially in the upper peninsula. <laughs> so funny. Yeah, very funny. So you're judging this weekend? Or you're just a, are you observing or what? Yeah, I think I'm just going to observe. Okay. See, um, until they have emergency, you need to judge. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be yeah, like easy. Sunday easy. afternoon may be the case. <laughs> See, the thing is that, like, I came out specifically to watch Adam. Oh. Um, I was because. I think I'm not practicing. Is he? Yeah. I don't think I would have gotten through the rail without him. Um, he was. So, came out to watch him. I did get a text from him the other day that was like, Sean, that's going to persuade me. Okay, but like I'm gonna watch you at least once, so like we'll see. But then, like, have you heard? Um, I don't have any I don't really honestly know much about how it all works. I still don't understand what responsibilities are us, and what responsibilities. I just know there were two, and they couldn't be one, so not zero. I don't really know why. Yeah, so last year we had a situation like that where there was an odd number of teams going into competition. And like literally the week before, maybe two weeks before, they were like, um, to Otto and I's team, split. So Otto and I were going to have to litigate both sides of the case. And um, our co counselors our our partners, we're going to have to litigate both sides of the case. And I'd rather just do my side work, just me. Personally, see, yeah, <laughs> but see, not see. than my current. But I mean, rather than litigate right. both sides, I guess, yeah. Right. Anyways, well, at such short notice, but it's a it's an accommodation that they made, right? Because okay. they were like, oh, we messed up, so we got to split the team. Otto has been trying in like every way, like the you know, suggest a way to split it, for him to litigate with them. Yeah. But the judges are just like a number of teams, like his team, neither of you. And it makes me so. So, so I also might not judge just because. Surely this thing is not no ever. It's like it's, it's, it's pretty much everything. Everything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, let me first introduce uh, our panel. Sitting immediately to my right is my uh, former colleague on this faculty, Judge Karen Nelson Moore of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Uh, I could take up uh, the entire time talking about her, but uh, let me just say that uh, uh, Judge Moore uh, taught procedure and tax law, um, and she may have been the only person in the room who understood my, my tax reference to uh, uh, one of the earlier speakers. Um, she uh, is a grad twice a graduate of Harvard University, uh, was an editor of the Harvard Law Review, clerked uh, on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, in addition to teaching here, she was a visiting professor at Harvard Law School uh, and was a much admired uh, teacher uh, while she was here. Uh, beside her is uh, Judge Solomon Oliver, Jr., who is former chief judge of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. Uh, before going on to the bench, uh, Judge Oliver also was a law professor uh, down the street at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, where he was also associate dean. Uh, earlier, he had been an assistant U.S. attorney here in the Northern District, uh, was chief first of that office's civil division, then of its appellate division. Uh, Judge Oliver uh, has also taught political science at the College of Worcester, where he is a member of the Board of Trustees, I believe. Um, and uh, he clerked for the legendary Judge William Hasty of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Uh, our other speaker is joining us remotely uh, from Dayton, uh, Magistrate Judge Michael Murs of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Ohio, uh, where he has been uh, on the bench since 1984. Uh, before that, he was a judge of the Dayton Municipal Court, and he was a, a lawyer with a leading Dayton firm before his appointment to the bench. Uh, Judge Murs has never been a full-time law professor, but he is a long-time adjunct professor at both the University of Dayton uh, and at Capital University. Um, the way we're going to handle this is we will begin with Judge Murs, uh, who will have some remarks focused primarily on, on the AEDPA, and then we'll go to Judge Oliver, who will talk mainly about the, the PLRA, uh, and then Judge Moore will wrap things up for us. So Judge Moore, take it away. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, I am humbled to be uh, involved in a panel, not just this panel, but the whole symposium, with people who know and has, have had much more experience uh, than I have. Well, I hope uh, intense judicial experience may bring something to this. Uh, the Southern District of Ohio has been for many years among the top five capital petitioner districts in the country. So there were a lot of capital cases in Southern Ohio. Let you all guess as to why that is. Well, we do and have had. Uh, I, had I had my first capital previous case in 1995. Since then, I've had more than 50 of them beginning in 2000, all in the Western Division of the Southern District, and a few years after that, picking up some from the Eastern Division as well. Um, and Dennis Torres mentioned earlier that there was a magistrate judge somewhere in the state who's managing the legal injection litigation, and that's me. I've had the management of that case uh, since uh, October of 2016. Uh, we have been in that case to the Sixth Circuit uh, at least six times and several times to the Supreme Court. It gives me a pretty good perspective to talk about the difference between 1983 litigation and habeas litigation and also the difference between capital and non-capital litigation. Um, the AEDPA, I don't know what it's done for terrorism, but it has not made the death penalty in America any more effective. In fact, it's provided ways to slow executions. 
I won't say whether I'm in favor of that or against it. That would be injudicious. But it has uh, uh, the part of the statute that was supposed to make the death penalty more effective, Chapter 154, which was based on proposals Justice Powell made when he was president of the ABA, has been completely dead left. Uh, it requires certification uh, of compliance with certain standards in the prosecution of death penalty cases. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, nobody, no state has sought that certification for many years, and no state has ever gotten it. So whatever the, uh, there was some conversation earlier about purposive, purposive interpretation of statutes, whatever the purpose of Chapter 154 was, it has been completely uh, negated by its lack of use. In Woodson versus North Carolina, the Supreme Court uh, uttered the phrase, which is always quoted to me at least 15 times in any capital case, and that is that death is different. And I want to suggest two ways in which death is different. First of all, several speakers have talked about the value of having more upfront uh, uh, funding of attorneys in these cases. Um, the capital habeas unit of the Southern District of Ohio, and there's also a capital habeas unit in the Northern District, is the most prepared, eloquent, strategic bunch of lawyers it has ever been my pleasure to work with as, um, as a judge. The Attorney General's side of the case is also uh, managed by and litigated by folks who've been specialists. In, in general, in this country, we've wanted judges to be generalists, and I spent most of my career doing anything that uh, came down the pike, but I've been able to specialize in habeas corpus for the last eight years, and with the capital for the ex, uh, lethal injection case uh, for the last five years, and I think specialization adds something. It certainly has added uh, enormously to the expertise of the lawyers litigating the uh, legal injection case. In, in contrast, as many have mentioned, uh, there are there are rarely lawyers in the non-capital habeas cases. I, I happen to have a habeas case pending with an imprisoned lawyer who's pro se, but other than that, most of them have no training. You can tell from case to case that the same jailhouse lawyer might be involved because of peculiar misspellings. But, uh, but by and large, uh, the, the uh, non-capital habeas cases uh, exemplify in every instance the over-proceduralization of habeas corpus that the AEPPA has uh, strengthened, not created. Uh, talk a little bit about the history, as I understand it, of habeas. I do not regard AEPPA as some do as a, uh, a remarkable change in habeas corpus procedure, because I think it, it, uh, it merely accelerated a change that was coming. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Larkin mentioned Brown versus Allen as the case which expanded habeas to all constitutional claims. Uh, he didn't mention what is my favorite quotation from Justice Jackson's dissent, uh, and that is that uh, he who must search a haystack for a needle is likely to end up with the attitude that the needle is not worth the search. If you have to wade and wade and wade and wade and wade through uh, points that are uh, uh, frivolous uh, over and over again, you come, to, you come to doubt whether there's any meat in the sandwich. Uh, an example about that that hasn't been talked about is actual innocence. Uh, uh, Judge Calabrese and I wholly support his proposal about 2253C. Judge Calabrese talked about Schlup versus Dilo and, and the actual innocence exception. And in a case like the one he mentioned, where 
there's someone who probably is actually innocent, and, and I, one thinks of the House versus Bell case as well. Uh, it's easy to see the importance of pursuing that, maybe even to the point of recognizing actual innocence as a constitutional claim stands alone. The court hasn't done that yet, but it could. But looking for actual innocence, when one reviews uh, 40 cases a year in which everybody claims to be actually innocent, it gets you into a frame of mind of rather rotely reciting the criteria from Schlup and, and from the Sixth Circuit's instantiation of the Schlup standard in a case called Souter versus Jones, and telling people, you know, the fact that you don't believe you're guilty, or that one of the people who testified against you has recanted, doesn't amount to reliable new evidence from reliable eyewitnesses or physical evidence or DNA evidence, for example. So I, I understand uh, the, I understand, first of all, the, the motivation, I think the motivation for why the court continued after Brown versus Allen to expand the jurisdiction. I think it was largely because Justice Brennan felt the need to have some lower court judges who could enforce the Warren, and I would say also Brennan, court expansion of constitutional rights. Look at the, look at the major cases decided early on in the 1960s. Uh, Mack versus Ohio, 61. Gideon, and remember Gideon was pro se until he got to the Supreme Court, and I think Gabe Fortas took the case over. Gideon is 63. Miranda is 66. Aguilar is 64. Malloy on privilege against self-incrimination is 64. Duncan, the right to jury trial in a serious criminal case, 68. There was, despite the fact that the Supreme Court at the time was deciding roughly twice as many cases in a term as it is today, uh, there's no way the Supreme Court could take every one of the petitions for cert where somebody said, you know, the Court of Appeals didn't get this quite right, help us enforce it. And that's why uh, I believe uh, the court did in, what it did in 63, which really has expanded the procedure as far as it's ever gone. Uh, Townsend versus Sane uh, essentially gave practically every habeas petitioner the right to an evidentiary hearing, and where there wasn't a right, it was discretion anyway. Fay versus Noya decided the same day, said there's no, in the, we're not going to block you out of habeas corpus on the basis of some procedural default, unless the state can prove you deliberately bypassed a available state procedure. I believe the history of habeas corpus since then, at least since since uh, Justice Rehnquist became chief, can be seen as a largely successful rollback of the broad scope of habeas created by the Warren Brennan Court. Already in 76, you had Stone versus Powell, which essentially removes Fourth Amendment claims from our jurisdiction. Uh, <clears throat> already in 71, you had the exhaustion requirement in the card. In 77, Justice O'Connor introduces in Wainwright versus Sykes, the strong uh, procedural default doctrine uh, that essentially continues today. AEDPA just accelerated that, that change. Of course, people have mentioned the one year statute of limitations. Uh, for the first time, we have something like Restudicata in habeas with uh, no second or successive petition without approval of the uh, Court of Appeals. And, and we have the explicit deference to state court decisions unless they're unreasonable. No one's mentioned this before, but some distinguished appellate judges have raised the point that uh, making us look only to holdings of Supreme Court decisions uh, is arguably a violation of separation of powers, and at the very least limits judges uh, looking at constitutional law uh, much more than they would be in any other area. even under uh, uh, 1983. Um, so the uh, ADPA took us uh, some substantial way beyond where we were, but I think it's the same art. 
as under the Rehnquist court, and it involves far too much proceduralization. And I long felt it was an interesting question of justice, why a guy, or gal, I presume we have no women on death row in Ohio, but why a guy who's sentenced to death should have two very fine, well-financed lawyers who do nothing else with their lives, whereas the guy sentenced to life without parole gets nothing but a jailhouse lawyer and a pad of paper to write on. So those are my observations about AEDPA, and I will turn it back to you, John. Thank you, Judge Wurz. Judge Oliver? Thank you, Professor Anton. This has been a wonderful program. I, I've enjoyed it. You know, as a, a judge, we're sitting there on the bench and we're working on cases. And we really need to be exposed more to professors who think about these things every day and the practitioners who spend a lot of their time working on these issues. Uh, that's important, I think. And so I've enjoyed the opportunity to hear presenters who, who appeared here, here today. And I congratulate a lot of you and, and those who assisted you on putting on this, this program. Um, so as a district judge, we have a number of pro se cases, but by far the largest number would come from the PLRA litigation and also from uh, the Habeas litigation. Uh, it may be helpful to know how we organize and then I'll make some comments uh, to handle these cases. Um, in the North District of Ohio, we have uh, habeas cases, uh, except for the death penalty cases, to go to the magistrate judges, like Judge Murs. And Judge Murs, as you can see, has a tremendous experience in this area. And so that uh, lures to the benefit uh, of the bench there and out to the bar. Uh, I'm not sure we have anybody, I'm sure we don't, that has as much experience as he has, but with most of our magistrate judges, have significant experience, and of course they see these cases uh, day in and day out. Uh, the death penalty cases, the habeas death penalty cases, we don't um, uh, refer to those to the magistrate judge. We handle those uh, ourselves, uh, and so uh, unlike the Southern District where Judge Murs, Magistrate Judge Murs, hearing the death penalty cases, we hear those that are assigned uh, to us. We do have for our assistance a death penalty uh, habeas law clerk. And so at least we don't have just the law clerks that we turn over every year, those of us who do every year or two, working on those cases. I heard someone refer this morning to the fact that you're a law clerk, you're there for two years, uh, the judge gives a file to you, then you give the file to the next law clerk, and so it may, may be delayed that way. So we, we, we have some delay because the cases are difficult. And you saw the size of the transcripts and all the other aspects of the record that Dennis Perez talked about this morning. He talked about a record that was some 2,200 pages. And so it is a slow and tedious process, but each of the district judges would spend time uh, on those cases with assistance uh, of drafting from a pro, uh, pro se death penalty law clerk, and that's how we would uh, do those cases. On the PLRA uh, front, the way we have all is we have, as you, you saw from literature, if you've read it or if you have experience, we have a screening process. And there, again, we have five um, law clerks, pro se law clerks, and they screen the cases when they come in. And then they draft for us, if they think it's a frivolous case, they will draft an order for us. If they think it's not, then they will indicate that, and then we should go ahead and have the case um, the, the, the complaint served and the case would move, move from there. And then after um, that happens, then it will be strictly up to my chambers and my law clerks to work the case, case from there. So that's the process that we have. We do have um, pro, uh, pro bono attorney panel, but I must tell you, we really have uh, not a very significant number of lawyers on that. And uh, so when I look down the list to try to find someone where, when I've got a case where I say, it looks like now this one uh, should be moving forward. It'd be nice to have a lawyer on it. It's, it. We just have such a dearth of lawyers that could hardly find anyone to do those cases or any others. 
And so I think that's an area that we do need to address in our own district, is to perhaps do something like I understand they do in Illinois, that when you sign on, for example, um, uh, to the bar of that jurisdiction, that there is some requirement that you at least commit to do a case or something like that. It may not be enough, but we need to find a way to get more of our lawyers volunteering to serve on pro bono panels to hear uh, the pro se cases. You've heard uh, uh, how this works. Uh, all the PLRA cases are going to be essentially pro bono cases. And all of the habeas cases, except uh, those in death penalty, are going to be without lawyers. And so it's, and yet they have some of the most complicated procedures and limitations that exist in regard to any category of cases. And, and, and yet we, we expect them to, 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 to jump through those hoops. You heard uh, this morning, uh, and of course many of you, have, some of you worked in the area, and some of you as students that maybe don't have the exposure, and so we're talking to an audience that, that ranges in that regard. But you heard um, some of the limitations in the PLRA area, uh, but one of, the, one of the ones is that uh, indigent litigants or prisoners have to pay their own filing fee, unlike in other um, uh, phone poppers cases. And so if they don't have the money and they're not likely to have it, then they start drawing 20% monthly uh, of their um, whatever they get from commissary, whatever work they, they do there. So they, they have that obligation. So again, that's something that would serve as a deterrent. Uh, also, they have this three, I don't think people talk too much this morning about three strikes rule, but they have that. So that uh, if you file three cases that have been previously dismissed on the grounds of being frivolous or malicious or fails to state a claim, uh, then you cannot file another case uh, again. You can't find another case unless you can show that you're in imminent danger of serious physical injury. And then you heard the other limitations. You can't sue for emotional harm or recover for emotional harm unless you show physical injury. And then we heard some of the ridiculous fact patterns that were discussed where uh, until there was a, a change in the law in Congress that um, courts were holding with, was not physical injury. And so those kinds of limitations are there. And you heard this morning a good discussion about the exhaustion requirement and how that really was really the, the biggest impediment in terms of um, uh, litigation in, in this area. And so uh, and there been some discussion about changes and so forth. Um, so I, I, think those, I think the discussion on, on those things has been quite adequate uh, in my estimation. Um, there... Uh, we do, we do need to do something about uh, getting some attorney um, involvement in these areas. Uh, and perhaps uh, we can do it in our district, but perhaps there should be some natural, uh, national attention to getting uh, something like the Federal Public Defense Office involved, at least in the cases that look like they may go somewhere. Now, how, how, would you, how do you decide that? Well, we had COVID cases. Um, that we've been dealing with. They were not 2241 cases, the kind they were talking about this morning. Uh, but uh, they were cases on the 18 United States Code, Section 3582. That, those are the kind of COVID cases that we heard most of, uh, not 2241. And that's where, uh, if there are extraordinary and compelling reasons warrant a reduction in sentence, uh, then the court can grant it. Uh, and it can do that if it's consistent with applicable policy statements issued by the Sentencing Commission. And so, um, so we, worked, we, we were working through those cases and some, some people were, were released on those, those grounds. Uh, and what we did there, uh, I'm not sure it can serve as a model, but there were a lot of pro se uh, filings. And so we got the Federal Public Defender's Office to agree that they would do some screening and that at least in those cases that they saw that had potential merit, that they would take on representation or file a supplemental brief. And in other cases, they, they did not. They would just say, we're not, they wouldn't opine on, on what the outcome should be, but they, but they would uh, agree to take those. We, we need to develop some meaningful way of handling those, these kinds of cases, because they're far, far too complex, just procedurally. 
Um, and yet, and because I, I think everybody's, people who, who talk about these things today have acknowledged that there are a lot of cases, there are a flood of cases, there are a lot of frivolous cases. As a judge sitting there, I can attest to that. And so we can't deny that, that there are a lot of cases filed that really shouldn't be there, that, that, are, that shouldn't be in court. And the question is, how do we have sufficient screens or lens to get rid of those cases, but not lose the cases that should obviously be there and ought to be litigated? And I think that's where sometimes we're losing out now, because that we don't have uh, adequate processes to make sure that those who do have legitimate claims uh, get to, to pursue them. So uh, I, I'm not going to say too much more about PLRA other than uh, I endorse the concerns that were raised, most of the concerns that were raised about uh, the limitations there, whether they are two owners without at least uh, some ability to have an attorney, and that those that restrict uh, attorney fees to, to certain amounts, uh, or that's not reasonable, and that we ought to have some, some, uh, some other uh, changes in that statute. The one suggested by Professor uh, Slane this morning regarding um, exigencies or emergency circumstances, for example, I think that would be, be a good one also. I wanted to raise just one uh, quickly, one thing in the area of the uh, Havis, uh, Havis area uh, with you, and that had to do with um, successive petitions uh, and successive petitions in regard to Brady claims. And I think most of you know, uh, the lawyers certainly do, Brady versus Maryland was decided in 1963 and basically involved suppression of um, evidence favorable to the defendant uh, by the government. And, and so those claims uh, often are uh, raised in successive petitions because the defendant would not have the ability to, to, to know about uh, those, uh, the, the, the predicate for those claims. And so they, they often brought in that context. And when you're brought, when it's brought a successive petition, uh, as many of you know, that means that you have a more onerous uh, standard than you would have if uh, it had been filed in the first petition. In the first petition, uh, the standard is that, that um, the writ shall not be granted if um, the case was adjudicated on the merits unless it resulted in a decision that was contrary to or involved in unreasonable application of clearly established federal law. And, and, or result in a decision that was based on an unreasonable determination of facts. But if you, um, uh, if you go to, to the um, successive petition uh, section, uh, basically uh, says uh, two things. That um, you can't bring a claim if, if you had a previous habeas petition unless you show that the factual predicate for the claim reasonably could not have been discovered at the time of the initial petition, and two, that the previously undiscovered facts have shown to be true suffice to prove uh, actual innocence by clear and convincing evidence. That's essentially what's required. And so, uh, and, and so often these claims are brought, uh, successive petitions are attempted to be brought in that context. And the question is, should they should they be should they be considered successive petitions? The law now is pretty clearly that they, they are, but the question is whether there is the movement which which I see in some of the cases, not really decisions, but what some of the judges are willing to say is suggestive that the law should be changed or that the law the law could be changed through the courts themselves or whether it should be changed legislatively. And 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 uh I don't want to take uh, too much more time because I think my time is probably um, running, running out. But I, I do want to, I think it's worth uh, laying this out. There was a case called Panetti versus Quarterman, a Supreme Court case, uh, 551 U.S. 930. It goes back to 2007. It was a Supreme Court case, and it concluded that a second in time petition was not a second or successive petition because it involved a death row inmate 
who could not be, um, uh, well, the sentence could not be carried out because it would be unconstitutional. He had that constitutional right. But he didn't raise it in his first petition, and now he's raising it in his second petition. The Supreme Court said that's not a successive petition. Special facts there included the fact that he became insane after his first petition. And so the Supreme Court, uh, after analyzing the situation, concluded that it was not, it was second in time, but not a successive petition. And so some of the circuit courts, uh, at least in concurring opinions and dissenting opinions, it suggested that Brady versus Maryland claims that a broad successive petition should not be considered second. And they're trying to do that by, by, by analogy to, uh, to the uh, Panetti versus Quarterman case. And so there was, just to put them on the record uh, here in terms of what those cases are, one case uh, where there's an concurrent opinion is Long versus Hooks, 972 Fed 3rd, 442, the Fourth Circuit, uh, 2020 en banc decision, concurrent opinion by Judge Wynn. And uh, there, the case that I've seen that have gone the furthest in this regard uh, is a case called um, Scott versus United States, 890, Fed 3rd, 1239, 11th Circuit, uh, 2018. It's a 2255 case, so it's a federal case, but analogous to 2254. And in that case, the three-judge panel acknowledged that they uh, had to affirm a district court who denied the writ, but they spent their entire opinion uh, arguing why it is that this should not be considered a successive petition, and urging their court to take up this case in bond so that um, uh, so, so the court could reverse the prior reasoning in, in that, that circuit. Uh, and so those are two of the cases uh, where even though current opinion and the other was an opinion where they affirm uh, they're suggesting that there's something special about Brady claims. The Brady claims go to the heart of the judicial process and the heart of, of fairness. And that when, uh, when, court, when uh, prosecutors have not turned over the, the information, they cannot be heard to cry uh, that this somehow affects finality, uh, the, the, the issue of finality and so forth. Uh, they, they, they do some uh, reasoning by uh, comparison to the Quarterman case uh, in these cases, uh, and uh, I'm just touching the surface with this, but, but the suggestion is that um, when defendants in a Brady context cannot know about the information and they cannot proceed with it, it's not their fault, why should they be disadvantaged? Uh, you know, relative to the standard that would normally apply when, in fact, uh, the state has affirmatively uh, refused to provide them the information uh, that they, uh, they would be entitled to. I, it's not enough time to really go into a comparison of those cases and the arguments to Panetti versus Quarterman, but I think it's interesting development uh, in literature and in terms of the cases and, and something that... Uh, Perhaps uh, has some leg, may have some legs uh, down the road. Thank you, Judge Oliver. Uh, Judge Ward. It's delightful to be here, and given that I was a law school professor here for 18 years, I'm especially happy to be back in the courtroom and to be joining you, students and faculty, and uh, others who are here. Um, the topics that we have for today, the PLRA and EDPA, are really very difficult and complicated areas. And um, I think we can see that in so many of these decisions that come out of the different courts. And I wanted, before I, before I forgot, to um, mention the case that the, the situation that Judge Oliver was talking about involving uh, brain claims that arise after someone um, has filed their first habeas petition. Normally, the second and successive rules would apply. And I think Judge Oliver is raising a very significant question on that, and one that I was tangling with in the Sixth Circuit, and uh, recently wrote a um, dissenting opinion in a case called Hannah 
um, which in which I argue that we should um, allow such a claim to be called simply second in time and not second or successive, um, but but uh, recognizing um, the error of my own ways in a previous case. Um, so we we sometimes um, face the questions about how to interpret these very complicated statutory provisions and realize um, with the benefit of further thinking and, and further briefing in, in another case that, that we should look more carefully. And so you might, you might wonder then, why do we have such complicated statutes, the two, the PLRA and, and EDPA? Um, what was the purpose of Congress 25 years ago in writing the statutes this way? And what is the purpose of the different federal courts, and in particular the Supreme Court, in its interpretations of the requirements? So to look at EDPA um, a little bit, uh, EDPA really was the effort to restrict habeas. Um, as uh, Judge Merz points out, the Rehnquist Court was restricting habeas from what it had been under the Warren Court, um, but EDPA then imposed new statutory limits. And the limits involved imposing procedural hurdles, um, such as query whether it's procedural or substantive, the statute of limitations. So there was no statute of limitations before EDPA came around. Instead, the doctrines, equitable doctrines, such as latches, were applied. But EDPA gives us a one-year statute of limitations. And it's complicated as to how you count that year. So some of the previous speakers have spoken about you know, how do you reach the 365 days. Then there's the question whether the courts can allow for equitable tolling. And that was an unanswered question until certain cases came about, including a case um, that I worked on on the circuit a long time ago, which is one of my um, favorite cases to bring out, Souter versus Jones, which did allow equitable tolling, and it turned out that the individual was, in fact, actually innocent, that an expert uh, had recanted, and normally witnesses recanting courts, trial courts are pretty reluctant to give any credence to that, but this was an expert witness who recanted, and another witness came forward, and the man who had been in uh, prison for 14 years for uh, killing a um, young woman, in fact, had not killed her um, and was was let out. And, and later on, the lawyers in that case sent word to the panel that the uh, man was, was given um, money pursuant to the Michigan um, <coughs> state law compensating people for wrongful uh, imprisonment. We also have, as a procedural uh, Rule in EDPA, the requirement of uh, denying that federal courts must deny unexhausted claims unless there's an absence of available state process. And we've heard in the earlier uh, sessions about the recent Supreme Court case that says there must be an available process. But what we haven't really explored in depth is how detailed the state grievance procedures are and how easy it is for prisoners to trip up on meeting those grievance requirements. So in the four states in the Sixth Circuit, there are varying numbers of days, depending on which state you're in, uh, in which you must file your first grievance about something that's happened to you in prison. And if you don't file that step one grievance within those few days, and literally it's less than a week, then you are out of luck because the Boston procedure, the grievance procedure was available to you, you just didn't file your grievance. Now, there can be explanations, there can be equitable reasons that should apply, but unlikely in, in the vast range of cases. And then if you don't get a resolution of your step one, you must seek step two. If you do get an adverse resolution of step one, you must seek step two. And I can go on. But you can get the sense of how difficult exhaustion can be. We've talked briefly about the second or successive petition problem. If you get new information, um, can you bring a second habeas? There are very much stricter standards for that. 
But one thing we haven't really talked about very much during the course of today is what are the standards of review for merits decisions. So if the state court has resolved um, a constitutional claim on the merits, what is the standard of review in a habeas petition on that constitutional claim? And EDPA provides two provisions in 2254D um, that the federal court can grant habeas if the state court decision was contrary to or involved in unreasonable application of clearly established federal law as determined by the Supreme Court, or if it resulted in a decision that was based on an unreasonable determination of the facts in light of evidence presented in the state court proceeding. So the whole question of what does contrary to or an unreasonable application of has involved extraordinary work on the part of various federal courts. Obviously, the Supreme Court is the one that tells us in the end what these provisions mean. But it, it is an interesting question, um, and I don't really want to go into lots of detail about Supreme Court cases, but there is a Supreme Court case that says that you must ask, when you're in the unreasonable application prong, you must ask whether it's possible that fair-minded jurists could disagree that the arguments that are being raised are inconsistent with the holding of a prior Supreme Court decision. You must show, the state prisoner must show that, it is, that the state court ruling was so lacking in justification that there was an error beyond any possibility for fair-minded disagreement. So the question for you as an audience members is what would you think that means if you're looking at what a particular state court decided in a particular case? Um, and you also have to be looking at you know, what was the state court decision that you're considering? What if the state Supreme Court said affirmed? Do you look back? at the prior state court decision. The Supreme Court has told us to do that. Um, do you presume a rationale for the state court? Um, and, and these kinds of cases come to us every day, whether you're on the district court, a magistrate judge, or on the Court of Appeals. Every day we're having cases that are involving these kinds of questions. Um, talking about a case that recently went to the Sixth Circuit on Bank um, and has been decided. Um, it's called Taylor versus Jordan. And it um, involves a man who was convicted of murder the same day that the Batson decision was decided about allowing uh, challenges to um, the use of peremptory challenges by, in that case, a prosecutor. Um, peremptorily challenging the black veneer people and getting a essentially all-white jury for a murder case. So the um, Taylor versus Jordan case is a death penalty case in the Sixth Circuit. It was decided the same day that Batson was decided by the Supreme Court. And interestingly, Taylor versus Jordan was prosecuted by the same prosecutor who prosecuted in Batson in the same county that Batson occurred in. And in Batson, there was a resolution, um, and um, Batson case held that um, there, there was a, going to be a three-step process for establishing whether or not a um, was being um, taken off the veneer uh, on a peremptory challenge for unconstitutional reasons. Um, in the Sixth Circuit, we had this case. We must have had five different opinions uh, in the Anbach case about whether, about what was the state court decision here, because there were several state court decisions. What was the operative one? We had several different views. Of varying judges having varying views on that. Um, and we also had a situation where 
the state prosecutor had no reason to um, strike these jurors except for the fact that he believed that he could strike all but one black person from the jury. That was what he thought the law was, and so he was striking all but one in this particular case. So I'm using that as an example to show how difficult these kinds of issues are when we're trying to decide, was there an unreasonable application of the law? What was the state court decision that we should be looking at in order to um, decide whether there was an unreasonable application of the law under EDPA? Um, we also have the question of evidentiary hearings, and I think that um, some of the prior presenters went into this in, in very helpful detail. We, we have the question, what, when can the federal courts have a hearing in a habeas proceeding? And the basic answer is very seldom, but that's obviously not a good enough answer for any particular case. Um, so EDPA imposed a variety of stringent requirements. I would dare to say that in many of our post-EDPA cases, we are struggling with all of these procedural aspects and must struggle with them before we can get to the merits. And that raises the question, why? Why should it be that way? Why should it be that hard to get to the merits of somebody's constitutional claim? Um, similarly, if we move to the PLRA, the provisions of the PLRA that Judge Oliver went through are another illustration of imposing procedural constraints that make it very hard for meritorious prisoner complaints to um, reach resolution. And I think, um, to me, one of the difficulties is provision allowing claims to be struck for being frivolous, malicious, or failure to state a claim before the other side is served, before there really is any development at all. Um, how should it be determined whether a claim is malicious, frivolous, or without stating a claim? Um, Normally, there isn't quite the leeway in other kinds of litigation that there is in the prisoner cases. Um, there are limits on filing fees, attorney's fees, limits on injunctive relief in prison condition cases, uh, limits on reduction of prison size, a strict exhaustion requirement um, under the PLRA, and it's it, definitely the 25 years since the PLRA and EDPA have resulted in reductions of prisoner cases, uh, inability to obtain relief. So in a sense, they've been successful statutes in that they have reduced They have burdened the prisoners and the courts with a very difficult set of procedural requirements that need to be satisfied before a claim can be filed. Thank you, Judge Moore. Uh, before we open up for questions, uh, may I ask you if any of you have uh, further thoughts or responses to anything that our panelists have said? Judge yes, Murray. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on <clears throat> Judge Oliver's point about uh, uh, Brady claims on second or successive. A district court, particularly in a death penalty case, is in a cleft stick when the prisoner argues it's second in time and not second or successive. If we buy that argument and then go on to litigate the case, there's Sixth Circuit law that says district courts don't have jurisdiction to decide second or successive. If they are, in fact, second or successive. The requirement is that we must decide that in the first instance, but if we're wrong, we've made a jurisdictional error and we may have wasted a number of years of judicial time because that's, only, that's different. Uh, 
and get it handed back to us. So I, I have always tried, tended to err on the side of saying, if it's arguably second or successive, then I'm going to transfer it to the Sixth Circuit, which is where the Congress put the, the uh, second or successive responsibility in the first instance anyway. I'm going to transfer it to the second, Sixth Circuit, and if they, if they think I'm wrong and it's second in time, they'll tell me quickly, and I can go ahead. If they think I'm right, then they'll decide whether or not they grant permission to go ahead. <clears throat> um, but again, another example of the how over proceduralized AEDPA has made the whole habeas corpus uh, jurisprudence. Uh, I, I would I would agree with you. I I tend to re refer them to the the circuit for that determination. I think that's the right process. I think the law has to change um, before we could be comfortable in, in terms of making those kinds of decisions. So if it looks like it's a second uh, petition because it's the second one, we send it down. And so almost always uh, I would send it, send it there. I think that there's a little bit of uh, wiggle room, but not much uh, in some of the circuits. And I'm not quite sure about the six. But if you find that in regard to the Brady violation, that it didn't just occur at the time of trial, but there have been things that have happened since that time where the prosecutor may not have uh, come forward with information at a later point in time. And there are some cases like that in other circuits. Then they say that's a, that's a second in time, but it's not a successive petition. But, but that's not the usual case. Normally you're looking at fact, facts from the standpoint of what happened at trial in that context. And even though the defendant doesn't know about what he, what he or she has been denied, nevertheless, that, that's the act they're looking at. And so that would be successive. But, but sometimes the lawyers who've taken, uh, prosecutors who've taken steps to even cover things up after that point uh, and so then, then I think the, the courts have been split on whether that's successive or not. Uh, the, the argument in regard to why, and it hasn't been, it's not a widespread argument, one that, that has been bought in, in, uh, you know, in, in too many places, but the, the argument in regard to the Brady is not just like in the um, Quartum, the, the Panetti case, there, the person was not insane, I mean, at the time he filed the first petition. And so the court went through an analysis looking at Hager's law and the purposes and all that. Um, so that, that's, that's a special, special fact situation. But the arguments that have been made now go really beyond just the notion that these are a new fact, it's a new facts added to, to the situation. They're basically just saying there's something fundamental about Brady and Brady violations that go to the integrity of the, the process. And so, uh, and, and so, so, so they, they do analogize it to Panetti, but it really has to do with Brady claims and nature of Brady claims as opposed to other kinds, kinds of claims. Other? Um, let's open up for questions. Uh, anybody here in the room have questions? Uh, up there. Uh, thank you all. Um, a previous panelist noted um, that certain types of constitutional claims are essentially only able to be raised in collateral proceedings, like uh, ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, and there may be other examples I'm not familiar of. I'm wondering if all of the procedural limitations built into EDPA harm, in your view, the development of the law on that topic? Um, and then maybe as a second part of the question, if yes, would it be possible to remedy some of that harm to, develop, to the development of the law by addressing the merits question first and then the procedural question second, like the Supreme Court's directed courts to do for qualified immunity cases? Thank you. Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be very frustrating to decide that somebody could win on the merits, but must lose on the procedure. I think, on the other hand, if, if the merits are clear, 
that a person loses, that there are circumstances where we are allowed to decide that the merits <coughs> are clear and the person loses. So, um, so it, it, and I don't want to get into actual particular cases, but I think that that, that, that happens with some frequency, that, a, that if there's a, a question in habeas about whether something is fully exhausted or something like that, that somebody might conceivably want to get to the merits first and decide against the petitioner, the habeas petitioner on the merits. But um, most of the time, habeas cases are, or at least it seems to me, that most of the time habeas cases are resolved on the procedural aspects. Uh, I, I think you're, you're right on that, but I do see cases where um, magistrate judges and then uh, some of us would say, uh, looking at the case, um, you can go ahead and go to the merits or do Maybe we shouldn't do it, but do a kind of an alternative uh, kind of analysis uh, where you go ahead and, and do the merits. Uh, that may save time. It may not be uh, considered to be proper, but it may save time by doing both. And I see, I see that, and I've done that on, on some some occasions. Um, so, so that's my experience. Uh, but it, it's it's pretty hard. Um, on the effectiveness of council claims, not not to, to have those be raised collaterally, uh, because of all the reasons that were stated uh, this morning, uh, you just uh, you gotta wait until the person is there, and then you don't. The person's not going to be the person raising his or her own error. Now, of course, uh, what I what I do uh, when uh, I sentence a person is I have the council. Uh, file a notice of appeal for the person if they want one, but I always say that we will determine later whether you'll be the right person to pursue the appeal. And, and, and so we have it that way. But you, but you, can't, you really can't, in most appeals, uh, get, at the, get at the ineffectiveness of the counsel. Uh, you've got to do that in another proceeding where you raise that. Because normally it may mean also getting an affidavit from the person who's involved. And we, we see that in our 2255 cases quite often where the defendants are raising ineffectiveness of counsel, and now the, the, the former counsel has given an affidavit to the prosecutor about, you know, uh, how he conferred or she conferred with the client and how they've made them aware of all their options and so forth. Ineffective assistance of counsel case is really a question, it's really a thorny one in terms of the, the last panel presentation on where do you where do you present the evidence of ineffectiveness? Generally, not going to be present in the original trial of the person in state court. Generally, appeals courts do not accept evidence, new evidence. So it has to not going to be raised on direct appeal in the state court. So then the state court has this post conviction process, but there's no right to counsel in post conviction. So oftentimes, the <coughs> petitioner in post conviction will do the best job he can. But when we're talking about jailhouse lawyers, these are just prisoners. They're not lawyers who happen to be in jail most of the time. And if they were in jail, they're probably not <coughs> defense lawyers. They're white-collar lawyers who, you know, stole money or something like that. So um, maybe they've then become the specialists in, in um, post-conviction. But, um, so then you've got a post-conviction person who's doing this pro se, and you, then you've got <coughs> losing post-conviction. And then he hasn't presented evidence, say, at post-conviction. Then you are at habeas. Well, maybe he's not a lawyer then, or maybe he's got better advice, and the habeas court would be able to um, Think about should should we as a trial court allow evidence? No, I mean, the, you know the question is what are the restrictions on developing evidence in the federal habeas court? Um, and it really is a thorny problem. We have this Martinez case from the Supreme Court that's helpful, but then we have this current case that's being litigated in the Supreme Court. The Chin case. Uh, 
about habeas corpus develop evidence really is a thorny problem. Yeah, no, I, I just, it is quite different. And I think that while 2255s, and I think uh, lawyers who practice in the area know what I mean, these are federal habeas uh, cases, are quite different in some ways than 2254s. Uh, 2254s tend to be very complex. You've got the uh, post-conviction process in the state court, as Judge Moore talked about, and you're working your way through all that, and then you get to the federal court, and then the question becomes whether you need to have an entry here and there and all that. In, this, in the 2255s, basically what happens is they file the 2255 instead of 2254, and the case comes back to the district judge. And also, uh, that's where we would hear whether or not there was an ineffective assistance of counsel. And so there, there would either be an affidavit or a hearing right in that context. So it's, it's much shorter, much uh, more compact, <coughs> much more doable. And I don't think the same flaws uh, exist in that part of the process that uh, exists. Well, I don't know if flaws are the right word, but, but the delay and, and so forth. So, so our 2255s go fairly quickly. And if I feel like I need a hearing, I would have a hearing or I would have affidavits or whatever I would have, and I would make those determinations. That would be the post-conviction process. It would not be the long, drawn-out process that some states have, or some may not have any process at all. And so that's the complexity of it all, of, the, of, of, of what Judge Moore talked about. But 2255s are, are somewhat what different. Judge Moore has had. Just a comment about that. My understanding of the standard for granting of it is evidentiary hearing in the 2255 is much more liberal, uh, briefly, than a 2254, particularly because Cohen versus Pinholster doesn't apply at all. That's a 2011 case for the audience that severely restricted uh, uh, evidentiary hearings in 2254s. Yes, and I was speaking about the 2254 state. Other questions? Pat, do we have any online? This first question is for Judge Oliver. Are you suggesting that for Brady claims raised in a successive petition, the information need not be sufficient to show the inmate is actually innocent before the claim could be reviewed and a writ granted. I I am suggesting that there there are opinions in some of the circuits that suggest that ought to, that ought to be the case in successive petitions regarding Brady that. Those claims should not be submitted to the more stringent standard of successive petitions, but to the nor they should be subjected to the normal habeas standard. So that's that's the first thing. Uh, yes, I, I'm suggesting. I, you know, I haven't worked out, you know, um, an article or anything like that. I'm just raising this uh, to the audience and suggesting that that is some of the thinking that's going on even on the courts. Uh, and one might ask, well, why are the judges, for example, in the one case where they're ruling against uh, the petitioner, uh, saying, but we think, you know, in I don't know how many pages, 15, 20, 30 pages, that the law is wrong in our circuit in this area. That, that's the one, one case, the 11th Circuit. And the other case was in the 4th Circuit, in the concurring opinion, where the judge is saying that uh, we think that it is not uh, consistent with the uh, it was EPA uh, to the purposes of, of the statute to subject these Brady claims uh, to a successive petition uh, uh, requisites. That that's 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 what I'm saying. And then the the analysis of some of the cases, for example, the Scott versus United States case, the Eleventh Circuit goes through what it purports to, to give as an analysis of why uh, the 
uh, the case is uh, similar to uh, the Panetti versus Quarterman. I didn't go through the analysis by comparing it to that case, but that's what they reported to do uh, in that case, yes. We have another question. This could be for anyone. Several tensions regarding EDPA's statute of limitations have been resolved by the Supreme Court instructing prisoners to file premature protective petitions in federal court and then request stay in abeyances to exhaust in state courts. In your experience, have pro se prisoners been able to navigate this additional procedural hurdle? Has the push for protective petitions had a noticeable impact on federal dockets? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I see a lot of petitions filed and with a motion to stay filed right with the petition, um, arguing that uh, that we have to let state court decide uh, the the unexhausted claims first. I also see pro se petitioners um, asking for stays when they don't have any unexhausted claims. So I'm not sure that, that there's complete understanding uh, of the need for a stay, uh, but I, I, I see a lot of pro se motions and they all know that Ryan C. Weber is out there, so I don't, it's not a, certainly not an insuperable burden, I don't think. And uh, one more question from the chat. This could also be for anyone. What about the revelations that some previously recognized forensic sciences are now recognized as junk science and not real science? How does someone raise that as an issue if there's no Brady or IAC claim to raise with it? That's an excellent question. <laughs> This is not unusual that science proceeds and that something that was considered a, science, a, a truth earlier on is no longer considered a truth in terms of like fire analysis apparently changed dramatically as to whether something is arson or not over time and I think there's it's gotten some notoriety from, I think it was from Texas, about somebody who was convicted of killing his family by setting fire to his place, and I think he was executed. And it turned out, oh, yeah. sorry, I didn't remember the name, I'm terrible with names, but the, the <laughs> gentleman was executed, and it turned out that the science was wrong. Um, really, really a stunning problem. I'm not sure. I'm not sure as well. We have a parallel case pending in human Dayton, a man convicted on the basis of fire science 25 years ago of murder, and the district judge has decided to treat the question, it's not, the case is not referred to, but the district judge has decided to treat the question about the competing fire science uh, ideas as a question of actual innocence, and is it is intending the whole uh, evidentiary hearing on that question has set one so So arguably, I, you know, this case that I wrote a long time ago, Souter versus Jones, would be an example where the, the expert had said at the first at the state trial that um, the mark on the decedent's head was caused by the bottom of a, I believe it was a a beer bottle, it could have been some other kind of alcohol bottle. And then 10 years later, the, um, the guy actually got habeas counsel, uh, and the habeas counsel re-interviewed the expert, and the expert said, well, actually, when I'm looking at this now, I realize this could not have been caused, this mark on the decedent's head could not have been caused by a beer bottle or alcohol bottle. And so the question is whether equitable tolling should allow the habeas petition to be filed late. late. And, and we did allow it to be filed late, and then that was when 
not only did the expert recant, but also somebody came forward whose father had been driving strangely that night and had, uh, it turned out the father's truck mirror had hit the decedent on the side of the road and the father had driven off. The father was now dead, so he couldn't be, he couldn't testify or anything, but the combination of facts led uh, this gentleman to be released from prison and ultimately to be able to get some compensation for something like 14 years in jail. But Michigan doesn't have the death penalty, so he was not right. subjected to the death penalty, whereas here in Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky, among our four states, there is the death penalty. And I think this actually reflects a kind of intellectual tension between law and science, because in law, we, we are concerned, among other things, with finality, uh, whereas at least the philosophical underpinnings of science are that everything is tentative and subject to refutation, although presumably we don't think we're going to have to reconfirm the law of gravity every morning. Uh, but the, the underlying premises are very different, which creates tensions not only in this area, but in, in, in a number of other uh, areas where science and law interact. Other questions? We need to get this so that the folks online can hear. Oh, I see. I'm just responding to the person online. And we actually, from the Capital Habeas Unit here in the Northern District, we do have a case with different, where science has evolved um, such that bite mark evidence was used in the person's original trial. It's no longer considered a valid science. So just in terms of um, litigation strategy, the first place that we started was in state court because we're now asserting this person's actual innocence or at least their actual innocence of the death penalty so that you can, there are, there's uh, rules in state court um, in, under Ohio law where you could start. And then once you've exhausted that, which we did, um, then you go back and assert a second in time habeas petition saying that this obviously couldn't have been discovered at the time of the trial. And um, I think that's pending in the Sixth Circuit now somewhere. So. <laughs> Other questions or comments? I think just one, one comment. Um, just back to the, the issue that, that I was raising, Panetti versus uh, Quarterman, and whether it should be extended uh, to second habeas petitions relative to Brady. I guess the question is, why, 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 why should that be, or why would one argue that? The problem is because you've got this extra hurdle uh, unsuccessive. It's more difficult. And so um, impeachment evidence is hardly ever sufficient in that context. So unless you've got the smoking gun, you've got, you got the person who's recanted, you've got some very, I mean some significant person who's recanted or some other uh, way to prove the person is actually innocent, actually innocent um, you're not going to be able to proceed. It's a much more onerous standard. The first one is onerous enough but the, the idea is that uh, if, you, if you come up with impeachment evidence on a successful petition, you're probably going to lose. And that's, that's, that's why it's coming to the fore as it is. Uh, so, first of all, I have to go to my Uber in six minutes, so I apologize in advance if you're responding to my question. I stand up and leave. I'm, I, um, but I, uh, um, so I think this is the, this discussion uh, about uh, like what to do with tool mark evidence or bite mark evidence or you know the Cameron Todd Willingham stuff about arts and science or biomechanical science, all these new science claims, right? There's a lot of new state statutes um, that allow us into state post-conviction proceedings to do this stuff. And the lawyers appointed in federal court tend to be very creative about how to get into state court to do those things. Um, and it's kind of my position that federal habeas law is so removed from the realities of like the way claims are 
presented and litigated now, that reformers should focus their efforts on improving representation and access to courts and state judiciaries. Um, and I'm wondering if you share my cynicism about federal habeas law and if we're serious about enforcing rights, whether um, a lot of us academics who spend a lot of time writing about federal habeas law should maybe spend more time on state post-conviction stuff. the states are in our circuit in terms of how receptive they are. Good first. Yeah, I would say that uh, the suggestion is a good one, uh, particularly because uh, sometimes it's easier to convince the state legislature than the Congress, but there are, uh, there are, uh, more procedures available in theory in Ohio post-conviction that are actually very good at implementation. So you suppose that there's a possibility of appointment of counsel, where I rarely see that. There's a possibility of discovery, I rarely see that. There's a possibility of evidentiary hearing, I rarely see that. And, and, and my thought is it's probably because uh, um, of lack of judicial resources as well as attorney resources. So that's probably a good place to, to focus the reform. Judge Oliver, you want to add anything? No, I, I do think that sometimes you, you see what appear to be deficiencies in the state court process um, that um, Seems not to be as um, I, I guess uh, you, you don't see the expertise down there that you see in the federal system. Uh, now some of the lawyers are working both ways. Uh, for example, I have lawyers that we allow to allow them to pay pay them to go down to the state system and work on unexhausted claims uh, and so forth. And I've done that in the past. So I, I have lawyers who work both in our court and both in the state state system, and I, I think they've been very pretty good at, at pursuing those. But that's not available uh, to every every um, every litigant. So I, I do think that I see sometimes problems in the record and the way cases have been developed, which give me pause uh, when when they get to the federal side. I don't know about <laughs> having people who are devoting. A lot of the time on the federal side, I think we just need more. Uh, we just need more uh, because it's just such a complex uh, er area. Uh, but but I, and maybe there should be more overlap between those who are doing the state work and, and those who do the federal work. But uh, I, I applaud the people on the federal side. The ones I've seen uh, who do it regularly are really quite quite good. Okay, let me ask again questions. Yeah. Um, a few times over the course of the day, um, it's come up via the important gatekeeping role that EDPA and the PLRA serve um, in, in keeping out frivolous prisoner litigation and the, the preservation of judicial resources. Um, we've talked about that a little bit, but I was wondering what your take was um, with regards to the judicial resources that are spent litigating these procedural issues. Um, if we're spending a lot of time on exhaustion, um, second in time versus successive petitions, um, calculating the statutes of limitations and things like that, are we just redirecting the judicial resources to these procedural issues? Um, or are we actually um, having an effective gatekeeping role that, that does something worthwhile? I can say something about PLRA very quick, because I think that one is easier than, than the other. Uh, I don't think we're devoting a lot of resources to PLRA, uh, and maybe, and, and I worry sometimes that we're not devoting enough. You know, we have these cases screened uh, by law clerks, and they're good at it, but if you're not careful as a judge, 
you're getting five or six of these a month. And, you know, you, you don't want to get to a point where you just kind of rely on them to do those things and then you just six of them off your docket. And, and I, 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 because they're, they're coming constantly. And, and, but but they are, uh, those don't take, most of them don't take a lot of time. The, the, the few that we get that remain are the ones that take time. They're difficult because if they don't have lawyers and they're the worst kind of cases to, to be in where you can't serve as a lawyer for them and yet, you know, you want to make sure they, they, their claims are heard. But I, I don't think that's, that's a big um, judicial use of time. We don't, we don't spend a lot of time. I, I, I think my colleague would agree with me on that. We don't spend a lot of time on the PLRA cases. So I just wanted to address that one. Uh, they, most of them are screened out and the ones that are left, there are not that many ones that actually go to, to judgment uh, in favor of prisoners. So that's, that's not a lot of time. I think the, the time is in the other, other area. I just wanted to address that part. In the habeas area, I think I were able to rewrite EDPA or to recalibrate the Supreme Court's decisions, I would focus more on allowing the merits to be heard as opposed to a lot of time saying in the end procedural requirements were not satisfied and therefore it's quite staggering how many people miss the one year statute of limitations and don't have an argument because they're sitting in prison and they don't know really what's happening and a lot of the people are not very well educated. I think that they can start the county of the, that chart that someone had earlier today. Of how do you to me, it's very sad if someone is barred by the statute of limit, the one year statute of limitations. When they're in prison, they don't have access to the internet. not have their legal papers with them and so forth and so on. It's really unfortunate to have this one year statute of limitations. Why not go back to the approach of latches, which was used before and, uh, and say, well, all things considered, did this individual bring the case in a That's just one example of how sad it is that we have to be counting all these days very carefully, and then decided to throw out the petition simply on that basis. Whether the person has a meritorious claim. It's my position. My role as a judge is to follow the law, and I follow the law. What EDPA says, I look at what the Supreme Court says, I look at what binding precedent in my circuit is, and I follow the law. But if Uh, Judge Bruce had wanted to get in. Uh, with respect to the screening under Rule 4 of the habeas rules, uh, I completely concur with what Judge Moore said. I don't, I, I would rarely raise the statute of limitations defense sua sponte in a Rule 4 uh, proceeding. But about the only time I, I would recommend dismissing a case on the basis of Rule 4 is if, if it's a, uh, uh, on a statute of limitations basis, would be, you know, it's like 20 years late. But uh, if we get if, if we get a petition that is uh, based on non cognizable claims, like uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, oh, uh, uh, somebody says the uh, the uh, trial court admitted hearsay against me. That's not a, that's not cognizable, uh, in, and so I'm not reluctant to use Rule Four as a screening mechanism for those kinds of claims. But I I am very reluctant to uh, to raise statute of limitations or even proceed even more procedural default to respond to That's why the attorney general is available to litigate these cases. I, I don't think I would do it sui sponte, and I, I agree with the sentiment of what's been said, but I also recognize the difficulty of proceeding in that way. 
the question is really, in almost any area of litigation, you've got to have some time frames. And so maybe you want some exceptions to the time frames. But you want things to move along. It seems to me you, you can't just let a case sit and then a person can bring it anytime they want. And so I, I, I certainly embrace the sentiments of just more uh, on this in terms of doing more on the merits. Uh, but I think we have to think very hard about how do we bring, bring that about in a way that allows courts cases to move at least in a timely fashion. It has to be some cutoff. But I, I would be for some, some exceptions. And she, she talked about some of those. I, I don't know that law very well about latches and so forth. But it, it seems to me if you had a, a cutoff in terms of like two years or whatever the year was and then some exceptions to it, you maybe could accommodate most of the cases. But you're going to always have some that are just too, too far out, I, 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 I think. Okay, um, other questions? <coughs> we are at the end of a very long day, so let me first thank our three judicial panelists for a very <laughs> And it is my sort of institutional role to wrap things up uh, and to recognize some folks who made this program possible. Um, first, uh, this is a law review symposium, and I want to uh, recognize all of the law review students who have been involved in making this program go uh, successfully today. Uh, uh, there are something like a dozen uh, associates who have, uh, I may have the number wrong, but a whole number of second year students who have, who have made uh, this program work well, and I want to thank them. Um, I also want to repeat something that Dean Berg said when she convened the program. Uh, uh, we have been generously supported not only by the law school, uh, but uh, by the Attorney Admissions Fund of the uh, U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio, uh, by the uh, Northern District of Ohio chapter of the Federal Bar Association, uh, and by the Federal Litigation Section of the National FBA. And uh, I want, in particular, to thank all of those folks because we could not have made this program work uh, without their support. Uh, and some of the some of the folks online uh, are FBA uh, people. Um, one person in particular I think we need to recognize, and that is Eric Seiler, who is the person who checked most of you in today. Uh, Eric works with, our, with the Law Review and our academic centers uh, to make programs like this possible at all, taking care of all of the nitty-gritty details that, that uh, near faculty members like me uh, couldn't possibly master because they're kind of above my pay grade. So I want to thank uh, Eric in particular for uh, making today go so smoothly. <laughs> and finally, as I said, this is a law review program, and I'm going to kind of uh, maybe violate protocol. Uh, I want to recognize Andy Grumschlag, who is the editor-in-chief, uh, who is uh, who brought the idea for this symposium uh, to me. This was a student-generated uh, idea, and they pulled this off. And Andy was, was one of those. And the other person who is the symposium uh, editor uh, and who will uh, help to make sure that, that many of the presentations from today will wind up in a special issue of the Law Review in a few months. Uh, Reagan Joy, I think you have, uh, Andy and Reagan uh, also should uh, get a separate recognition. <laughs> and um, I think we are, I think we are done. Um, I uh, assume that everybody who's in for CLE credit got the appropriate, uh, got the appropriate paperwork, and if you did not, uh, let me know. I don't know the answer, but I will make sure that you get your answer. Thanks again to everybody. Uh, have a wonderful weekend.